Sculling Fours and Eights by F. J. Furnival from Notes and Queries, Volume Eleven, April the twenty fifth, eighteen eighty five. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. As some inquirer into Victorian sports may, a hundred years hence, wish to know the date of the introduction of these boats, will you make a note that the terms are mine? That the first sculling four, a narrow sliding seat boat by Clasper for four pairs of sculls, was put on the Thames at my suggestion by the Morris Rowing Club, of which I have been president from its start, in 1883 and that the first sculling eight was brought out by the london club in january eighteen eighty five both the sculling four and eight raced against a four oar and an eight oar respectively and won then the crews changed boats and again the sculls beat the oars the same results were obtained in the morris club races between double sculls and pair oars in eighteen eighty two thus establishing conclusively the superiority of sculls over oars. I hope that the university and all other rowing races will soon be pulled in sculling boats instead of oar boats. May I add the following paragraph from a late boating circular of mine with regard to the date of the introduction of narrow outrigged boats? It was in the long vacation of 1815 that Jack Beasley of John's and I, who had already built my own broad outrigger, resolved to build sculling boats in which we could just sit. We hired a shed on the bank of the cam above Magdalen Bridge, just behind John's, and there, with the help of a cabinet maker, built our narrow boats, and astonished our fellow undergraduates with them when they came back in October. R. Newell, who had a match on with Clasper in the north, came up with his trainer, Bob Coombs, to coach, one the captains, the other the university. Seeing us sculling, they borrowed our boats to try, and Newell, after being at first upset out of mine, asked me to lend him her to row his match in. "'Never been in such a fast boat in my life, sir. She goes off your hands like nothing.' I'm sure I could beat Clasper if you'd lend her to me. It was the proudest moment of my life up to that point, and I joyfully consented. But the London trade wouldn't have it, and got Newell to send the lines and lengths of my boat up to them. They built him a lighter boat even than mine, and he won his match in her, beat Clasper early in 1846. Thenceforward, narrow boats prevailed on the Cambridge and London waters and the rest of the world. End of Sculling Fours and Eights by F. J. Furnival. Recording by Ruth Golding. Booksellers' Sales in the Eighteenth Century by William H. Peat. From Notes and Queries, Volume Nine. April the 19th, 1890. This is recorded to celebrate the 8th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The following extracts are from a curious and interesting collection of catalogues of sales, ranging from 1704 to 1768 in the possession of Messrs. Longmans and Company. They furnish useful information as to the value of literary property in the last century. First Catalogue quote, A catalogue of books bound and inquires, the late stock of Mrs. Elizabeth Harris deceased, which will be sold by auction to the booksellers only at the Bear in Avey Mary Lane on Monday the 11th of this instant, December 1704, beginning at nine in the morning, when the company shall be entertained with a breakfast, and at noon with a good dinner and a glass of wine, and then proceed with the sale in order to finish that evening. End quote. Up to about 1750, dinner was always on the table exactly at one of the clock. 
after that date the time was altered to two o'clock and later still the dinner was sometimes omitted and the following notice appears on the catalogue of mr john clark leaving off trade in seventeen sixty two coffee and tea will be ready at four o'clock and the sale begin as soon as st paul's clock strikes five End quote. later still the time was altered to quote, tea and coffee at five and the sale at six as soon as st paul's clock strikes End quote. on one occasion quote, there will be a glass of good wine and an handsome supper End quote. At Mr. T. Osborne's sale, on February the ninth, 1743-4, quote, at eleven of the clock in the forenoon, dinner will be on the table exactly at one of the clock, consisting of turkeys and chines, hams and chickens, apple pies, etc., and a glass of very good wine, End quote. Value of Property Robinson Crusoe was published by William Taylor in 1719 in three parts, and in the catalogue of his sale in 1725 it appears as follows. Quote, Robinson Crusoe in two volumes, octavo and duodecimo, with cuts. Ten pounds to be paid, presumably to the author, for every one thousand of the first part and ten pounds ten shillings more when every one thousand of the second part is put to printing, and five pounds more when five hundred of the second volume are sold. End quote. One half of the copyright fetched fifteen guineas, and the other half fifteen pounds. The whole of the copyright of the third part was also offered, but is marked in the catalogue, not sold. A copy of the first edition of Robinson Crusoe was sold at Sotheby's on February the 17th for £40. At the sale of Mrs. Mary Richardson's, quote, stock and copies, end quote, i.e. copyrights, in 1766, the following prices were realised. One fortieth Johnson's Dictionary, two volumes octavo, £27, equals whole, one thousand and eighty pounds. One thirty sixth Milton's Paradise Lost, twenty five pounds, equals whole nine hundred pounds. One sixty fourth Pope's Iliad and Odyssey, seventeen pounds, equals whole one thousand and eighty pounds. One twenty fourth Clarissa, twenty five pounds, equals whole six hundred pounds. One sixteenth Pamela, eighteen pounds equals whole two hundred and eighty eight pounds one twenty fourth grandison twenty pounds equals whole four hundred and eighty pounds one thirty second hervey's meditations thirty two pounds equals whole one thousand and twenty four pounds one sixteenth peregrine pickle twelve pounds equals whole one hundred and ninety two pounds one sixteenth Roderick Random, thirteen guineas, equals whole two hundred and eighteen pounds eight shillings. One thirty second Rambler, twenty one pounds, equals whole six hundred and seventy two pounds. One eightieth Tatler, five guineas, equals whole four hundred and twenty pounds. At the sale of the shares of John Nicholson, one eighth of Tillotson's sermons fetched two hundred and fifty pounds, being at the rate of two thousand pounds for the whole. A memorandum attached to entry of Burkitt on the New Testament quote, There is ninepence a book to be paid to the widow. End quote. Probably the most important sale was that of quote, the genuine stock of Jacob and Richard Tonson Esquires. Seek, end quote, in 1767. The following well-known names appear among the buyers, Cadell, Rivington, Woodfall, T. Davis, query Johnson's Tom Davis, Longman, Dilly, Newbury, Caslon, Kearsley, and Lowndes. The Tonsons appear to have been the owners of the whole of many valuable copyrights, but at the sale these were divided into fractions to suit purchasers. Thus Addison's Miscellanies and Travels was offered in twentieths, 
and fetched on the average fourteen pounds per share other notable lots were as follows one eighth congreves works twenty five pounds equals whole two hundred pounds one twentieth croxall's aesop fifteen pounds equals whole three hundred pounds one eighth dryden's fables six guineas equals whole fifty pounds eight shillings one twelfth dryden's plays eight pounds ten shillings equals whole one hundred and two pounds one tenth gay's fables twenty one pounds ten shillings equals whole two hundred and fifteen pounds one fortieth glasses cookery sixteen pounds ten shillings equals whole six hundred and sixty pounds one twentieth milton's paradise lost forty six pounds equals whole nine hundred and twenty pounds one twentieth milton's paradise regained thirteen pounds ten shillings equals whole two hundred and seventy pounds one eighth spencer's fairy queen nine pounds fifteen shillings equals whole seventy six pounds a lot of plays in duodecimo amounting to seventy seven thousand copies fetched seven hundred and thirty pounds and another lot of fourteen thousand in quarto and octavo fetched two hundred and twenty five pounds these include besides shakespeare's a large selection from the drama of the restoration two lots are specified as follows one thousand two hundred and ninety copies of richard the third sibbers sixty copies of richard the third shakespeare's nine hundred and ninety five copies of tempest dryden's five hundred copies of tempest shakespeare's these sales were not periodical ones but usually consisted of the choir and bound stock and copies of deceased members of the trade the sale in many instances was announced to begin if ten buyers were present about seventeen sixty the nature of the sale seems to have altered and several booksellers combined to effect a clearance of stock thus one catalogue is headed napton rivington johnston and law at the death of thomas longman the first in seventeen fifty six a sale of part of his stock took place at the sale of w taylor in seventeen twenty five the name of longman as a buyer first appears william h peat thirty nine paternoster row End of Booksellers' Sales in the Eighteenth Century by William H. Peat. Recording by Ruth Golding. A Tate a Tate at Eight by Barney Fagan. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. sweethearts stray at close of day on lovers night in june among the trees where summer breathes sigh softly to the moon with sweetest girl most precious pearl for king or queenly maid they're all serene in joy unseen a tit a tit a tit. If you knew what joy the thought awakens, if you felt as I do, you would say, to be there and enjoy such happy moments, I would seek a fair companion every day. No fancy air conceived could paint the picture, no silvery tongue its pleasures can relate. In the jingle of the words excels the sweetest songs of birds A tate a tate a tate No painter's dream so sweet can seem In rapture you declare For her you live, a pledge you give For her alone you care Down leafy lane you stroll again 
Nor heed the hours so oh, late Your lips have met You'll never forget That tate-a-tate-a-tate If you knew what joy that thought awakens If you felt as I do you would say To be there and enjoy such happy moments I would seek a fair companion every day No fancy air conceived could paint the picture No silvery tongue its pleasures can relate In the jingle of the words excels the sweetest songs of birds A tate a tate at eight End of A Tate a Tate at Eight by Barney Fagan Sung by Ruth Golding Les Huit Chevreaux, from Fables et Légendes du Japon, by Claudius Ferrand. This is recorded to celebrate the 8th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Les Huit Chevreaux Il y avait une fois une chèvre. Cette chèvre s'appelait Yagisan. Elle avait huit chevreaux. Ces huit chevreaux aimaient bien la chèvre, et la chèvre le leur rendait bien. Un jour, Yakisan partit pour la ville. Elle allait aux provisions. Avant de partir, elle dit aux chevreaux, « Mes enfants, il faut être bien sage pendant mon absence. Vous ne sortirez pas. Vous n'ouvrirez la porte à personne, absolument à personne. Je serai bientôt de retour. Je vous apporterai des bonbons. » Les chevreaux promirent d'être bien sages, de ne pas sortir et de n'ouvrir la porte à personne, absolument à personne. Et la chèvre partit un panier au bras. Les enfants fermèrent toutes les portes. Puis, pour passer le temps, ils se mirent à jouer à pigeon vol. Yagisan marchait à grands pas vers la ville. Le loup la vit passer. Il eut l'idée de sauter sur elle et de la manger, car le loup aime bien les chèvres. Puis, réflexion faite, il se dit, « Au lieu de manger la maman, je vais manger les petits. Ils sont huit, et la chair est plus tendre. » Il se dirige de ce pas vers la maison de la chèvre. En route, il se lèche les babines et aiguise ses dents. « Pourvu que la porte soit ouverte, » se dit-il. Il arrive. La porte est fermée. Par une fente, il entrevoit les huit chevreaux jouant un pigeon vol. Il frappe doucement. « Qui va là ?» demande l'aîné des petits. « Il ne faut pas ouvrir. Maman l'a défendu, » dit le plus jeune. « C'est moi, » répond le loup. « Moi, votre tante, vous savez, votre tante Ayatobisan. Je vous apporte des bonbons. Ouvrez-moi. »« Cette fois n'est pas la voix de notre tante, » remarque l'un des chevreaux. Notre tante a une voix bien plus douce, plus tremblante et plus traînante. « Nous n'ouvrons pas à notre tante !» crie alors l'aîné des petits. Et tous se mettent à rire et continuent à jouer. Le loup a tout entendu. Il se reproche de n'avoir pas une voix douce, tremblante et traînante. « Je reviendrai » dit-il. Et vite, il court chez un célèbre pharmacien. « Donnez-moi !» lui dit-il, « Une médecine pour adoucir la voix et la rendre chevrotante. » Le pharmacien lui donne le remède, mais le loup se garde bien de dire au pharmacien pourquoi il veut changer sa voix. Après avoir pris la médecine, il retourne à la maison de la chèvre. La porte en est toujours fermée. Les chevreaux jouent toujours. Le loup frappe doucement. « Qui va là ?» demande l'aîné des petits. « Il ne faut pas ouvrir. Maman l'a défendu, » répète le plus jeune. « C'est moi, » répond le loup. « Moi, votre grand-mère. Vous savez, votre grand-mère nakiko san Ouvrez-moi, je vous apporte des feuilles de chou. » Un chevreau plus curieux s'approche de la porte et regarde par la fente. « Ce n'est pas notre grand-mère, » s'écrit-il. « Grand-mère a des pieds tout blancs, blancs comme la neige. Celui-ci, 
à des pieds tout noirs, noirs comme le charbon. « Nous n'ouvrons pas à notre grand-mère » crie alors l'aîné des petits. Et tous se mettent à rire et continuent à jouer. Le loup a tout entendu. Il se reproche de n'avoir pas des pieds blancs comme la neige. « Je reviendrai » dit-il. Et vite, il court chez un célèbre teinturier. « Veuillez me teindre les pieds en blanc. Rendez-les blancs comme la neige. » Le teinturier lui teint les pieds. Mais le loup se garde bien de dire au teinturier pourquoi il veut avoir les pieds blancs comme la neige. Après cela, le loup retourne encore à la maison de la chèvre. La porte en est toujours fermée. Les chevreaux jouent toujours. Le loup frappe doucement. « Qui va là ?» demande l'aîné des petits. « Il ne faut pas ouvrir. »« Maman l'a défendu, » répète le plus jeune. « C'est moi, » répond le loup. « Moi, votre maman. Je reviens de la ville et vous apporte des bonbons. »« La maman !» crient en chœur les huit petits chevreaux. Cette fois, le doute n'est plus possible. La voix est la voix de la chèvre. Les pieds sont ses pieds. C'est la mer. La porte s'ouvre. Le loup entre. Le plus jeune des chevreaux se précipite derrière un paravent. Il se tient là, tremblant de peur. Il voit ses sept frères disparaître l'un après l'autre dans la gueule formidable du loup. Celui-ci, ayant achevé son repas, quitte la maison de la chèvre et retourne à la forêt. Yagisan revient de la ville. Elle voit la porte ouverte. Un pressentiment terrible la saisit. Elle entre et ne voit plus ses petits. Sur les nattes, des taches de sang. « Oh » s'écrit-elle, en s'arrachant les poils de désespoir. « Ils ont ouvert la porte Le loup sera venu et les aura mangés !» Et elle pleure. Le plus jeune des chevreaux s'était caché derrière le paravent. Le loup ne l'avait point vu. Apercevant sa mère, il sort de sa cachette, se jette dans ses bras, et, d'une voix tremblante, lui raconte la terrible aventure. La chèvre, ayant tout entendu, se redresse furieuse. Ses yeux lancent des éclairs. « Je retrouverai mes petits, » s'écrit-elle, « et je me vengerai. » Et, suivie de son chevreau, elle s'élance à la piste du loup. Le loup était retourné au bois. Il s'était étendu dans un épais taillis, et là, tout en faisant sa digestion, il s'était endormi. Yagisan trouve le loup endormi dans les broussailles. Son sommeil est profond. Il ronfle bruyamment. La chèvre s'approche sans faire de bruit, car elle ne veut pas réveiller le loup. Elle prend des ciseaux et délicatement entrouvre la peau du ventre. Le loup ne se réveille pas. Les sept petits chevreaux sont là, dans le ventre du loup, vivants, bien portants entassés comme des petits oiseaux dans leur nid. Ils sortent en poussant des cris de joie. Ils reconnaissent leur maman, se jettent à son cou, la couvrent de caresses. Le loup est toujours endormi. Mais il n'y a pas de temps à perdre. Vite, la mère ordonne aux ses petits de lui apporter chacun une pierre. Les petits obéissent aussitôt. La chèvre prend les sept pierres et les dépose dans le ventre du loup, à la place même où tout à l'heure étaient ses sept petits. Puis, prenant une grosse aiguille et du gros fil, elle enfile la grosse aiguille et délicatement recoue la peau du ventre. Cela fait, elle se retire à l'écart avec ses huit chevreaux. Pendant l'opération, le loup dormait toujours. Il se réveille au bout d'un quart d'heure, se lève, se frotte les yeux, s'étire. Son ventre est lourd, très lourd. « La digestion est difficile, » dit-il à haute voix. Les chevreaux ont entendu. Ils étouffent un rire. Le loup est dévoré par la soif. Une soif brûlante. Il descend vers un étang, s'approche et se baisse pour boire. Au même instant, les sept pierres roulent l'une après l'autre jusque vers son gosier. Le loup, entraîné par le poids, tombe dans l'étang. La chèvre et les chevreaux voient le loup se débattre. Ils applaudissent, rient et chantent. 
Le loup est descendu jusqu'au fond de l'étang, d'où il n'est plus ressorti. La vengeance des chèvres est terrible. End of Les Huit Chevreaux from Fables et Légendes du Japon by Claudius Ferrand. This recording was read by Kantoulon. Eight Hour Strike by Billy Pastor. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Just now from each person you meet The subject you hear all around in the street The excitement you see as you travel about The workmen in numbers who daily turn out All show very plain the sensations on hand And men by their rights are determined to stand The wealthy and proud they may talk as they like But they'll have to give in to the eight-hour strike Striking for the right, boys, striking for the right. Then close the ranks of labor up and show the world your might. Striking for the right, boys, striking for the right. Eight hours a day and decent pay, it is for that they fight. For eight hours a day, their banners unfurled, a guide to the toilers all over the world. The beacon that shows to the children of toil, the workman's no slave on American soil. There's a manhood in labor no tyrant can crush, and so for their rights they go in with a rush. And capital ne'er such a victory saw, as the workmen will win in the eight-hour law. I'd ask of the haughty and grand, that's who are the men who develop our land, who made the great nation Columbia is now, but the men from the workshop, the anvil and plow, the railroads that spread through the east and the west, our clippers and steamers, the staunchest and best, and factories finer the world never saw, built by those who strike for the eight-hour law. Striking for the right, boys, striking for the right. Then close the ranks of labor up and show the world your might. Striking for the right, boys, striking for the right. Eight hours a day and peace and pay, it is for that they fight. When our nation was trod beneath tyranny's heel, the strength of our workmen the foemen did feel. With liberty's fire, then each bosom it burned. Our freedmen restored to their homes, they returned. Should trees in our flag ever threaten again, or invaders or foemen from over the main, to rush to the battle, the first would be then. The eight-hour strikers are brave working men. Striking for the right, boys, striking for the right. Then close the ranks of labor up and show the world your American working men has been proven upon many a battlefield where they have nobly struck for the right, and that's the same as they are doing now. End of Eight Hour Strike by Billy Pastor. Read by Maria Casper. Collecting Eight Billions of Dollars for the Government by Daniel C. Roper. This is recorded to celebrate the 8th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Collecting Eight Billions of Dollars for the Government 
Commissioner Roper commends the patriotic spirit in which the American taxpayers have furnished the vast sums needed by the government during the past two years, and discusses the prospect of future federal taxation. By Daniel C. Roper, Commissioner of Internal Revenue. A clear understanding of our national program of taxation requires careful consideration of the present revenue needs of the United States government. We have attained the immediate purpose for which we have contended in the Great War. Of course it has cost us vast sums to reach our present goal, but let us rejoice that we have the money with which to meet the bills incurred in such a cause. The addition we have made to our national debt is so large that the payment of interest and the provision for repayment of the principal have created fixed charges exceeding the total annual expenditures of the government before the war. These fixed charges will continue for years, and in addition the expense must be met of carrying on the current governmental activities, which have been greatly expanded. We must expect the present rates of taxation to be substantially maintained, and reductions to be made only gradually from year to year. In every enterprise of business and industry, account will have to be taken of the incidence of federal taxation. From every accumulation, a portion must be reserved for the government. Provision must be made for financing and meeting large tax payments with the least possible disturbance and inconvenience. Taxes must not injure business. Above all, our system of taxation must not be permitted to retard the commercial development of the country or to discourage the initiative and enterprise of our people. It must rather become a stimulus to redoubled activity and effort, and a motive for attaining the highest possible degree of productiveness and efficiency. Taxation is now, and will be in the future, a very important element in the cost of doing business, and the administration of the tax laws involves a mutual trust as between the people who will pay the tax and their government which is sustained by the tax. Two years of experience with the new system of revenue collecting scarcely afforded sufficient retrospect for safe conclusions regarding a future program of taxation. Our experience with the present system relates to old taxes which have been increased to new taxes. Experience has demonstrated the general truth that any new tax is at the outset comparatively less economical and less productive, and will be regarded by the public as more oppressive, than an old tax to which the business conditions and habits of the people have become adjusted. However, once a new line of taxation has been created, it gradually assumes its proper place in the system, unless it is inherently uneconomic. It was necessary under the wartime revenue legislation to increase largely the number of the objects of taxation, because even the highest practicable rates as applied to the existing objects would not produce the amount of money needed by the government. It seems axiomatic, therefore, that as long as our revenue requirements continue at the rate of four billions of dollars annually, it will be impossible to expect that any of the more important taxes can be discontinued without requiring the substitution, therefore, of some new tax or increasing the rate of some existing impost. We may be encouraged by the fact, however, that the revenue requirements of the nation are already recovering from the strain of wartime. This progress toward a safer economic condition must be gradual, but it will be accelerated by the conclusion of many wartime activities by improved efficiency in the operation of activities which must continue, and by better supervision of expenditures under a budgetary system of considering appropriations. To the end that the Bureau of Internal Revenue might be in a position to furnish the best possible information and advice on the subject of internal taxation, whenever requested by Congress, we have followed the practice of preserving memoranda of all suggestions for the amendment of the law which have occurred to officers of the Bureau during the period of interpreting the current law and constructing regulations for its observance and enforcement, or which were received from taxpayers. 
These will assist in suggesting what changes should be made in the system of internal taxation, and when they should be made. It will be well to bear in mind that the government now has a large investment in each object of taxation, and, in addition, possesses an administrative advantage which is not unlike the good will of a commercial enterprise. Every improvement in this respect provides insurance to the businessman against future uncertainty. Taxation and Democracy The payment of taxes should be understood by every citizen. The taxation system of the United States is truly popular, of the people, by the people, and for the people. The amount paid by each citizen is graduated according to the success and fortune he has attained in availing himself of the opportunities created and preserved by our free institutions. The method and degree of our taxes is determined by no favored class, but by the representatives of the people. The proceeds should be regarded as a national investment, continuously returning to every citizen in satisfaction and material benefit. I submit that the record of the Internal Revenue Bureau for the past two years may properly be regarded with pride and satisfaction. The raising of nearly eight billions of dollars, involving direct transactions with more than four million taxpayers, within the fiscal years 1918 and 1919, when so many other demands had to be met by every family and every business, is evidence not only of wonderful financial strength, but also of the highest type of citizenship. The compliance of the great majority of taxpayers with the requirements of the revenue laws has reduced to a minimum the task of the Bureau in enforcing the law. It is natural and proper that those citizens who respond to their civic liabilities should resent the evasion of taxes by other persons, especially those engaged in the same line of business. For this added reason, we have recognized an urgent responsibility to discover all delinquents and enforce the payment of all taxes due and penalties incurred. The general acceptance of tax liabilities has so strengthened the position of the Bureau in the enforcement of the law that those who are intentionally delinquent in the payment of taxes have come to recognize that they cannot hope to escape detection year after year, but will eventually be discovered and brought to justice. To meet this situation, however, an unprecedented expansion of the personnel of the service has been necessary. In less than two years, the force has been increased from 3,000 to 14,000 employees. With due recognition of the fact that we have a responsibility in assisting all citizens to meet their obligations under the law, we see that this assistance is rendered in an acceptable manner to the taxpayers. The door is open to every taxpayer and to his authorized representative for the presentation of claims and appeals, and for the argument of cases under consideration. It has been discovered that in this kind of legal and accounting practice, certain abuses have developed. Taxpayers have suffered in some instances as the result of unethical conduct on the part of tax advisors and consultants, who have sought their own advantage in the mystification of their clients and in the delay inevitably incident to the procedure of the Bureau. In the doubt and uncertainty which surround many cases, it is natural for the taxpayers to endeavor to secure competent advice. On this subject I wish to offer a word of counsel. It is only natural, in the present situation, that thousands of consulting tax services have been established throughout the country. Some of these are competent, reasonable in their charges to taxpayers, and helpful to the government. Others are not competent to advise their clients correctly, and some have exacted exorbitant fees. The amount of consultation needed should be greatly reduced when taxpayers are confident, as I assure them they may be, that the Bureau of Internal Revenue will scrupulously protect their interests, and will return to them any amount of money which they may inadvertently pay in excess of their true liability. Fair Treatment for Taxpayers 
our official attitude toward taxpayers who are disposed to appeal from the official decisions in their cases is considerate and open-minded. We wish to entertain and give full consideration to appeals and claims in specified cases, as well as to general suggestions for improving the policies and procedures followed. If final action is not acceptable to the taxpayers, we have a separate appellate body, known as the Advisory Tax Board, composed of specialists in economics, accounting, business, and government administration. The functions of this board, it is hoped, will eliminate a large number of cases which otherwise would be taken directly to the courts. The administrative task of the Internal Revenue Bureau presents many difficulties. In devising means to perform our important work, we receive very little guidance from the past experiences of the office. It must be clear that an organization engaged for half a century in the collection of taxes on liquor and tobacco could not readily be transformed into an agency for dealing with practically every citizen in the collection of an essentially different kind of tax. We have crossed the threshold of a new era in internal revenue taxation. For some time prior to the entrance of the United States into the war, it was evident that alcohol and alcoholic beverages were declining in importance as sources of internal revenue. The scope of taxation was extended to include sales by manufacturers, importers, and producers of a considerable list of articles, such as automobiles, musical instruments, proprietary medicines, and others too numerous to mention. Stamp taxes were provided on certain legal and business documents and transactions, and there were many changes of administrative provisions relating to other taxes. As a result, the income and profits tax provisions of the 1917 and 1918 revenue laws resulted in the filing of about 11 million returns. The review and verification of these returns involves an administrative task of large proportions, not only because of the great number of cases to be handled, but also because of the highly technical nature of the legal and accounting principles which must be applied. A PLEA FOR THE AID OF ALL CITIZENS It is obvious that this Bureau cannot supply the necessary response to the government's urgent demand, which must come from the taxpayer. Our success will depend altogether on the ability of citizens generally to enter into a sympathetic and intimate relationship with the tax collector. If every person, man or woman, before entering upon an enterprise or completing any transaction, will take account of the tax liability he or she may be incurring, the payment of taxes will be facilitated. Not only will each individual subject to a tax regard the government as a preferred stockholder in his affairs, but a salutary effect will result because of the added care thus taken to establish and keep accounts on a scientific basis in the home, in the store, in the office, and in the factory. Another important consideration is that the widespread attention thus given to tax matters will result in a more intelligent popular understanding of the subject, and this understanding will be reflected in the legislation enacted by Congress as need arises. It is the plain duty of all citizens to acquire such knowledge, and thus to equip themselves for counsel with their representatives in Congress. The time for such counsel is always at hand. The founding of our government, after all, was based on the righteous contention that taxation and government should be based on consent through representation of those who are taxed and governed, in contradistinction to the old theory which permitted the reigning despot to collect taxes at the point of the sword. No excuse for the tax dodger. Viewed in its largest and truest sense, the payment of taxes is payment for benefits received or expected. Only from a narrow and essentially selfish and short-sighted view of things can the individual propose to himself the evasion of tax liability as a desirable course of action. The damage to those who follow this course may be intangible, but it is none the less real. It is the same penalty as that which surely falls upon one who employs, 
in dealing with his fellow men, methods and practices that do not accord with the enlightened ethics of modern business. I repeat this more or less commonplace observation because the old idea, now generally recognized as an erroneous and immoral idea, still persists. I find, for instance, in a report of the Special Tax Commission of Kentucky, published in 1914, the following statement. A high court in one state has decided that perjury in connection with a man's tax list does not affect his general credibility under oath. Good citizens will deprecate this statement, which strikes at the roots of our government and discredits the political ideals of our people, who for a century and a half have known no such thing as taxation without representation. I am glad to testify that the responsiveness of the American people to their federal tax liabilities leaves nothing to desire. If any assurance were needed of the loyal support which the people of the United States are ready to give to their established institutions of government, it would be afforded in the voluntary filing on March 15, 1920, of more than four million tentative returns of taxable income, accompanied by remittances aggregating more than a billion dollars. Every citizen, therefore, who understands the true significance of taxes, and who complies fully with the requirements of the law, has a direct personal interest in the effectual administration of that law, and a duty extending beyond mere literal compliance with the laws and regulations. This duty is to assist others to understand the significance of taxes, and to induce them to take prompt and proper action. Every citizen should be a tax-gatherer as well as a taxpayer. The direct result of this sort of response is the economical and effective administration of collection, with consequent diminution of the tax burden upon all. End of Collecting Eight Billions of Dollars for the Government by Daniel C. Roper The Eight Immortals of the Wine Cup by Tu Fu Translated by Shigeyoshi Obata This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Chi Chang rides his horse, but reels as on a reeling ship. Should he, blear-eyed, tumble into a well, he would lie in the bottom fast asleep. Ju Yang, prince, must have three jugfuls ere he goes up to court. How copiously his royal mouth waters as a brewer's cart passes by. It's a pity, he mournfully admits, that he is not the lord of the wine spring. Our minister Lee squanders at the rate of ten thousand pence per day. He inhales like a great whale, gulping one hundred rivers, and, with a cup in his hand, insists he loves the sage and avoids the wise. Tsung Chi, a handsome youth, fastidious, disdains the rabel, and turns his gaze towards the blue heaven, holding his beloved bowl. Radiant is he, like a tree of jade that stands against the breeze. Su Chin, the religious, cleanses his soul before the painted Buddha, but his long rites must needs be interrupted, as oft he loves to go on a spree. As for Li Po, give him a jugful, he will write one hundred poems, he drowses in a wine shop on a city street of Chang'an, and though his sovereign calls, will not board the imperial barge. Please, your majesty, says he, I am a god of wine. Chang Su is a calligrapher of renown. Three cups makes him the master. He throws off his cap, bearing his pate unceremoniously before princes, and wields his inspired brush. Lo, wreaths of cloud roll on the paper. Chao Sui, another immortal, elate after full five jugfuls, is eloquent with heroic speech, the wonder of all the feasting 
hall. End of The Eight Immortals of the Wine Cup by Tu Fu Translated by Shigeyoshi Obata The Extraordinary Case of Elizabeth Woodcock of Impington near Cambridge who was buried in the snow of February 1799, eight days and eight nights, by William Granger. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Elizabeth Woodcock, aged 42 years, went on horseback from Impington to Cambridge on Saturday, being market day the 2nd of February, 1799. On her return home in the evening, between 6 and 7 o'clock, being about half a mile from her own house, her horse started at a sudden light, which proceeded most probably from a meteor, a phenomenon which at this season of the year not unfrequently happens. She was herself struck with the light and exclaimed, Good God, what can this be? It was a very inclement stormy night. A bleak wind blew boisterously from the northeast. The ground was covered by the great quantities of snow that had fallen during the day, yet it was not spread uniformly over the surface. The deepest ditches were many of them completely filled up, whilst in the open fields there was but a thin covering. But in the roads and lanes and many narrow and enclosed parts, it had accumulated to a considerable depth, nowhere yet so as to render the ways impassable, but still enough to retard and impede the traveller. The horse, upon his starting, ran backward, and approached to the brink of a ditch, which the poor woman recollected, and fearing lest the animal in his fright should plunge into it, very prudently dismounted with all expedition. Her intention was to walk and lead the horse home, but he started again and broke from her. She repeated her attempt to take hold of the bridle, but the horse, still under the impression of fear, turned suddenly out of the road and directed his steps to the right over the common field. She followed him in hopes of quickly overtaking him, but unfortunately she lost one of her shoes in the snow. She was already wearied with the exertion that she had made, and besides, had a heavy basket on her arm, containing several articles of domestic consumption which she had brought from market. By these means her pursuit of the horse were greatly impeded. She, however, persisted, and followed him through the opening in a hedge, a little beyond which she overtook him, about a quarter of a mile from the place where she alighted, and, taking hold of the bridle, made another attempt to lead him home but she had not retraced her steps farther than a thicket which lies contiguous to the said hedge when she found herself so much fatigued and exhausted her hands and feet particularly her left foot which was without a shoe so very much benumbed that she was unable to proceed further sitting down upon the ground in this state and letting go the bridle tinker she said calling the horse by his name i am too much tired to go any farther you must go home without me, and exclaimed, Lord have mercy upon me, what will become of me? The ground on which she sat was upon a level with the common field, close under the thicket on the southwest. She well knew the situation of it, and what was its distance from and bearing with respect to her own house. There was then but a small quantity of snow drifted near her, but it was beginning to accumulate, and it actually accumulates so rapidly that when Chesterton Bell rang at eight o'clock, she was completely enclosed and hemmed in by it. The depth of the snow in which she was enveloped was about six feet in a perpendicular direction, over her head between two and three. Her imprisonment was now complete, for she was incapable of making any effectual attempt to extricate herself, and in addition to her fatigue and cold, her clothes were stiffened by the frost. Resigning herself, therefore, calmly to the necessity of her bad situation, she sat awaiting the dawn of the following day. To the best of her recollection, she slept very little during the first night, or indeed any of the succeeding nights or days, except on Friday the 8th. 
Early the next morning she distinctly heard the ringing of a bell at one of the villages at a small distance. Her mind was now turned, as it was most natural, to the thoughts of her preservation, and busied itself in concerting expedients by means of which any one who chanced to come near the place might discover her. On the morning of the third, the first after her imprisonment, observing before her a circular hole in the snow, about two feet in length and half a foot in diameter, running obliquely upwards through the mass, she broke off a branch of the bush, which was close to her, and with it thrust her handkerchief through the hole, and hung it, as a signal of distress, upon one of the uppermost twigs that remained uncovered, an expedient which will be seen in the sequel to have occasioned her discovery. She bethought herself at the same time that the change of the moon was near, and having an almanac in her pocket, she took it out, though with great difficulty, and consulting it, found that there would be a new moon the next day, February 4th. The difficulty which she found in getting the almanac out of her pocket arose in a great measure from the stiffness of her frozen clothes before mentioned. The trouble, however, was compensated by the consolation which the prospect of so near a change in her favour afforded. The extremity of this hole was closed up with a thin covering of snow or ice on the first morning which easily transmitted the light. When she put out her handkerchief she broke it, in consequence of which, the external air being admitted, she felt herself very cold. On the second morning, it was again closed up in a similar manner, and continued so till the third day, after which time it remained open. She perfectly distinguished the alterations of day and night, heard the bells of her own and some of the neighbouring villages several different times, particularly that of Chesterton, which rings every night at eight o'clock and four in the morning during the winter half of the year, Sundays excepted, and is at the distance of nearly two miles from the place where she sat. She was sensible of the living scene around her, frequently noticing the sound of carriages upon the road, the natural cries of animals, such as the bleating of sheep and lambs, and the barking of dogs. One day she overheard a conversation carried on by two gypsies, relative to an ass which they had lost. She afterwards specified it was not their asses, in general terms, that they were talking about, but some particular one, and her precision in this respect has been confirmed by the acknowledgement of the gypsies themselves. She recollected having pulled out a snuff-box and taken two pinches of snuff, but, which is very strange, she felt so little gratification from it that she never repeated it. A common observer would have imagined the irritation arriving from the snuff would have been peculiarly grateful to her, and that being deprived of all other comforts, she would have solaced herself with those which the box afforded, till the contents of it were exhausted. Possibly, however, the cold she endured might have so far blunted her powers of sensation that the snuff no longer retained its stimulus. At another time, finding her left hand beginning to swell in consequence of her reclining for a considerable time on that arm, she took two rings, the tokens of her nuptial vows twice pledged from her finger, and put them, together with a little money which she had in her pocket, into a small box, sensibly judging that should she not be found alive, the rings and money being thus deposited were less likely to be overlooked by the discoverers of her breathless corpse. She frequently shouted out, in hopes that her vociferations, reaching the ears of any that chanced to pass that way, they might be drawn to the spot where she was, but the snow so far prevented the transmission of her voice that no one heard her. The gypsies, who passed nearer to her than any other persons, were not sensible of any sound proceeding from her snow-formed cavern, though she particularly endeavoured to attract their attention. When the period of her seclusion approached to a termination and a thaw took place on the Friday after the commencement of her misfortunes, she felt uncommonly faint and languid, her clothes were wet quite through by the melted snow. The aperture before mentioned became considerably enlarged and tempted her to make an effort to release herself, but alas, it was a vain attempt. Her strength was too much impaired, her feet and legs were no longer obedient to her will, and her clothes were becoming very much heavier by the water which they had imbibed. And now, for the first time, she began to despair of ever being discovered or taken out alive and she declared that, all things considered, she could not have survived a continuation of her suffering, 
for the space of twenty-four hours longer. It was now that the morning of her emancipation was arrived. Her sufferings increased. She sat with one of her hands spread over her face and fetched the deepest sighs. Her breath was short and difficult, and symptoms of approaching dissolution became every hour more alarming. On Sunday, the 10th of February, a young farmer, whose name is Joseph Munsey, in his way home from Cambridge, about half past twelve o'clock, crossed over the open field and passed very near the spot where the woman was. A coloured handkerchief hanging upon the tops of the twigs, where it was before said she had suspended it, caught his eye. He walked up to the place and espied an opening in the snow. It was the very aperture which led to the prisoner's apartment and which was sufficiently large to afford the woman space enough to move herself about three or four inches in any direction, but not to stand upright, because only about three feet and a half in height, and about two in the broadest part. He heard a sound issue from it, familiar to that of a person breathing hard and with difficulty. He looked in, and saw a female figure, whom he recognised at once to be the identical woman who had been so long missing. He did not speak to her, but seeing another young farmer and the shepherd at a little distance, he communicated to them the discovery he had made, upon which, though they scarcely gave any credit to his report, they went with him to the spot. The shepherd called out, Are you there, Elizabeth Woodcock? She replied in a faint and feeble accent, Dear John Stittle, I know your voice. For God's sake, help me out of this place. Every effort was immediately made to comply with her request. Stittle made his way through the snow till he was able to reach her. She eagerly grasped his hand and implored him not to leave her. I have been here a long time, she observed. Yes, answered the man, ever since Saturday. I, Saturday week, she replied. I have heard the bells go two Sundays for church. An observation which demonstrably proves how well apprised she was of the duration of her confinement. Mr. Muncie and Mr. Merrington, Jr., during this conversation, were gone to the village to inform the husband and to procure proper means for conveying her home. They quickly returned, and in company with her husband, some of the neighbours and the elder Mr. Merrington, who brought with him his horse and chaise cart, blankets to wrap her in, and some refreshment which he took it for granted she would stand in peculiar need of. The snow being a little more cleared away, Mr. M. went up to her, and upon her entreaty gave her a piece of biscuit and a small quantity of brandy, from both of which she found herself greatly recruited. As he took her up to put her into the chaise, the stocking of the left leg, adhering to the ground, came off. She fainted in his arms. Notwithstanding, he moved her with all the caution in his power. But nature was very much exhausted, and the motion added to the impression which the sight of her husband and neighbours made upon her was too much for her strength and spirits. The fit, however, was but of short continuance, and when she recovered, he laid her gently in the carriage, covered her well over with the blankets, and conveyed her, without delay or interruption, to her own house. When the horse came home, her husband and another person set out on the road with a lantern, and went quiet to Cambridge, where they only learnt that she left the inn at six that evening. They explored the road afresh that night, and for four succeeding days, and searched the huts of the gypsies, whom they suspected might have robbed and murdered her, in vain, till she was unexpectedly discovered in the manner already mentioned. Mr. Oakes, a surgeon, first saw her in the cart as she was removing home. She spoke to him with a voice tolerably strong, but rather hoarse. Her hands and arms were sodden, but not very cold, though her legs and feet were, and the latter in great measure mortified. She was immediately put to bed, and weak broth given her occasionally. From the time of her being lost, she had eaten only snow, and believed she had not slept till Friday the 8th. Her only evacuation was a little water. The hurry of spirits, occasioned by too many visitors, rendered her feverish, and her feet were found to be completely mortified from being frostbitten before she was covered with the snow. She was so disturbed with company that Mr. O had little hope of her recovery. He ordered a clister of mutton broth, which greatly relieved her, some saline mixture with antimonial wine and strong decoction of bark and three grains of opium in the course of a day. He opened the vesications on her feet and continued the use of brandy as at first, clisters, opium and bark being continued with port wine. The cold had extended its violent effects from the end of the toes to the middle of the instep. 
including more than an inch above the heels and all the bottom of the feet, which were mortified and were poulticed with stale beer and oatmeal boiled together. Inward cold, as she called it, affected her, and she desired the cataplasms might be renewed as often as possible and very warm. The 19th and 20th she was seized with a violent diarrhoea, which occasioned great weakness, and two days after several toes were so loose as to be removed by the scissors. The 23rd she was taken up without fainting. All the toes were removed, and the integuments from the bottom of one foot, except a piece at the heel, which was so long ere it loosened itself that the oscalsis and tendo Achilles had suffered. The sloughs on the other foot were thrown off more slowly, and two of the toes removed. All but one great toe was removed by the 17th, and on removing the sloughs from the heels, the bone was bare in many places, and wherever the mortification had taken place was one large sore, very tender. The sores were much diminished, and the great toe was taken off by the end of March, and an unusual sleepiness came on. By April 17, the sores were free from sloughs and daily lessened. Her appetite, tolerably good, and her general health begin to amend. But with all these circumstances in her favour, she felt herself to be very uncomfortable, and in fact, her prospect was most miserable. For though her life was saved, the mutilated state in which she was left, without even a chance of ever being able to attend to the duties of her family, was almost worse than death itself. For, from the exposure of the oscalsis, in all probability it would have required some months before the bottoms of her feet could be covered with new skin. And, after all, they would have been so tender as not to bear any pressure. The loss, too, of all her toes must have made it impossible for her to move herself, but with the assistance of crutches. Mr. Oakes ascribes the preservation of her life to her not having slept or had any evacuations under the snow, and to her resignation and the calm state of her mind. She closed a lingering existence, July 13, 1799. We are sorry to add that too free indulgence of spirituous liquors is supposed to have been the cause both of the extraordinary accident and its fatal consequences. End of The Extraordinary Case of Elizabeth Woodcock of Impington near Cambridge, who was buried in the snow of February 1799, eight days and eight nights, by William Granger. Sechse, sieben oder acht. Music, Ignis Brühl. Lyrics, Ludwig Jakobowski. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Auf der Straße an den Hecken blüht es voller jeden Tag. Rosen schwanken an dem Stecken, fröhlich schwirrt's in
End of Sechse, Sieben oder Acht. Music Ignis Brüll, Lyrics Ludwig Jakobowski. The Eight Immortals from Myths and Legends of China by E.T.C. Werner. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Eight Immortals, Pach Sien. Either singly or in groups, the Eight Immortals, Pach Sien, of the Taoist religion, are one of the most popular subjects of representation in China. Their portraits are to be seen everywhere. On porcelain vases, teapots, teacups, fans, scrolls, embroidery, etc. Images of them are made in porcelain, earthenware, roots, wood, metals. The term, eight immortals, is figuratively used for happiness. The number eight has become lucky in association with this tradition, and personal things eight in number are graced accordingly. Thus, we read of reverence shown to the eight genii table, Pak Sien Chou, the eight genii bridge, Pak Sien Chiao, eight genii vermicelli, Pak Sien Mien, the eight genii of the wine cup, Tin Chung Pak Sien, wine bibbers of the Tang dynasty, celebrated by Tu Fu the poet. They are favorite subjects of romance and special objects of adoration. In them we see the embodiment of the ideas of perfect but imaginary happiness which possesses the minds of the Chinese people. Three of them, Chung Li Chuan, Chang Kuo and Lu Yen, were historical personages. The others are mentioned only in fables or romances. They represent all kinds of people, old, young, male, female, civil, military, rich, poor, afflicted, cultured, noble. They are also representative of early, middle and later historical periods. The legend of the Eight Immortals is certainly not older than the time of the Song Dynasty, AD 960-1280, and is probably to be assigned to that of the Yuan Dynasty, 1280-1368. But some, if not all, of the group seem to have been previously celebrated as immortals in the Taoist legends, their biographies are usually arranged in the order of their official eminence or seniority in age. Here I follow that adopted in Xiu Xiang Pa Xian Tung Yu Qi, in which they are described in the order in which they became immortals. Li Tie Kuai Li Tie Kuai, depicted always with his crutch and gourd full of magic medicines, was of the family name of Li his own name being Li Yuan. He is also known as Kung Mu. Xi Wang Mu cured him of an ulcer on the leg and taught him the art of becoming immortal. He was canonized as rector of the East. He is said to have been of commanding stature and dignified mien, devoting himself solely to the study of Taoist law. Xi Wang Mu made him a present of an iron crutch, and sent him to the capital to teach the doctrine of immortality to Han Chung Li. He is also identified with Li Ning Yang, to whom Lao Tzu descended from heaven in order to instruct him in the wisdom of the gods. Soon after he had completed his course of instruction, his soul left his body to go on a visit to Hua Shan. Some say he was summoned by Lao Tzu, Others, that Lao Tzu engaged him as escort to the countries of Xi Yu. He left his disciple Lang Ling in charge of his body, saying that if he did not return within seven days, he was to have the body cremated. Unfortunately, when only six days had elapsed, the disciple was called away to the deathbed of his mother. In order to be able to leave at once, he cremated the body forthwith, and when the soul returned, it found only a heap of ashes. Some say the body was not cremated, but only became devitalized through neglect or through being uninhabited for so long a time. The object of setting of the watch was not only to prevent injury to or theft of the body, but also to prevent any other soul from taking up its abode in it. In a forest nearby, a beggar had just died of hunger. Finding this corpse untenanted, the wandering spirit entered it through the temples and made off. 
When he found that his head was long and pointed, his face black, his beard and hair woolly and dishevelled, his eyes of gigantic size, and one of his legs lame, he wished to get out of this vile body. But Lao Tzu advised him not to make the attempt, and gave him a gold band to keep his hair in order, and an iron crutch to help his lame leg. On lifting his hand to his eyes, he found they were as large as buckles. That is why he was called Li Kung Mu, Li Hollow Eyes. Popularly, he is known as Li Tie Kuai, Li with the Iron Crutch. No precise period seems to be assigned to his career on earth, though one tradition places him in the Yuan Dynasty. Another account says that he was changed into a dragon and in that form ascended to heaven. Elsewhere, it is related that Tie Kuai, after entering the body of the lame beggar, benevolently proceeded to revive the mother of Yang, his negligent disciple. Leaning on his iron staff and carrying a gourd of medicines on his back, he went to Yang's house, where preparations were being made for the funeral. The contents of the gourd poured into the mouth revived the dead woman. He then made himself known, and giving Yang another pill, vanished in a gust of wind. Two hundred years later, he effected the immortalization of his disciple. During his peregrinations on earth, he would hang a bottle on the wall at night and jump into it, emerging on the following morning. He frequently returned to earth and at times tried to bring about the transmigration of others. An example is the case of Chao Tu, the watchman. Tier Kwai walked into a fiery furnace and bade Chao follow. The latter, being afraid of imitating an act evidently associated with the supernatural world of evil spirits, refused to do so. Tier Kwai then told Chao to step onto a leaf floating on the surface of the river, saying that it was a boat that would bear him across safely. Again the watchman refused, whereupon Tier Kwai, remarking that the cares of this world were evidently too weighty for him to be able to ascend to immortality, stepped onto the leaf himself and vanished. Chung Li Chuan Regarding the origin and life of this immortal, several different accounts are given. One states that his family name was Chung Li, and that he lived in the Han dynasty, being therefore called Han Chung Li. His cognomen was Chuan, his literary appellation Chi Tao, and his pseudonyms Ho Ho Tzu and Wang Yang Tzu, his style Yun Fang. He was born in the district of Xian Yang Xian, a sub-prefecture of the ancient capital Xi'an Fu in Shanxi. He became Marshal of the Empire in the cyclic year 2496. In his old age, he became a hermit on Yang Chiu Shan, 30 li northeast of Ai Cheng Xian, in the prefecture of Ping Yang Fu in Shanxi. He is referred to by the title of King Emperor of the True Active Principle. Another account describes Chung Li Chuan as merely a vice marshal in the services of Duke Cho Xiao. He was defeated in battle and escaped to Chung Nan Shan, where he met the five heroes, the flowers of the East, who instructed him in the doctrine of immortality. At the end of the Tang dynasty, Han Chung Li taught the same science of immortality to Lu Tong Pin and took the pompous title of the only independent one under heaven. Other versions state that Han Chung Li is not the name of a person but of a country, that he was a Taoist priest, Chung Li Tzu, and that he was a beggar, Chung Li by name, who gave to one Lao Qi a pill of immortality. No sooner had the latter swallowed it than he went mad, left his wife, and ascended to heaven. During a great famine, he transmuted copper and pewter into silver by amalgamating them with some mysterious drug. This treasure he distributed among the poor, and thousands of lives were thus saved. One day, while he was meditating, the stone wall of his dwelling in the mountains was rent asunder and a jade casket exposed to view. This was found to contain secret information as to how to become an immortal. When he had followed these instructions for some time, his room was filled with many coloured clouds, music was heard, and a celestial stork came and bore him away on its back to the regions of immortality. He is sometimes representing holding his feather fan, Yu Mao Shan, 
at other times the peach of immortality. Since his admission to the ranks of the gods, he has appeared on earth at various times as the messenger of heaven. On one of these occasions, he met Lu Yen. Lan Tsai Ho Lan Tsai Ho is variously stated to have been a woman and an hermaphrodite. She is the strolling singer or mountebank of the immortals. Usually, she plays a flute or a pair of cymbals. Her origin is unknown, but her personal name is said to have been Yang Su, and her career is assigned to the period of the Tang dynasty. She wandered abroad clad in a tattered blue gown held by a black wooden belt three inches wide, with one foot shoeless and the other shod, wearing in summer an undergarment of wadded material, and in winter sleeping on the snow, her breath rising in a brilliant cloud like the steam from a boiling cauldron. In this guise she earned her livelihood by singing in the streets, keeping time with a wand three feet long, though taken for a lunatic, the doggerel verses she sang disproved the popular slanders. It denounced this fleeting life and its delusive pleasures. When given money, she either strung it on a cord and waved it to the time of a song, or scattered it on the ground for the poor to pick up. One day, she was found to have become intoxicated in an inn at Feng Yang Fu in Anhui, and while in that state, disappeared on a cloud having thrown down to earth her shoe, robe, belt, and castanets. According to popular belief, however, only one of the eight immortals, namely Ho Xian Ku, was a woman, Lan Tsai Ho being represented as a young person of about sixteen, bearing a basket of fruit. According to the Xiu Xiang Pa Xian Tung Yu Qi, he was the red-footed great genius. Chi Chao Ta Xian incarnate. Though he was a man, adds the writer, he could not understand how to be a man, which is perhaps the reason why he has been supposed to be a woman. Chang Kuo The period assigned to Chang Kuo is the middle or close of the 7th to the middle of the 8th century AD. He lived as a hermit on Chang Tiao Shan in the prefecture of Ping Yang Fu in Shanxi. The emperors Tai Tsung and Kao Tsung of the Tang dynasty frequently invited him to court, but he persistently refused to go. At last, pressed once more by the emperors Wu, A.D. 684 to 705, he consented to leave his retreat, but was struck down by death at the gate of the temple of the jealous woman. His body began to decay and to be eaten by worms, when lo, he was seen again, alive and well, on the mountains of Heng Chu in Ping Yang Fu. He rode on a white mule, which carried him thousands of miles in a day, and which, when the journey was finished, he folded up like a sheet of paper and put away in his wallet. When he again required its services, he had only to spurt water upon the packet from his mouth, and the animal at once assumed its proper shape. At all times, he performed wonderful feats of necromancy and declared that he had been Grand Minister to the Emperor Yao, 2357-2255 BC, during a previous existence. In the 23rd year, AD 735, of the reign period Kai Yuan of the Emperor Xuan Tsung of the Tang Dynasty, he was called to Luoyang in Honan and elected chief of the Imperial Academy, with the honourable title of Very Perspicacious Teacher. It was at this time that the famous Taoist Ye Fa Shan, thanks to his skill in necromancy, was in great favour at court. The emperor asked him, Who this Chang Kuo Lao, he usually has the epithet Lao Old added to his name, was? I know, replied the magician, but if I were to tell your majesty, I should fall dead at your feet, so I dare not speak unless your majesty will promise that you will go with bare feet and bare head to ask Chang Kuo to forgive you, in which case I should immediately revive. Xuan Tsung, having promised Fa Shen, then said, Chang Kuo is a white spiritual bat which came out of primeval chaos. No sooner had he spoken than he dropped dead at the emperor's feet. Xuan Tsung, with bare head and feet, went to Chang Kuo as he had promised and begged forgiveness for his indiscretion. 
The latter then sprinkled water on Fa Shan's face, and he revived. Soon after, Chang fell sick and returned to die in the Heng Chao Mountains during the period A.D. 742 to 746. When his disciples opened his tomb, they found it empty. He is usually seen mounted on his white mule, sometimes facing its head, sometimes its tail. He carries a phoenix feather or a peach of immortality. At his interviews with the Emperor Ming Huang in AD 723, when he was alive still, Chang Kuo entertained the Emperor with a variety of magical tricks, such as rendering himself invisible, drinking off a cup of aconite, and felling birds or flowers by pointing at them. He refused the hand of an imperial princess, and also declined to have his portrait placed in the Hall of Worthies. A picture of Chang Kuo sitting on a donkey and offering a descendant to the newly married couple is often found in the nuptial chamber. It seems somewhat incongruous that an old ascetic should be associated with matrimonial happiness and the granting of offspring, but the explanation may possibly be connected with his performance of wonderful feats of necromancy, though he is said not to have given encouragement to others in these things during his lifetime. Ho Xian Ku a maiden holding in her hand a magic lotus blossom, the flower of open-heartedness, or the peach of immortality given her by Lu Tung Ping in the mountain gorge as a symbol of identity, playing at times the shung or reed organ or drinking wine. This is the picture the Chinese paint of the immortal Ho Xian Ku. She was the daughter of Ho Tai, a native of Tseng Cheng Xian in Kuang Tung, Others say her father was a shopkeeper at Ling Ling in Hunan. She lived in the time of the usurping Empress Wu, AD 684 to 705, of the Tang dynasty. At her birth, six hairs were found growing on the crown of her head, and the account says she never had any more, although the pictures represent her with a full head of hair. She elected to live on Yun Mu Ling, 20 li west of Tseng Cheng Xian. On that mountain was found a stone called Yun Mu Shi, Mother of Pearl. In a dream, she saw a spirit who ordered her to powder and eat one of these stones, by doing which she could acquire both agility and immortality. She compiled with this injunction and also vowed herself to a life of virginity. Her days were thenceforth passed in floating from one peak to another bringing home at night to her mother the fruit she collected on the mountains. She gradually found that she had no need to eat in order to live. Her fame having reached the ears of the empress, she was invited to court, but while journeying thither suddenly disappeared from mortal view and became an immortal. She is said to have been seen again in AD 750, floating upon a cloud of many colours at the temple of Ma Ku, the famous female Taoist magician, and again some years later in the city of Canton. She is represented as an extremely beautiful maiden, and is remarkable as occupying so prominent a position in a cult in which no system of female asceticism is developed. Lu Tung Pin Lu Tung Ping's family name was Lu. His personal name, Tung Pin, also Yen, and his pseudonym, Shun Yang Tzu, he was born in A.D. 798 at Xian in the prefecture of Ho Chung Fu in Shanxi, 120 li southeast of the present sub-prefecture of Yongqi Xian. He came of an official family, his grandfather having been president of the Ministry of Ceremonies and his father prefect of Hai Chou. He was five feet two inches in height and at twenty was still unmarried. At this time he made a journey to Lu Shan in Qiangxi, where he met his fire dragon, who presented him with a magic sword, which enabled him at will to hide himself in the heavens. During his visit to the capital, Chang An in Shanxi, he met the immortal Han Chong Li, who instructed him in the mysteries of alchemy and the elixir of life. When he revealed himself as Yun Fang Xian Sheng, Lu Yen expressed an ardent desire to aid in converting mankind to the true doctrine, but was first exposed to a series of ten temptations. These being successfully overcome, he was invested with supernatural power and magic weapons, 
with which he travelled the empire, slaying dragons and ridding the earth of diverse kinds of evils during a period of upward of four hundred years. Another version says that Han Chung Li was in an inn heating a jug of rice wine. Here Lu met him and going to sleep dreamed that he was promoted to a very high office and was exceptionally favoured by fortune in every way. This had gone on for fifty years when unexpectedly a serious fault caused him to be condemned to exile and his family was exterminated. Alone in the world he was sighing bitterly when he awoke with a start. All had taken place in so short a space of time that Han Chung Li's wine was not yet hot. This is the incident referred to in Chinese literature in the phrase rice wine dream. Convinced of the hollowness of worldly dignities, he followed Han Chung Li to the holing mountains of Chung Nan in Shanxi, where he was initiated into the divine mysteries and became an immortal. In AD 1115, the Emperor Hui Tsung conferred on him the title of Hero of Marvelous Wisdom, and later he was proclaimed King Emperor and Strong Protector. There are various versions of the legend of Lu Tong Pin. One of these add that in order to fulfill his promise made to Chung Li to do what he could to aid in the work of converting his fellow creatures to the true doctrine, he went to Yu Yang in the guise of an oil seller, intending to immortalize all those who did not ask for additional weight to the quantity of oil purchased. During a whole year he met only selfish and extortionate customers, with the exception of one old lady, who alone did not ask for more than was her due. So he went to her house, and seeing a well in the courtyard, threw a few grains of rice into it. The water miraculously turned into wine, from the sale of which the dame amassed great wealth. He was very skillful in fencing, and is always represented with his magic Excalibur named Chan Yao Kuai, devil slaying saber, and in one hand holds a fly whisk, Yun Chu, or cloud sweeper, a symbol common in Taoism of being able to fly at will through the air and to walk on the clouds of heaven. Like Quan Kung, he is shown bearing in his arms a male child, indicating a promise of numerous progeny including literati and famous officials. Consequently, he is one of the spiritual beings honoured by the literati. Han Xiang Tzu Han Xiang Tzu, who is depicted with a bouquet of flowers or a basket of peaches of immortality, is stated to have been a grandnephew of Han Yu, AD 768-824, the great statesman, philosopher and poet of the Tang dynasty, and an ardent votary of transcendental study. His own name was Ching Fu. The child was entrusted to his uncle to be educated and prepared for the public examinations. He excelled his teacher in intelligence and the performance of wonderful feats, such as the production from a little earth in a flower pot of some marvellous flowering plants, on the leaves of which were written in letters of gold some verses to this effect. The clouds hide Mount Chin Ling. Where is your abode? The snow is deep on Lan Kuan. Your horse refuses to advance. What is the meaning of these verses? asked Han Yu. You will see, replied Han Xiang Tzu. Some time afterward, Han Yu was sent in disgrace to the prefecture of Chao Chou Fu in Kuang Tung. When he reached the foot of Lan Quan, the snow was so deep that he could not go on. Han Xiang Tzu appeared, and sweeping away the snow, made a path for him. Han Yu then understood the prophecy in his pupil's verse. When Han Xiang Tzu was leaving his uncle, he gave him the following in verse. Many indeed are the eminent men who have served their country, but which of them surpasses you in his knowledge of literature? When you have reached a high position, you will be buried in a damp and foggy land. Han Yu also gave his pupil a farewell verse. How many here below allow themselves to be inebriated by the love of honours and pelf? Alone and watchful, you preserve in the right path. But a time will come when, taking your flight to the sky, you will open in the ethereal blue a luminous 
roadway. Han Yu was depressed at the thought of the damp climate of his place of exile. I fear there is no doubt, he said, that I shall die without seeing my family again. Han Xiang Tzu consoled him, gave him a prescription and said, Not only will you return in perfect health to the bosom of your family, but you will be reinstated in your former offices. All this took place exactly as he had predicted. Another account states that he became the disciple of Lu Tung Pin, and having been carried up to the supernatural peach tree of the genii, fell from its branches, but during his descent attained to the state of immortality. Still another version says that he was killed by the fall, was transformed, and then underwent the various experiences with Han Yu already related. Cao Kuo Chiu Cao Kuo Chiu was connected with the imperial family of the Sungs and is shown with the tablet of admission to court in his hand. He became one of the eight immortals because the other seven, who occupied seven of the eight grottos of the upper spheres, wished to see the eighth inhabited and nominated him because his disposition resembled that of a genie. The legend relates that the Empress Cao, wife of the Emperor Zhen Tsung, had two younger brothers. The elder of the two, Qing Xiu, did not concern himself with the affairs of state. The younger, Qing Qi, was notorious for his misbehavior. In spite of all warnings, he refused to reform, and being at last guilty of homicide, was condemned to death. His brother, ashamed at what had occurred, went and hid in the mountains, where he clothed his head and body with wild plants, resolved to lead the life of a hermit. One day, Han Chung Li and Lu Tung Ping found him in his retreat and asked him what he was doing. I am engaged in studying the way, he replied. What way and where is it? they asked. He pointed to the sky. Where is the sky? they went on. He pointed to his heart. The two visitors smiled and said, The heart is the sky, and the sky is the way. You understand the origin of things. They then gave him a recipe for perfection, to enable him to take his place among the perfect ones. In a few days only, he had reached this much sought-after condition. In another version, we find fuller details concerning this immortal. A graduate named Yuan Wen Cheng of Chao Yang Xian in the sub-prefecture of Chao Chou Fu in Kuangtung, was travelling with his wife to take his examinations at the capital. Cao Ching Chi, the younger brother of the empress, saw the lady and was struck with her beauty. In order to gratify his passion, he invited the graduate and his young wife to the palace, where he strangled the husband and tried to force the wife to go habit with him. She refused obstinately, and as a last resort, he had her imprisoned in a noisome dungeon. The soul of the graduate appeared to the imperial censor Pao Lao Ye and begged him to exact vengeance for the execrable crime. The elder brother, Ching Xiu, seeing the case put in the hands of the upright Pao Lao Ye and knowing his brother to be guilty of homicide, advised him to put the woman to death in order to cut off all sources of information and so to prevent further proceedings. The young voluptuary thereupon caused the woman to be thrown down a deep well, but the star Tai Po Ching Sing in the form of an old man drew her out again. While making her escape, she met on the road an official procession which she mistook for that of Pao Lao Ye, and going up to the sedan chair made her accusation. This official was no other than the elder brother of the murderer, Ching Xiu, terrified, dared not refuse to accept the charge, but on the pretext that the woman had not placed herself respectfully by the side of the official chair, and thus had not left her way clear for the passage of his retinue, he had her beaten with iron-spiked whips, and she was cast away for dead in a neighbouring lane. This time also she revived, and ran to inform Pao Lao Ye, the latter immediately had Cao Ching Xiu arrested, canned, and fettered. Without loss of time, he wrote an invitation to the second brother, Cao Ching Chi, and on his arrival,
confronted him with the graduate's wife, who accused him to his face. Pao Lao Ye had him put in a pit and remained death to all entreaties of the emperor and empress on his behalf. A few days later, the murderer was taken to the place of execution and his head rolled in the dust. The problem now was to get Cao Ching Siu out of the hands of the terrible censor. The emperor, Zhen Tsung, to please the empress, had a universal amnesty proclaimed throughout the empire under which all prisoners were set free. On receipt of this edict, Pao Lao Ye liberated Cao Ching Siu from the Khan and allowed him to go free. As one risen from the dead, he gave himself up to the practice of perfection, became a hermit, and, through the instruction of the perfect ones, became one of the eight immortals. Pa Xian Kuo Hai The phrase Pa Xian Kuo Hai the eight immortals crossing the sea, refers to the legend of an expedition made by these deities. Their object was to behold the wondrous things of the sea not to be found in the celestial sphere. The usual mode of celestial locomotion, by taking a seat on a cloud, was discarded at the suggestion of Lu Yen, who recommended that they should show the infinite variety of their talents by placing things on the surface of the sea and stepping on them. Li Tie Kuai threw down his crutch and scudded rapidly over the waves. Chung Li Chuan used his feather fan. Chang Kuo, his paper mule. Lu Tung Ping, his sword. Han Xiang Tzu, his flower basket. Ho Xian Ku, her lotus flower. Lan Tsai Ho, his musical instrument and Cao Kuo Chiu, his tablet of admission to court. The popular pictures often represent most of these articles changed into various kinds of sea monsters. The musical instrument was noticed by the son of the Dragon King of the Eastern Sea. This avaricious prince conceived the idea of stealing the instrument and imprisoning its owner. The immortals thereupon declared war the details of which are described at length by the Chinese writers, the outcome being that the Dragon King was utterly defeated. After this, the eight immortals continued their submarine exploits for an indefinite time, encountering numberless adventures. But here the author travels far into the fertile region of romance, beyond the frontiers of our present province. End of The Eight Immortals from Myths and Legends of China by E.T.C. Werner Die achte Todsünde by Arno Holz This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ein Dichter darf mit seinen Sachen uns wütend, darf uns rasend machen. Wir stecken's schließlich ruhig ein. Wer wird denn immer kreuzigt schreien? Nur eins wird man ihm nie verknusen, und gibt's statt neun selbst neunzig Musen, wenn er in Reimen wässrig tränt, in des sein armer Leser gähnt. Drum, wer uns langweilt oder ledert, verdient, daß man ihn teert und federt. End of Die achte Todsünde bei Arno Holz Read by Hokus Pokus Number 289 of Vision by Mrs. Frank McCarthy. This is recorded to celebrate the 8th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I had lost all hope of inheriting my uncle's estate at Martinique when, through some mysterious freak, he left it in his will to an utter stranger paul wade by name who had lived with my uncle since the death of my cousin athalie in new york this stranger seemed to be beloved as a son by my uncle 
and it was probable that this beautiful inheritance would be forever estranged from the name and family of Gervaise. It was therefore a delightful surprise to me to receive a letter from Mr. Wade inviting me to visit him at Martinique, stating that his health was failing, and he would be glad if, as his rightful heir, I would remain with him and take charge of the estate. I lost no time in hastening to him, and finding him, although very reticent and preoccupied in his manner, a most excellent fellow at heart, was careful not to pester him with intrusive questions. We got on very well together, and he was even good enough to tell me that he entertained a sincere regard for me, for which I was, in good truth, very grateful. This happened one night in the library at Martinique. We had been sitting there silently together. About us there was every luxury conceivable. The grounds outside were in themselves an earthly paradise. But somehow I had fallen into a singular reverie. I looked for a while at the ghostly shadows of the trees upon the garden walk outside. They seemed, in the weird moonlight, to be dancing an elfish measure to the melancholy cadence of the waves breaking upon the distant shore. The silence became oppressive. "'Perhaps you'll laugh at me, Paul,' I said. "'But in a sentimental way I believe in ghosts. Not the fellows that stalk about in white sheets, you know.' but the communion of a heavenly spirit with an earthly one. He started and looked at me earnestly. Then he stretched out his hand to me across the library table. I like you very much, Antoine, he said, and have great reason to be thankful you are to inherit the estate. I became its owner through just such a communion as you spoke of, through the agency of a spirit. I dropped his hand and poured out for myself some wine. "'Come with me,' he cried, snatching up a candle. And following him through the spacious corridor, I entered the bedchamber of my host. It fronted the sea, and, although plainly furnished, was perhaps the most attractive room in the house. Immediately over the mantel was a large picture covered with some fleecy drapery, through which I could see the faint outline of a dead woman lying upon a velvet pall. Without raising the curtain that concealed the picture, he thrust his hand under it, and, grasping some letters that were put into the frame, hurried me out of the room again and back to our table in the library. I need these, he said, seating himself and placing the letters before him, to complete the history of the picture you saw just now. I beg your pardon. I said. You forgot to allow me to see it. I must confess, I added, yielding to a reasonable curiosity, I should like to very much. It is of no interest to anyone but me, he rejoined quickly, as you will see when you hear the following story. I entered the city of New York, Mr. Wade continued, one cold night in December, under the black, cold, infinite sky that night there was not a creature more absolutely friendless than I. Between me and starvation there rested a very little money, a crude idea of colour, some talent in drawing, and a resolute will to become a painter. I was in search of a studio in the great metropolis. All that I needed was a garret with an upper light, and this I stumbled upon in an old house in West Broadway. It was difficult to induce the miserable old Frenchman that kept the store below to let me have the room. He wanted to thrust me into every nook in the old barrack but the garret, the very one that was necessary to me. The man was old, with little piercing grey eyes, skin like a piece of parchment, and a nose and chin that almost met. Greed of the most rapacious and repelling kind was written upon every line of his face. I offered him a month's rent in advance for his garret, and the sight of the money finished the bargain. He signed the receipt with his shaky skeleton claws. His name was Baptiste Perret. Having procured possession of my room, I proceeded to explore it, 
a matter of five minutes finished the research. It was large and square and gloomy to desolation. A dim light struggled in from the upper window through the dirt and grime of ages. The dingy boards were full of cracks and holes. The old black rafters concealed an army of spiders, and the immense festoons of webs were so ingeniously contrived as to call forth a species of admiration. An old wooden bedstead leaned up against the wall in one corner, in another reclined a chair minus a back. This comprised the furniture of the room. An open fireplace yawned before me, suggestive of the genial warmth that poverty denied me. I looked about me dejectedly. What a horrible future loomed up before me! To pass day after day in this dingy den, perhaps in the end to die here of starvation. I, who love light and warmth and luxury, to be condemned to the desolation of this abominable garret. I started up and fled from the house. I went out in the cold December night and walked restlessly up and down, arguing with myself manfully. At the end of an hour I went back to my garret with a few candles and some crackers. I resolved firmly that, come what might, that garret for the time should be my home. It was after ten when I lay down upon the bed in the corner and strove to sleep. I found it impossible. It was too cold. There was but one blanket, and that of the thinnest and most miserable quality. A fierce wind rattled at the windows and swept through the room. My very bones ached, and, shaking as if with an ague, I strove in vain to chafe a little warmth into my limbs. I lay thus wide awake for a couple of hours. Suddenly I felt a singular numb sensation creeping over me. A delicious warmth spread itself about me, crept into my lungs, and lifted the oppression from my chest. I felt as if transported from that terrible region in Dante's Inferno, where the lost are embedded in eternal fields of ice, to the realms of paradise. The thought struck me that I had gone through with the preliminary torture of freezing and had reached that fatal stage of numbness which had been described to me as a blissful reaction. I resolved not to struggle against it in the least. If death had come to me in this shape, it was too comfortable to resist. I became, however, gradually conscious of a feeling that startled me. I was certain there was something or somebody in that room with me. This fancy was a troublesome one, for to prove the truth of my conviction I was compelled to get out of bed and search the room. I aroused myself from my trance reluctantly and strove to reach the mantel where I had left my candle and matches. As I groped along the floor, my hand suddenly came in contact with something like drapery. I started back, wondering and recalled to myself the utter bareness of the room when I went to bed. Then I again stretched forth my hand. I distinctly felt a hard substance, a square beam of wood with folds of cloth hanging about it. Resolving to see this strange article of furniture, I got upon my feet and walked directly to the wall, feeling my way around the room until I reached the mantel. Lighting my candle, I looked eagerly about me. Not a trace of anything could be seen. The room was as bare and desolate as ever. More bare and desolate, for it was colder than before. I went back to bed again, and shivered there till morning. The next day I passed in a futile effort to paint. I arranged my easel, stretched my canvas, laid out my colours, and endeavoured to sketch out the outlines of a picture. The effort was a wretched one, and I went out for a walk. Passing my landlord on the rickety stairs, it occurred to me to ask of him the meaning of the singular piece of furniture I had found in my room the night before. "'Tell me, Mr. Perry,' I said, "'do you keep a ghost up in my garret?' He started back, an ashy pallor in his face. 
Don't get frightened, I hastened to add. It's only the ghost of a table or couch or something in the furniture line. I can swear I felt two posts of wood in the middle of the floor with some sort of drapery about them. Mr. Perret did not reply, and I went through the store out into the street. It appeared to me that my landlord did not do a very thriving business, as the most abject poverty and wretchedness seemed to reign in the great barren room. It was something in the pawnbroker way, as there were bundles and boxes with tickets upon them, but a look of mould and desolation was upon every thing. Getting back about nightfall, I lighted my candle with a bustling attempt at cheer that was pitiably abortive. The fact was, I was never made to rough it in solitude of this miserable kind. Then it was impossible to fight against the cold that reigned in my garret. It made the teeth chatter in my head, the blood congeal in my veins, and I looked back with longing to the feeling of relief I had felt upon the previous night. I was glad when the time came for me to creep under my wretched blanket. My delight may be imagined when, after suffering an agony of cold, I felt suddenly again the delicious warmth of the night before. The soft air, the impalpable, vague luxury of my former trance. I remained perfectly quiet, resolving this time not to move. But against my will, although I resolutely strove against it, I became conscious that the something of the night before was in the room with me again, and although I would much rather not have investigated the mystery, I was in a manner compelled to again get out of bed and grope about the floor. Suddenly my hand touched the drapery of cloth, and in withdrawing it I felt again the beam of wood. I confess I was startled. I resolved to grasp it, whatever it was, and drag it with me to the light. But upon endeavouring to move it I found it was impossible. Either it was too heavy, or it was fastened to the floor. I passed my hand along the folds of cloth, and found they extended for several feet. The beams of wood seemed to support a few boards at the top, over which this cloth was thrown. I got upon my feet, and placed my hand upon the top of the boards. I drew back suddenly. An icy chill struck to the very marrow of my bones. I retreated to the wall again, and reaching the mantel, lighted my candle, and looked about me. Nothing, absolutely nothing, was to be seen. I remained in the chair all night. The next night I left my candle burning, and saw nothing but the bare room, felt nothing but the cold. I suffered so much with cold disappointment and baffled curiosity, that when night came again I resolved to put away my candle. If darkness was necessary for the investigation of this mystery, there should be the most Stygian obscurity. Nevertheless, when, upon shivering for a time, I felt suddenly the familiar warmth envelop me, the luxurious atmosphere creep in at my mouth and nostrils, I trembled. I confess it, I was seized with a nameless terror. Chill after chill crept down my back, a peculiar sensation went through my scalp. I felt, so to say, my hair rising upon my head. This physical cowardice did not, however, deter me from pursuing my task, nor did it detract from my eagerness and anxiety to solve the whole mystery of that presence in the room. I got out of my bed and crept softly over the floor. Some intuitive instinct impelled me to use no haste, make no noise. Gentleness and courtesy, reverence and chivalry were needed here, not coarseness, nor rude strength, nor brutality. I reached the drapery and extended my hand along the substance which it covered. Suddenly the drapery stopped. My hand fell an inch or two, 
and touched a face colder than marble. It was a dead body which that drapery covered, and which lay upon those boards in my room. I had known it the night before. I had looked forward to it confidently, but could not subdue the ague that seized upon my limbs. An icy sweat covered me. I was again overcome with fear and retreated to the mantel. When I lighted the candle I was, of course, alone, and I cursed my cowardice bitterly. A week after I had become familiar with the presence and had grown, horrible as it may seem, to look forward to its coming. Why not? Desolate, abandoned, despairing as I was, it saved me from madness. It brought me warmth and dreamful ease. It was food for my mind, consolation to my heart. If the living had cast me off, the dead had come to comfort me. I passed hour after hour alone with it and grew familiar with it as a companion. It was the body of a young girl. The outlines of the face were smoothly rounded, the features delicate and small, the lids of the eyes were large and full, and the lashes fine and long. The teeth were regular and perfect, and even the tiny ear was a marvel of exquisite form. The hair, I felt, must be of a soft, golden colour. It had not the vigour of black or brown, and passed through my hand like meshes of silk or floss. I could not see it, I could see nothing, but instinct, fancy, who can tell what it was, taught me every line of the form, every colour, every grace of my nightly companion. Oh, how gracious and good was that poor dead girl to me, thus early deprived of life and the gladness of being, she wandered back and brought her sweet spirit to minister to mine. Some divine womanly pity led her to seek out the most wretched creature upon earth to shed light and joy upon his path. At last a divine inspiration seized upon me. Since all her loveliness was mine, why not copy it? I resolved to paint her, to have her for my own forever. Then behold a happy man at last. My dingy garret was transformed into a palace of light. Day after day I lingered at my work, forgetting to eat or drink in my gladness. Day after day the picture grew, until at last I saw her. A sweet, pale face, the soft low brow shadowed with a cloud of golden hair, a delicate, sensitive mouth and rounded chin, the glory of her eyes hidden by the transparent lids, a face and form beautiful as a woman's and holy as an angel's abided upon my easel. The day upon which I finished it I was wild with delight. I waited for the night with feverish eagerness for I wanted to tell my pale, cold girl all that I had done for her. But alas, when night came I sought her, and she was not. My hand wandered in vain for the familiar drapery. It had vanished with its sweet burden for ever. I sought my candle and lighted it with trembling fingers. If she had gone from my picture I must have died with sorrow, but she was there to gladden my eyes and comfort my heart. What if it was the picture of a dead woman with her pall about her? To me she might have been lying asleep upon a couch of velvet in an atmosphere of luxury and perfume. I had painted her as she came to me, all cold and pale, but filling me with warmth and gladness. But I was starving, literally starving. I had not a penny left with which to buy food, and my greedy old landlord was clamouring for his rent. He forced his way into my room one morning, and cast his sacrilegious eyes upon my picture. He was cowardly enough to be afraid of it, 
and put out his hands in an agony of terror. "'Why, you miserable man,' I said, "'are you afraid of a picture?' He staggered out upon the landing. "'Trust me for a little while, Mr. Perret,' I said, "'and I will pay.' He wrung his hands and declared he wanted no money, but begged of me for the love of God to go and leave him in peace. He called heaven to witness he was poor, miserably poor. "'All that you see below is not mine,' he cried piteously. "'They are my customers on the face of a man.' "'Then let me also be a customer,' I said, taking from my pocket a silver watch. "'What will you give me for this?' To my surprise, he wrung his hands together and held them up to me pleadingly. "'What do you want for it?' he whined. "'I am so miserably poor. It is worth nothing. What do you want for it?' "'It's worth ten dollars,' I said, and followed him down into the store. He seemed in a terror of excitement, and after giving me the ten dollars appeared to hesitate about taking the watch. I left him watching me as I went down the street to get my frugal provisions for the week. When I returned, a grim silence prevailed in the house, but I was too much preoccupied to notice it. I had resolved to place my picture in the academy. If you should ask me why, I could not tell, but something determined me to ask for its admittance, and it was received. They even praised it and ticketed it with a number. "'What name?' they asked. "'Ah, oh, I do not know,' I replied. The obliging gentleman looked at it a while, then at me wonderingly. "'Suppose we call it a vision,' said one of them. "'But does not a vision imply something seen?' I asked. "'Well, won't they see your painting?' he replied. At all events, it's a nice fanciful name, and I'm a judge of these things. He seemed in a grandiloquent sort of way, good-natured enough, and I thanked him for his suggestion. Presently I stood before my picture, and found it was called Number 289, A Vision. Beside it was a dreamy landscape, a bit of island scenery, all soft and glowing and beautiful, as befitted some region of the sun. I know not how it was, but I fancied my poor child enjoyed the nearness of that dream of an enchanted island. I left her there, and went back to my old home. The store upon the ground floor was closed, the shutters were up, and as I passed the door of the back room I saw that it was empty. I went through into the store, and that also was empty. All the bundles and tickets were gone, but upon the counter lay my silver watch. I looked upon it in bewilderment. What did it all mean? If the old Frenchman had fled with the goods of his customers, why not take mine also? He had paid me its nominal value. What could be the meaning of this spasmodic honesty? What fearful mystery enveloped every thing in this dreary old house? Why did he shrink from me with terror? And why was he wild with fear at the sight of a picture? I went up to my garret and found the desolation there insupportable. Since the sweet phantom refused to come to me again, since all that remained to me of her rested in that great warm luxurious gallery, since that wretched man had fled, why should I cling to the old habitation? I felt that excitement and semi-starvation had already done enough for my brain, and determined to shake this dust and fantasy from me. I would go out in the clear cold sunshine and labour and hope and live like the human creatures about me. That day I left the house in West Broadway and took a cheap lodging uptown. For, shall I confess it, I was unable to get to work in earnest until I had again with me all that I could have of my friend. Let me once have her picture, the very coinage of my love for her, 
as my daily companion, and I felt that I could do anything. I haunted the academy night and day, waiting anxiously for the time when I could carry away my prize. I parted with a valuable ring and lived frugally again, in poverty, loneliness, almost in despair. For at times a bitter agony assailed me. How insatiable is man! I began to regret that she was dead. I felt a vague yearning when I thought of the sweet, cold face, the still hands. Bitter sobs rose in my throat. I felt my heart bursting within me. She was the only woman I had ever loved, and I did not even know her name. She could not tell me, for she was dead. Without doubt she was dead. I knew I was losing flesh and spirits day by day. I knew that in the old village where I was born no one would recognize the gaunt, shabby, wild-eyed man for the joyous, hopeful youth that only a few years ago seemed filled with the ruddiness of life. I felt at times a desperate longing to rid myself of my reveries and dreams. This strife for gold seemed to me a manly thing then full of vigour and common sense and courage. I envied the waiter at the cheap eating-house, the negro that carried in coal, and going down upon the dock one day I joined a body of men who trundled barrows to and fro a great ship that lay nearby, and shouted and strained my muscles with the rest. All in vain. My physical power was too weak, the tension upon my nerves too strong. All I gained by my day's labour were blistered hands, aching joints, a singular dizziness in my head, and a dollar and fifty cents. When I entered my room that night, I found this note upon my table. Mr. Paul Wade, dear sir, I have learned that your picture in the Academy, number 289, A Vision, is in the possession of the artist. I desire to purchase it. An early reply will much oblige. Yours very truly, Antoine Gervais, Blank Hotel. The idea of parting with my picture for gold was ludicrous enough to make me laugh if I had not forgotten how. I immediately sent this reply. Monsieur Antoine Gervais, dear sir, the picture, number 289, A Vision, is not for sale. Yours truly, Paul Wade. Within an hour I received the following reply. Mr. Paul Wade, dear sir, will you do me the kindness to grant me an early interview at my hotel? I would not ask this favour if my health permitted me the pleasure of calling upon you, as it is of the greatest importance to me to see you soon, I will take the liberty of asking you to come at the hour of four this evening, and shall await your coming with anxiety. Yours very sincerely, Antoine Gervais, Blank Hotel. A lingering respect for the rules of civilization compelled me to comply with this last request, and punctually at four I went to the hotel. I asked for Monsieur Gervais, and was shown into a private parlour. Almost immediately there entered from an adjoining room a tall, thin gentleman, with an air of subdued grief that relieved the otherwise haughty and severe expression of his face. There was something familiar to me in his large brown eyes. He wore a velvet dressing-robe trimmed with fur, for which he apologised, stating that his health was delicate and that he came from a warm climate. "'I am from the island of Martinique,' he said, "'and I hope soon to return, and with your permission take with me your picture.' "'That cannot be,' I replied. "'I will not part with it.' "'Oh, pardon me,' he exclaimed with emotion. "'I must have it. I could not leave it in the possession of another. I cannot part with it, I repeated. Will you pardon me, he said, 
and not deem me impertinent if i ask why because it is dear to me i replied frankly it is i may say necessary to me as as a thing of art he asked yes i answered and as a thing of affection he started and looked at me earnestly will you do me the favour the very great favour to explain what you mean he said no i replied for the simple reason that you would not understand me and would consider me a madman ah oh, sir he said if i could induce you to give me your confidence tell me is is the picture a portrait no yes i said scarcely knowing how to reply it is and yet it is not i assure you sir i added impatiently the original of that picture can be nothing to any one but me to me she is everything oh great heaven he said grasping a cane and leaning heavily upon it you say she who is she what is her name where did you first find her and where is she now let me look upon her in the name of god that would be impossible i said i cannot you cannot he said rising from his seat and approaching me are you then determined that my life shall be the sacrifice to your obstinacy and cruelty since i have seen your picture i have neither tasted food nor slept and you will not in pity answer these few simple questions sir i replied also rising from my seat and confronting him i will do that which you desire of me but i warn you it will only lead you to consider me a madman i do not know who is the original of my picture i do not know her name or her country i found her first in the dead of night in a dark bare gloomy garret lying upon a few boards in the middle of the room and covered with a heavy drapery of some kind it seemed like cloth but i cannot describe it accurately for i could not see it i could only feel she lay quite still and motionless for she was dead the old gentleman trembled and fell back into his chair he looked at me with horror that seemed tempered with pity did i not tell you i said interpreting the expression of his face that you would think me a madman nay he replied gently we are all a little mad is it not so you have a good and noble face and will not i think refuse me your picture when i tell you why i desire it listen i beg of you and you will see that you cannot withhold it from me my name is antoine gervais i live at the island of martinique twenty years ago heaven in giving me a daughter took from me a beloved wife this little one was the only tie that bound me to life we lived together in our beautiful home as the blessed are said to live in paradise but we may not be too happy here lest we find life too sweet to resign it my daughter fell into delicate health and the air of our island was not found beneficial for her in summer we determined to spend the hot months at the north four years ago we embarked for new york the voyage was unusually long and tedious and upon our arrival i was afraid to take my poor Athely to a public hotel a fellow passenger directed me to a quiet place near the landing it was kept by a frenchman and although his appearance was calculated to inspire distrust he was afterward of great service to me although the place was a poor one i was enabled with plenty of money to give my daughter every luxury and care that her health demanded all in vain she grew worse and died monsieur gervaise was silent for a time 
Overcome with emotion, he leaned his head upon his cane. I looked upon him with unspeakable yearning. Tell me, I said, were you enabled to remain with your daughter during her illness? Was she under your immediate care? I never left her for a moment, said Monsieur Gervaise, until, until she left me. Then I became for a time utterly helpless and was confined to my bed, while they prepared my child for her last sad journey, for I took her home with me to Martinique. Her last words, her dying prayer, was to sleep there under her own sunny sky. She rests there now, in a strip of land by the sea that she loved well. But before she was shut away from my sight forever, I was carried to see her, and I swear to you, sir, as she lay there upon her velvet shawl, pure and beautiful as an angel, just so she lies in your picture. The dead girl, created by a fantasy of your brain, is the exact prototype of my daughter Athelie. Will you, then, still refuse to me the portrait of my daughter? No, I said, slowly getting upon my feet and leaving the room. You shall have it. Then I stumbled out into the street. Staggering along like a drunkard or a madman, faint with hunger and excitement, I saw suddenly before me a little mean shrunken figure of a man. His parchment-like skin, his loose thin lips, his long hooked nose loomed upon me like a figure in a magic lantern. He moved like an automaton. I have been waiting for you, he said, clutching my arm with his long bony fingers. If I tell you where you may find her, will you swear not to harm me? That is her father in there. Does he know I took away the body of his daughter? Has he come after me? He knows nothing, Baptiste Perret. But you are the devil, he went on. You put her in a picture. Tell me where I may find her, I demanded. Yes, he said eagerly. What harm did I do? Wasn't it a wicked thing to put away all those jewels? When folks were poor and starving, she was covered with gems, and the shawls were worth fortunes of money. What matters it after one is dead so long as enough ground covered her? I sent the box, and I kept the body. But I buried it afterward decently in a cemetery. I'll tell you where, if you promise not to hurt me. A silence fell upon the library at Martinique. The face of Paul looked so cold and pale in the moonlight that I hastily poured out for him a goblet of wine. He put it aside with his hand. You see, he said calmly, she was stolen by this miserable man for the jewel she wore. Stolen and put away among strangers, while her father took the empty casket to the dear land she loved so well. It was more than she could bear. She came to me for help, and that is all, Antoine. I brought her to her father. He was good enough to call me his son, and beg of me not to leave him. When he died, I placed him by her side, over there where you hear the sea. There is room there for another, only me, and I have it for a certainty that I shall not wait long. That is why I have told you all this, so that you may hold sacred the resting place of the dead. A fortnight later Paul died. Whether by some mysterious agency or that he put it away quietly, I do not know. But when we found him dead upon his bed, the picture had disappeared from over the mantel and could not be found. I confess I was not sorry. End of number 289 A Vision by Mrs. Frank McCarthy Recording by Ruth Golding
The Eight Roads by Ethel M. Gate. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Once upon a time there was a smith called Geoffred, who had his forge by the crossroads, where there is a shrine to three saints. The three saints watch over three roads, but the fourth one leads to the great city where is the cathedral, and, as some say, to heaven itself. And along that road the great saints themselves sometimes walk, therefore it needs no shrine. It happened one night, when Geoffrey had gone to bed and the fire in the furnace smouldered in its bed of ashes, that he heard the sound of a horse's hoofs a long way off and sat up to listen. It was dark as could be and the rain was falling outside. The trees in the forest nearby were moaning and muttering to each other as the wind passed through them, and as every now and then they lapsed into silence, Geoffrey could hear the sound of horses' hoofs getting nearer, and pitied anyone compelled to ride on such a night. "'Perhaps it is someone who has lost his way, and will be glad of a night's lodging,' he said, so he got out of bed and raked the embers of the fire together. A few puffs from the bellows soon had a good blaze going, and the kind fellow bethought himself to prepare some hot drink and set a loaf of bread ready for his unexpected guest. By this time the horse was near enough for him to tell by the sound of its feet that it was heavily burdened. Indeed, it stumbled as though its load was more than it could carry, and he had made up his mind to go out to the help of the rider when he chanced to see a strange light gleam through the crack of the window shutters, and peeping through, was rooted to the ground with fear. All around the cross roads it was pitch dark, but the space where they joined was lighted by a cold blue light. In the circle made by the light was an armed knight on horseback, carrying a small bundle, which seemed almost more than his great strength could hold, and beneath which the horse staggered and trembled. By his side was a beautiful lady. She wore a flowing dress of blue and a gold band around her hair, and her eyes were blue like steel, and the light seemed to stream from them. Her feet barely touched the roadway, and the smith knew she was not mortal. When he could take his gaze from her, he saw that the three saints had left their shrines, and each was guarding his own road. Only the road which led to the great cathedral was free. The lady laid her hand on the horse's bridle, and urged it toward the unguarded road. But the horse swerved violently, and would have trampled on her, had she not lightly moved aside. But she laughed and struck it with her bare hand as it stumbled to its knees, then took it by the bridle once more, and lo, it stood on its feet immediately. The knight looked round at the three saints, guarding the three roads. This is the end, he said. I can go no further. I warned you of this place, said the lady. Here even I can do nothing to help you. Still, make one more effort, else we are trapped. I could not help myself, said the knight. The horse bore me here against my will, and in spite of my burden. And now I will carry that same burden no longer, for it weighs me down, and I am minded to escape with my life. At that the knight dismounted, and Geoffrey was almost blinded by the angry light which streamed from the lady's eyes. However, she made no movement to stop the knight, who advanced and laid his burden at Geoffrey's door. Then it became suddenly dark once more, and Geoffrey heard the sound of horses' hoofs galloping away into the night. When day dawned, and he ventured to unbar the door, he found the three saints had returned to their shrines, and on the threshold, wrapped in a rich cloak, lay a boy-baby, with a band of gold round his wrist, who cried softly to himself, as Geoffrey lifted him up. Next day, Geoffrey trudged into the city, and went from door to door, asking if any had lost a boy baby. But the folk laughed at him, so he went home and brought the boy up as his own son, and taught him the smith's trade. Now the king of the country, which is nearest the rising sun, was a warrior and a great man, and his queen was as beautiful as her lord was mighty. They had one only son, and at his christening there came among the guests a lady, dressed in a long blue robe, with a band of gold about her head, 
and whose feet barely touched the ground. When he saw her, the king turned pale, for he had met her in the forest many years before, and she had offered him magic gifts if he would make her his queen. But he knew she was evil, and meant to make him her thrall, so he refused and escaped, for she had no power over those who refused her gifts. So she stood by the cradle of the baby prince, and looked at the king. "'You refused my gifts once,' she said. "'Now I shall bestow them on your son, who cannot say no.' "'After me, if you please,' said a voice, and a holy palmer stepped out of the crowd. He had a piece of palm, which showed he had been to the holy land, and no one ventured to speak before him. "'I also have a gift for the prince,' he said, and he bound a strip of gold on which were the names of three saints round the baby's wrist, and said, "'This hand can touch nothing evil.' At that there was a clap of thunder, and it turned quite dark, but the next instant the sun shone again, and they all saw the palmer standing by the cradle with the little prince unharmed, and the strange lady had vanished. But when they would have loaded the holy man with gifts, he refused all, and asked only for a cup of wine and some bread, which, being brought, he drank the wine and put the bread in his crib, and so departed in a plain and holy manner. Several nights later, the royal nurse had a terrible dream. She dreamed that the chamber was suddenly filled with a strange light, by which she saw the lady who had come to the christening standing by the baby's cradle. With her was a knight, who, at a sign from her, lifted the baby prince in his arms and passed out of the chamber. Immediately the light vanished, and the nurse heard a horse gallop out of the courtyard below, as though heavily laden. The sound woke her, and snatching up a lamp, she rushed to the cradle, only to see a baby head peacefully sleeping among the pillows, so she said it was all a dream. But in the morning she found that the band of gold with the names of the three saints had vanished completely. There was a great search made throughout the palace, and a reward was offered for the return of the gold and the head of the thief, but neither was forthcoming, so in course of time the matter was forgotten by all except the king and queen. For as their son grew up, they noticed that he was not as other princes, and indeed his mother often rubbed her eyes and wondered how she came to have such a son. He took no pleasure in the games and sports of the sons of the nobles, and was often churlish with the ladies-in-waiting. As he grew up, he evinced a moody disposition, and took no trouble to acquire the accomplishments of a knight, but preferred to spend long hours with pen and parchment, solving problems which none but he could understand, and making strange signs and calculations as to the movements of the stars. He disappointed his father, who hoped he might be a statesman, since he was not a warrior, by showing a cunning and a craftiness which the old king considered beneath anybody of the royal blood, while his mother spent long hours in prayer for a son who grew stranger and more freakish as the days passed by. At last his father tired of his behavior, and called him to his presence. "'It is time,' he said, "'that you settled down and bore your part as a prince, and the future ruler of this kingdom.' We are disposed to overlook the follies of your youth, if you now pay due attention to our wishes. We have arranged a marriage for you with the daughter of the king of the forest lands, and it is our wish that you now proceed to the borders of your father's dominions, and escort her here with due magnificence. To everybody's contentment, the prince made no objection, but entered into the preparations for his departure, as though he really wished to please his father, and in due time set out to fetch his bride, carrying the old king's blessing. Now the daughter of the king of the forest lands was a princess of great beauty and gentleness of spirit. Nevertheless, when she saw the prince to whom she was to be betrothed, she wept bitterly and for many days would not consent. However, seeing to what grief and consternation she had reduced her parents, she reminded herself of all the princely precepts in which she had been brought up, and summoning all her resolution to her aid, craved her father's blessing, and set out on her long journey to the prince's country, where she was to be married. She had a golden coach with six white horses to ride in, and a noble company of knights with a prince at their head to guard her from harm. Nevertheless, she was ill at ease, and the more so, because they did not seem to be travelling by the usual roads, but to be following one which the horses took of their own accord. She saw that the prince seemed uneasy about their direction, 
but the coachman paid no attention to him and gave all his mind to keeping control over the six white horses who appeared to be striving with all their might to reach some unknown destination at last they reached a broad high road and presently passed through a city where stood a great cathedral the horses never slackened pace but swept on to the high road again and the city was soon left in the distance behind them and at dusk they reached the crossroads where there is a shrine to three saints and there one of the horses cast a shoe and the coach came to a standstill now what is to be done cried the prince what possessed you fellow to bring us all here i could not help it said the coachman the horses brought me here against my will but since we are here we had better see if the folk in this cottage can tell us where to find a smith so he gave the reins to an equerry and went and knocked at the cottage door it was opened by a young man with a band of gold round his wrist for he was indeed the lad whom Geoffrey had adopted grown up and come to manhood i am a smith said he and i will do what is wanted i should have come sooner but i stayed to blow up the fire first as he came out into the roadway they saw that he was very handsome and the princess thought he was the most noble-looking man she had ever seen he in his turn had never thought to see anything so beautiful in the world as the princess and completely lost his heart to her however he remembered she was a royal lady and he was only a smith so he said nothing and busied himself with his work joffred himself now quite old came to the door and begged the princess to rest and warm herself in his cottage which she did sitting where she could watch the young smith at his work the firelight gleaming on the band of gold round his wrist as he hammered out the new shoe for the horse when all was done and they were ready to set out the princess took a bracelet from her arm and gave it to him in payment and so departed the horses went quite tractably after this and suffered the coachman to drive them as usual and by nightfall they had reached the place in the forest where eight roads met here the prince ordered a halt and though one of the knights ventured to protest that the place had the look of enchanted ground he would not go on but ordered them to pitch their encampment they were in the middle of a great forest and the spot where they were was a great grassy circle hemmed in by the tall trees and without a bush or flower on its surface four roads from north south east and west met in this circle and between these four came four other smaller roads to the same spot but all were dark with trees meeting overhead like enchanted ales and all were carpeted with moss which gave no sound to hoof or footfall the princess could not sleep in her silken tent and looking out she saw that the nobles had all withdrawn outside the circle and were camping in the dark ales and there was no one but herself and the prince in his purple tent within the green space at midnight she suddenly became aware of a bright light shining through the door of her tent and starting up she saw that the third person had entered the circle from whom the strange light seemed to stream it was a lady in a long blue robe with a band of gold round her head and whose feet barely touched the ground as the princess peeped from her tent she saw the prince raise the purple flap and come from his own to meet the strange lady you wanted me said the strange lady else i could not have set foot on this sword true i wanted you said the prince but even now i don't know what you can do for me still you have taught me so many things that perhaps you can tell me what has gone wrong to-day and why we found ourselves at those crossroads i am your mother said the lady and i can do a great many things for you i am the son of the king and queen of the country of the rising sun said the prince you are my son said the lady a knight who was my thrall stole away the king's son from his cradle and put you in his place because i hate the king and i designed that when you were grown up you should take the kingdom from him and you and i should rule it together how can this be said the prince have i taught you magic for nothing said the lady the smith with a gold band round his wrist who shod your horse to-day is the true heir take your bride to your kingdom and make all safe there then come back and slay this smith and we shall be secure why have you not slain him yourself said the prince because i have no power over him he also has refused my gifts because he may touch nothing evil then suddenly the light vanished and the princess knew that the lady had gone 
she heard the grass rustle as the prince found his way back to his tent but as soon as she dared to move she dressed hastily found her beautiful golden shoes and wrapping herself in her long mantle stole out of the tent and away into the forest in the hope of finding her way back to the crossroads where the young smith dwelt and was soon completely lost when her loss was discovered in the morning there was a great commotion and all the company were for searching the forest in every direction but the false prince would not hear of it and bade them follow him to his father's court without delay and since none durst disobey him they were fain to do as he ordered though with an ill grace but when he appeared at court without the princess the old king's rage knew no bounds are you my son he cried a scorner of ladies and a recreant knight a forsaker of helpless maidens and a coward prince begone enter my presence no more retrieve your fallen fame or retire to ignominious seclusion i shall do neither replied the false prince for the lady i care nothing nor for you i am no son of yours and as for your kingdom it is mine and my mother's away and he stamped his foot thrice, and on the instant the palace with the king and queen and all the courtiers sank into the ground, and he alone was left. After that none dared oppose him, and he easily made himself master of the kingdom. Now the young smith who dwelt by the crossroads could not forget the beautiful princess. All that night after she passed by he lay awake thinking of her, and as day dawned a terrible feeling possessed him that she was in danger, and he felt that, poor and humble as he was, he must go and seek her, wherever she might be. When he told Geoffrey of his resolve, the old man made no objection. I have always known, he said, that one day you must go and seek your fortune. You were not meant to be a smith. And then he told him of how a strange knight had brought him to the door. As you have grown, he said, the band of gold round your wrist has enlarged, and that is your talisman, which you must never part with. Before you go, pay your vows to the three saints in the shrine, for they are your patrons, and their names are on your wrist. So he did as Geoffrey bade him, and started out, but before he went, Geoffrey gave him a sword. Take this with you, he said, but do not wear it till you are a knight. It is a knight's sword. So he departed. Now he had not gone far before he met a holy palmer. He was an old man, and limped sorely and he seemed very faint. Young man, he said, help me or I die. Now the young smith was eager only to find the princess, and save her from the peril which he felt threatened her. Nevertheless, when he saw the plight of the old man, he turned back and began to assist him slowly along the road he had just come. And when after a long while they came in sight of the shrine at the crossroads, he noticed that the niche of one of the saints was empty. However, he could not stop to think of that, for the holy palmer suddenly sank down in a swoon, and the young smith lifted him in his arms and carried him the rest of the way. Outside the cottage he laid him down, and fetched bread and a little wine, and the old man revived. Who, when he had eaten, said, This is your reward. Go now through the forest to the place where eight roads meet, and at midnight call upon all the fairy folk and kindred, and any one of them must give you whatever you choose to ask, but take no gifts which they offer. At this point the sun dazzled the young man's eyes, and when he looked again the holy palmer had vanished, and the third saint was sitting in his niche once more. So he knew he had met his patron saint. So he started once more, and went straight through the forest to the place where eight roads meet, meaning to ask the fairy folk for the safety of the princess. But when he reached the green circle, he found the princess herself, alone and weeping. But when she saw him, she gave a cry of joy. "'Oh, prince!' she cried. "'Take me away from this place, and save yourself from that false prince who seeks your life.' "'I am no prince,' he said. "'I am a poor smith who dares to seek your deliverance.' "'You are a true prince,' she said, "'and I will take you for my knight.' and she told him the story of his birth and the strange lady who had stolen him away, and geared his sword upon him. Then he swore to be her true and faithful knight, and she promised to stay while he summoned the fairy folk out of the forest. For I am afraid no longer, she said, and I will follow you to your palace or the forge at the crossroads. 
and at midnight he stood in the centre of the green circle and called upon all the fairy folk and kindred and they came stealing through the forest at his call and stood upon the edge of the circle swaying this way and that in the moonlight as they waited upon all the eight green roads they came from north south east and west silently their feet scarcely touching the green moss and waited for him to speak and among them he saw the false king and a lady all in blue with a gold band round her head these two he beckoned into the circle and they came but no other fairy food was set upon its grass they had gifts in their hands which they offered him but he put them by then they offered him his kingdom and he said what of my father and mother then they said you can only have one wish will you have your father and your mother and he said i will have neither without the other give me my birthright and at that they saw they were outwitted and they said it is yours and the fairy folk melted silently away and the forest vanished and it became pitch dark when day at length dawned they found themselves standing in the courtyard of a noble palace and entering in beheld the old king and queen sitting on the throne i am your son said the prince i pray you receive this lady as your daughter it is indeed our son said the queen see the gold band on his wrist so there were many rejoicings and the prince and princess were married with great magnificence and lived happily ever after as for geoffrey he lived at the crossroads in great happiness till he was very old every year the prince and princess came to visit him and he was godfather to all their children and on his hundredth birthday a holy palmer called for him and he went away with him down the road which leads to the great cathedral and as some say to heaven itself and was never seen any more End of the Eight Roads by Ethel M. Gate When Hanna, Var Eight Yar Old by Catherine Peabody Girling. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org were you a little girl hannah when you came to america i asked no she replied letting her sewing fall in her lap as her grave eyes sought mine slowly i var a big girl eight year old eight years old how big you must have been can you tell me about it why you came the recent accounts of people driven to america by tragedy or drawn by a larger hope of finding a life to live in addition to earning a living had colored my thoughts for days have all immigrants the willless leaden people who pass in droves through our railway stations the patient indifferent toilers by the roadside the maids who cook and mend for us the girl who sits sewing with me to-day a memory and a vision is each of them in some degree a mary anton so i closed the magazine and asked her a big girl eight year old she said oh well hannah explained in old country if you are eight year old and comes younger children in the family you are old woman you gotta be or who shall help de mother yes did your father and mother bring you i continued probing for the story no father and mother were dead my aunt my father's brother's wife she came for us it cost her twenty-eight dollar but she do it but surely you can't go to sweden and return for twenty-eight dollars seventeen year ago yes but of course you must take your own providings it don't require much hannah's shoulders drew together expressively madam knows she is apt to miss her appetite at sea but too well i shrugged sympathetically then we both laughed i can to tell you how it is i came on america but hannah waited for words to express her warning it will make you a sharp sadness please i don't know if i can tell it to you good but i tell it so good as i can my father he was swedish fisherman but on his boat 
and go away by weeks and weeks, and sometimes comes strong weather, and he can't make it to get home quick. My mother, she were German. Hannah hesitated, and then in lowered tones of soft apology added, She were a very pretty woman. Var three children, more as me. Olga var five-year-old, and Hilda three, and Jens, well, Jens var just a baby, suppose yar and half. We live in a little house close on by the sea. It is just a little house, but it can to have a shed with a floor of stone. The door of the shed is broken, so it is like a window mid out glass. The house is close on by a big dock, where in summer time comes a big excursion steamer, mit, suppose, hundred tourist people, who climb on the mountain up the road. My mother, she sell them hot coffee, also bread and cheese. But that is not the reason why we live in the little so lonesome house. It is the big dock, is the reason. My father, he can to come home from late fishings, without needing that he shall walk on the roads. In Sweden, in winter, the roads swallow snow till it makes danger some to you to walk, because hides holes to step in. We live there all summer, but in late autumn, my father, he say, what about the winter? My mother, she say, I don't know, but anyway, we try at once. Then my father, he go away in his boat, and my mother, she get bad cold, and comes sickness on her. And then she couldn't to keep care on us, by reason she is too weak. She lay on the cot in the kitchen room, and watch on me, that I shall learn to keep care on the children. But what did you live on? How did you keep warm? Oh, is plenty fuel, and we make hot stew of dried meat, mit rice and raisins. One day, my mother, she say to me, Hannah, she say, you'll be in a big girl. I must to tell you some things. Your father is very late, it seems, and winter comes now. I cannot to wait much more. It is soon I got to go. You mustn't take a fear of me if I come all white like the snow and don't talk me you any more. The little children, they will take a fear and cry. I cannot to bring a fear on my little children. So see, tell me what I shall do. I shall close both her eyes up and tie her hands together and lock the shed door. The shed door? Yeah. Hannah had resumed her sewing. Her thread fairly snapped, as stitch fell by even stitch with a monotonous rhythm. In quiet, uneventful tones, she continued. So one night, pretty soon, she make that I shall bring her best nightgown and help her mit to put it on. Then she kissed the little children in their sleepings, and she sit on a stool by the fire and say, I shall put Jens in her arms. She try to rock back and forth, and she sing on him a little hymn. But she's too weak, and I must take him. Then she put on me a shawl, and tie it behind under my arms, and she lean heavy on me, and we go out into the shed. My mother, she do her bare feet on the stone floor. She have just but her nightgown on but it is her best one, with crocheted lace at the neck and wrists. She tell me I shall put the ironing board across the two chair seats, but it is too heavy, and she shall try to help me, but comes coughing on her, and she must to hold on by the shed door. She look out across the road, and the mountains all mit snow white and mit moonlight cold and blood is on her lips, but she wipe it away mit a snow bunch. Well, anyway, we do the ironing board across the chair seats, and I spread a white sheet and put a head cushion, and my mother lie down, and I cover her mit a more other sheet over. Oh, mother, I say, let me make some warm coverings on you. No, she say, so soft that I listen mit my ear. I must to come here, while I yet have the strength. But I want to go quick away, and in the cold, 
I go more quick. Oh, Hannah, she say, my big daughter, you are so comfortable to me. So I hold my mother's hand. Pretty soon it comes cold. I clap it mit mine, but it comes more cold. I crumple it up and breathe my hot breath in it, but it comes not warm any more. So mit my father's Sunday handkerchief I bind her eyes, like if you play blind man mit the children and mit an apron string I tie her hands together. Then I go back and make my hands warm in the kitchen room, and I take the comb down off the string, and I go back to my mother, and make her hair in two braids, like as I did all when she was sick. My mother, she hath very strong hair. It is down by her knees on, and so yellow, so yellow as a, a copper tea kettle. It could to have been red, but it just are not. Then I lock the shed door and crawl in bed mit the children to make me warm. Next day I tell the children that mother is gone away. They cry some, but pretty soon they shut up. Anyway, it is so long she have lain on the cot in the kitchen room that they don't have to miss her. So I keep care on the children and play with them, and some days go by. Comes stronger weather, mit storms of sleet and snow, and the wind sob and cry. Comes nobody on. At night, when the children are sleeping, I unlock the shed door and go to see if it makes all right, mit my mother. Sometimes it is by the moonlight I see on her, but more often it is by a candle glimmer. Hannah broke the subdued tone of her narrative to add, in a lower, more confiding note, It is mit me now that when I see a candle on light I have a sharp sadness. Pretty soon the weather is more better, and comes a man, trampling through the snow, to tell my mother that her husband can't come home just yet. He is drowned in the sea. When he see how it is mid my mother and mid me and the little children, the water stands in his eyes, ya, yeah. and he go on through the snow, three, four mile nearer on the city, to the big castle where lived the lady what own all the land. And see come in, sleigh, mit four horsen and big robes of fur and yingling bells. See see on my mother, and see go quick away, but so soon as it can see come again, and she do on my mother a white robe, heavy mit lace, most beautiful, and white stockings of silk, and white slippers, broidered mit pearlin. She leaf my mother's hair as I fixed it, in two braids, but she put a wreath of flowers, white and green, just like the real ones. Is few real flowers in Sweden in winter. Anyway, these were like the flowers a girl what gets married should to wear. Then my lady, she send her sleigh, that all the people should come and see on the so brave woman, but couldn't to bring a fear on her little children. And the people, they make admiration on my mother. They say it is the prettiest they ever see it, and they make pity that she couldn't to see it herself. She paused and breathed deeply. <sighs> I wish she could have seen those slippers. And did no one tell you that you were a wonderful little girl? Oh, well, I've our eight-year-old. But what became of you all? My lady took us home in her sleigh, mit. I want to stay mit my mother, but she say I shall come to keep care on the children, that they don't cry. And they don't cry. And they laugh mit the yingling bells. The need was on me strong, but I don't cry before my lady. She were a great dame, but go into court mit the queen. She sent men, and they do my mother in a coffin, and carry her to a little chapel house in cemetery, and in the spring, when the snow is gone, they bury her. My lady, she put a white stone mid my mother's name, and some poetry. I can't to say it good in English, but it says, The strength in the heart of her poor is the hope of Sweden. And then did your aunt come? Yeah, my lady, she wrote on my father's brother, but var in America. She say we can to stay mit her, 
but my uncle he send his wife, and we come back mit her on America, and dat is all how I came to be here. End of When Hana Var Eight Yar Old by Catherine Peabody Gerling Read by Maria Casper Sonnet number eight by William Shakespeare. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Music to hear, why hearest thou music sadly? Sweets with sweets war not, joy delights in joy. Why lovest thou that which thou receivest not gladly, or else receivest with pleasure thine annoy? If the true concord of well-tuned sounds by unions married do offend thine ear, they do but sweetly chide thee, who confounds in singleness the parts that thou shouldst bear. Mark how one string, sweet husband, to another, strikes each in each by mutual ordering, resembling sire and child and happy mother, who all in one one pleasing note do sing, whose speechless song, being many, seeming one, sings this to thee, thou single wilt prove none. End of sonnet number eight by William Shakespeare, read by Gemma Blath. Eight Years in a British Consulate by Zabina Eastman This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eight Years in a British Consulate from 1861 to 1869 by Zabina Eastman, formerly U.S. Consul at Bristol, England, Chicago, 1919. Forward. This paper, now for the first time, is reduced to print by the son of the writer, who is moved by the thought that at present the analysis of British character will tend to a clearer understanding of the people by their American cousins. It is also of much interest as explaining the attitude of England to the United States during the Civil War. Biographical Sketch Zabina Eastman came to Chicago to live in the year 1842. He came with his bride and started his work, to which he had dedicated his life while a youth, the cause of abolishing slavery in the United States. Brought up on a farm near North Amherst, Massachusetts, an orphan while quite young, his early school reading impressed him with admiration for the Constitution of the United States, but accompanied with the painful thought that slavery in this republic was horribly inconsistent with the professions of liberty and a blemish on our national escutcheon. He early concluded that in no other way could he be of greater use to mankind than to do all in his power to extirpate that national curse. He went into journalism. At nineteen he had a small newspaper in Vermont. He speedily, after receiving his small patrimony from his guardian, lost it in newspaper ventures. About 1839 he came west to enter the employment of Benjamin Lundy, who was, as the representative of a small body of anti-slavery men, issuing a newspaper, The Genius of Universal Emancipation, in the town of Lowell, Illinois. Lundy, dying soon after, young Eastman won the regard of the society by an eloquent editorial tribute to his lost leader, and was elected to fill his place, and continued the publication. The small number of its subscribers did not justify its continuance in that place, and the city of Chicago was coming to attract attention. So he went east to claim his bride in Burlington, Vermont, and came back to Chicago to start the Western Citizen, the name of which was changed in 1853 to the Free West. It continued till the cause of anti-slavery was merged in the new Republican Party, 
and in 1856 he turned his subscription list over to the newly formed Chicago Tribune, and for a few years engaged in the lumber business, till the election of Lincoln and his appointment by the latter to the position of consul at Bristol, England. It was reported to him that Lincoln remarked to a bystander, while he was signing the commission to the position, that no appointment he had made gave him so much pleasure as that of Eastman. The following paper was a lecture he gave about the year 1872 in Elgin, where he resided for a few years after his return from England in the year 1869. The Chicago Historical Society has in its archives the files of his paper, a copy of the Chicago Magazine for the year 1857 edited by him, a memorial sketch delivered by Hon. Elihu B. Washburn at a meeting here in 1883, and a biographical pamphlet written by his son in 1886. He wrote a great deal on a variety of topics, many of them relating to early Chicago, published in the local papers. Eight Years in a British Consulate it was at the close of the year 1861 that I left my country for my country's good. It was in the first year of the War of the Rebellion, and the gloomy period of our national life. Traitors, both at home and abroad, in North as well as South, were endeavoring to popularize the disruption of the Republic. Treason was striving to appear the highest order of patriotism. As this was sentimentally and morally a gloomy period, so also was it the gloomy period of the natural year, the time the poet styles the melancholy days, clouds cast over the horizon. I departed from these shores with darkness upon the land, and plunged out upon the sea, cold with fog and sleet, neither sun in the heavens above, or light or warmth below, and this was the result of a long and boisterous voyage. Had I the time, I would like to impress upon my audience the sensations that myself and family felt on first approaching land on a foreign shore, a land covered with perpetual fogs, first getting a glimpse of the Welsh coast covered with snow, all cold and chilly on sea and land. Is such the symbol of the heart and sympathy of the people with whom I am to take up my abode? Gladly would I take you through the city of Liverpool, point out to you the dark and smoky shore of Birkenhead across the Mersey, where the tall chimneys and begrimed walls of the ironworks and coal-yards look as if they were the barriers of the infernal world, and tell you that there the lairds have their works that built the Alabama, and note the greasy blackened tone and condition of the streets and buildings and the very atmosphere. And remember, not often is there in the canopy above a sun to be seen, and no sky. Now go with me through the interior of the country on the railroad, a day's journey to the south, through that marvelous land of industry where all is a garden or a workshop. Go with me into another city that dates back to the days of the Romans, where everything is still more old and strange to a Yankee, where there are streets so narrow that two teams cannot pass, where the buildings overhang the paving so that neighbors can shake hands across the way. Hear the everlasting rumble of street carts over the strong paving, and still enveloped in fog, and the sun not yet seen in the land, and feel that is to be your home for years. Such pictures I might draw to you, all in the background of gloom, but I have other work before me. I wish to occupy your thought on this occasion in the delineation of the state of feeling in the time of the War of the Rebellion, and give you some idea of what the people thought of us and the doings in this land during that time. Such was the moral condition of my first entry into real life there. It seemed as if the fog and chill had gone into everything, into the heads and hearts of the people. Pass over all this, and go with me to that old city, on a chilly morning in December, with the fog so thick that one could feel it, and that he could never get out of it, and blundering through the narrow streets, to find the place where I ought to belong. I finally came out upon a broad green square, 
surrounded by venerable elm trees. Just then a light breeze tore a rift in the clouds and rolled them suddenly over the Bristol Channel, and the sun burst out clear, the first time I had seen it for some days previous to leaving my native land. It was not like the sparkling brilliancy of our western country, but clear and icy, like a great opal in the sky. Then, almost at the same instant, I first saw, flying from the top of its staff, on the opposite side of the square, the flag of the United States covering the consulate. Welcome sight to the wanderer from home, the patriot in a foreign land, the sun in the heavens that warms his home, and his kin, and the land that has given him birth, and the flag that is a symbol of his country, that protects him wherever he roams. I passed in reverently under the flag, flying its best at the top of the staff. I stood under its protection within the consulate of the United States, its prospective chief. I announced my name to a clerk at the desk, who looked up with suppressed surprise, yet with a knowing recognition, putting on some extra touches of importance. They had seen my name in the newspapers some time before as the coming successor. He informed me that I had been expected for some time. Men with the salt water cut about them sat loafing by the open coal grate, lifted up their heads with an inquiring look, taking their first survey of one with whom they would soon have to take counsel and some direction. These were the captains, whose ships and legal relations pass under the jurisdiction of the consul while in port. I was ushered into the interior, to the august presence of the consul, in fact, as the incoming one. He received me with dignified formality. Being a tall, stately man, who had seen much of the world, he was at ease and prepared for an imperial interview. He evidently wanted to impress me with his importance. Should I ever become such as he? I had never before looked upon a consul. This man had been appointed by Buchanan, had held office in some form from Jackson downwards, far down. He also bore the title of Colonel. Now I had no title, never yet held office, never had sought for one, in all the ways and airs of an office holder, was green. And I had been appointed by Lincoln, a man then in the estimation of such without prestige, and invited a sneer from that school and who promised a demoralizing administration initiated in the overthrow of the Democratic Party. After some preliminary skirmishing on general politics, against which I did not care to put in a dissent, and at the great degeneracy which had fallen upon the official character of the country, and the impossibility of the black Republican Party being able to run the machine, as he styled it, he condescendingly volunteered to me considerable useful information and advice. In the first place I had an edifying dissertation on the character of John Bull, their out-of-date style of doing business, their contemptible philanthropy and sympathy for the niggers. Upon these thrilling topics he fulminated with great dignity. He rose from his seat, and planting himself in front of the fire, his back to the mantel, and spreading his coat-tails like a pair of shears, to the exhilarating effects of the warmth in the rear, uttered great swelling words of ponderous wisdom, interpolated with greater oaths, several sometimes in a single sentence, and at the very climax threateningly raised his hand above his head, and swore a terrible oath he had ever been true to that flag, letting his hand quiver with tragic effect, ever true to that flag that floats above us, and shall ever remain so. But he had no sympathy, or part, or lot, with the damned abolitionists. He would settle the trouble by hanging fifty on each side, of northern abolitionists and southern agitators. Thus being relieved of his surplus patriotism, he placed his cigar, which had remained smouldering on the mantel, in his mouth, and puffed vigorously away till he brought new life to its faded end, and elevating it to its proper altitude, he puffed out sweet clouds of incense, and sent them rolling to the ceiling, alternately knocking off the white ash, as at intervals he proceeded in oracular demonstrations. They were to the effect that the captains should be made to feel their social inferiority to the consul, 
the philanthropists kept at a distance tramps beggars and sailors with their yarns of bad usage sent about their business and if they don't move pretty quick said the valorous consul i make them feel the toe of my boot suiting the action to the word with appropriate direction of the foot bravo grandissimo presto marvellous anything are these the qualifications for this office am i worthy to be the successor of such a predecessor must i smoke in this artistic style must i play the tableau of the kangaroo before the fireplace must i set my plain speech with all the grand utterances of the ancients with their gods did mr lincoln when he sent me here suppose i had these duties to perform and special qualifications therefore i began to realize my incapacity remembering the summary of all was in the toe of the boot i instinctively let fall a glance to the floor as one does abashed and gathered some confidence for fortunately as a protection on shipboard i had procured me a heavy pair of connecticut pegged boots are boots or brains to run this consulate if boots then am i sufficiently armed and equipped i am not found lacking let this be a matter for the consideration of your civil service commission that all candidates for consulates be examined on the qualifications of boots as for other qualifications i will not swear i cannot smoke i never enjoy the comforts of a fire in a particular style unless i am alone in the matter of kicking i have had but little practice since i left the cradle but that art can easily be acquired with a proper pair of boots i think i will try the consulate using what little brains i have before resorting to other expedients the interview closed with my predecessor producing from the consular safe my executor from the queen and agreeing upon a certain day when his accounts should be adjusted he would turn over to me the office its archives flag and flag staff etc which was done i became a full-fledged consul the duties of a consul are rather multifarious he is a commercial officer not a diplomatic an agent of the government through whom international business of both peoples partaking of a legal character may be performed in seaports his duties mainly pertain to the shipping he administers the marine laws he is to the captain a lawyer justice judge and jury and constable that is to say he advises judges and executes the law he is a notary also taking acknowledgments administering oaths executing legal papers and certifies to the legality of other papers and bridges over acts of legality between his own and the foreign country to which he is sent he is universal counsellor for all parties his office is a general intelligence depot any countrymen of his or of the country to which he is stationed come to him for all sorts of information and for help in all kinds of trouble i think of no kind of knowledge or information that would not be useful to a consul the people with whom he resides sometimes imagine he knows everything can do almost anything the people who are taught to reverence authority pay great reverence to a consul he sees every variety and phase of human life the experience in a consulate is a perpetual novel there is romance in it there are scenes of stern reality some things rich in humor and other times incidents of tragic effect to someone in connection with his duties he as one of the most common of his services is solicited to recover or hunt up lost estates it is marvelous how many people there are on both sides of the water who think they are greatly beholden to some ancestor of a far past generation in making them heirs to vast estates and then tangling them up in the web of time soon after my arrival in bristol i was invited and received a platform ticket to attend a lecture by my former acquaintance of the peace congress henry richards of the london peace society on disarmament of nations i made a remark at the close of the lecture that it was a good lecture and might now be well applied in getting our rebels to disarm at that he seemed much offended as if i had personally insulted him 
whereas I meant no such thing, but rather to give point to his argument, some might think that looked like a joke, but I never joke on solemn subjects, for Richards was a solemn one. He was then editor of the Peace Herald. I watched his course, and frequently met him for some years, and I never knew him to say anything against the slaveholders fighting, though war was pictured by him as an awful crime, legitimate war, and before the rebellion slavery a great crime also, but seemed of a sudden to lose that character. I had a curt way of stating the case for these men, who for holy principle withdrew their sympathy from us, that all war is sinful except war in defense of slavery or in rebellion. John Bull doesn't show much warmth yet, just after this came the deluge of the Trent. There was awful indignation, you may believe, with the John Bulls. They tore around as if they were already in our china shop. I felt as if I were the only one in a minority on that question. Yet I believed then and now that it was wrong and an unfortunate affair for us. The streets were placarded with patriotism. Buses ran with inscriptions, self-defense. It was very much in England as it was in the north when the rebels fired on Fort Sumter. Wilkes had fired the English heart. In those days I attended a parlor meeting of the philanthropists to hear a paper read by Mrs. Fison on the sanitary condition of the poor. Most of those gathered probably knew who the Yankee was, though I was introduced to but few. A very gentlemanly man sat by my side and made some remarks about the state of feeling on the Trent, after introducing himself. A year afterwards he spoke of the interview, and told my response in regard to the Trent imbroglio, which I remembered not. It was this. It does not seem like my being in an enemy's country. This seemed to go right to a tender spot near an Englishman's heart. Yet I told him the truth, notwithstanding the indignant outcry. They talked about giving us a sound whipping, to make us mind our manners, as a mother whips her child, but the talk was not like the talk of an enemy, or as they would have talked had France or Russia been the aggressor. That man was my true and even intimate friend all the time I was in England. After the great Chicago fire, three years after I had come away, his love for our country continued so that he was the first to head the list, and worked up the contribution which resulted in a gift of eleven thousand dollars to our stricken city. Now I call that a pretty fair investment, of a few civil, not to say kind words. As a coincidence, the sentence I had used had eleven words in it, just a thousand dollars for a word. In these days of exterior sadness, as well as gloom, before the season of the fog lifting had come, when it was drizzle, drizzle almost every day, so that in fact when corrected in my statement that it rained every day in England by a good Quaker, it was proved that there were fourteen days in three months in which it had not rained in any part of the day. I accepted the correction. I found there was a warm place near John Bull's heart, as with other people, and cheerfulness seemed to be gathering, and this I found without the least compromising my place as a thorough American who stood up for his country. About this time, the Trent turmoil, a sensible man from London, the late John Cassell of the great publishing firm, came up to Bristol to speak for peace and to stem the tide of the unreasoning populace, those who felt John Bull had been hit in a sore place. He told them plainly they might depend upon justice from our country, that they might have faith in Lincoln, that the war was for slavery, and was resisted by an anti-slavery government. Alluding to Garibaldi, whom they had recently honored as one of the greatest men on earth, he said he might of himself make one exception to his own countrymen. That was Cromwell. Slight cheers. He would certainly make one other exception as the greatest man that ever lived, and that was George Washington, the father of the United States. At this name the hall was rent with the cheers of the large audience, and such a cheer as I never heard to the name of Washington in our own country. Washington's name is revered there, as here, as if he had not been the great rebel against their government. John Bull began to appear in some of his varied characters. He is a queer animal. 
cold, stiff, and stubborn, arrogant and distorted, expresses his opinion unreservedly, without delicacy. He is a lion in his war, can act the part of a lion when necessary, yet at times or in spots is as gentle as a lamb. He is a wise man who can fully comprehend John Bull. I do not pretend to be that wise man. Some of the incidents of consular life will entertain while they show the characteristics of the people. I had been but a week or two in office when a man, very lean, smooth-faced, mild, and slow of speech, came to my office to make known the case of a destitute seaman who had left one of our ships and was now lodging in a low sailor's boarding-house. I told him I would do what justice required and the law allowed. I finally put the sailor upon relief. Then the sailor's friend took quite an interest in the way I was about to discharge consular duties studied an old consular manual, searched the records of the office, and took special interest in a certain extended protest made before I was in the office. He wanted a copy. I told him he could have one by paying for it. The paying took him quite aback. It finally came out that he was getting up a claim for salvage against a ship then in port, which had suffered much damage in the channel, and afterwards got into port, and was then repairing and that the sailor, whom I had just fed, was the assumed claimant, and had been kept for the purpose, that himself and a shipbroker as principal were working up the case, all for the benefit of this poor sailor. What disinterested benevolence! Of course my services were somewhat necessary in the process. Just then I knew little about salvage, but I volunteered what I thought was a common-sense statement of the case no person engaged under pay of the ship can claim salvage for saving her this man had impressed me or attempted to as a philanthropist i remember how at our first interview i scrutinized him contemplating the noble character he was about to manifest endeavouring to recall his portrait which must have been in dickens but i could fix upon no name that just fitted him now it became necessary for me to refuse several things they wanted me to do to enable them to carry out their intent on the ship. I could see nothing in it but blackmail, or an attempt to put the ship to some expense which it might buy off. But I said nothing to the captain. Soon I found that a formal complaint had been made to Mr. Adams, the minister at London, for my maladministration of office. Mr. Adams seemed to side to their view of things. In the meantime, I had found out some things about the customers who wanted to trade on me. The philanthropist was an adventurer, always playing second fiddle to somebody else's villainy, and without visible means of support. We will, for shortness, call him Uriah Heep, whom he resembled mostly for humility. The other in principle was a shipbroker, who had broken himself while engaged in breaking others. One of his late cases was to environ a Swedish vessel, and to entangle the ship, and so bewilder the master in trouble, that in despair he cut his throat. In my response to Mr. Adams, I gave him the character of the man, said the principal was like Micawber waiting for something to turn up, without Micawber's honesty, but wickedly bent on making something turn up, and if there was any throat-cutting to be done, it was not my throat that was to be cut. The ship sailed, and no libel was laid upon her by the liars fastening upon her. Soon after, this hunchback brought me a significant note from a solicitor, enclosing a bill, which I was requested to call at his office and settle. I was for the snug little sum of three hundred pounds, fifteen hundred dollars, for my neglect of duty toward the sailor whom I had fed. I had discharged him when he refused to go on his ship, and sent him on his way rejoicing so the claimant was out of their reach. Afterwards came other bills, by this same hunchback, whom I named Quilp, in all to the amount of two thousand pounds, ten thousand dollars. There were now four villains in the play, the philanthropist Heap, the messenger hunchback Quilp, the lawyer, nameless, the broker, broken, resembling Micawber. Quilp came and said he was ordered to wait my answer to the last bill of the lawyer nameless. I ordered him to leave my office, and he left. 
Then came in a bulky fellow, face red and glowing, whom I supposed was the principal broker, whom I had not then seen to know, with quite an air of politeness, asked me if I had received such and such letters. Their object was to get some word from me that they would swear was an admission. I quite coolly wanted to know what right he had to ask me any such question. He then said a man downstairs had asked him to come up and inquire, and wanted to know what answer I had to make to the accounts. I thought of my predecessor's use for boots. Surely there is a place for everything and a time for everything. That man has a place for my boot. But the stairway was steep and crooked, the man fifty pounds above my weight, albeit much of it was beer. I felt more confidence in my brains, though in small quantity. Tell the man that sent you here that I claim to know how to run this office. I want none of his help or advice. Should I need him, I will send for him. I believe he was the chief in this cool, impudent attempt. Those bills, three hundred pounds, five hundred pounds, twelve hundred pounds, etc., are yet unpaid, and I never heard more of the combination. Occasionally I would meet one of them. They seemed to be growing more and more seedy, as if getting ready for planting. Quite a prominent part of my duties was to look after the fitting out of ships, for running the blockade of the Confederate coast, sending in to the rebels goods, arms, and ammunition for the prosecution of the war on behalf of slavery. Probably forty ships were fitted out or touched at my port, every one of which came to a bad end, sunk or captured. Some of them, however, made several successful voyages. One of them, the Old Dominion, so-called, was being fitted out in Bristol, Hearing about it, I employed a photographer to plant his camera like a cannon in a vacant house on a convenient elevation opposite to it, and he took several good views. I sent them to the Department of State with explanations, together with the recital that the captain had boasted that no damned Yankee was smart enough to capture this ship. This was forwarded through proper channels to the commander of the blockading squadron, and the ship was captured in her first attempt to break through. A copy of this picture is in the archives of the Chicago Historical Society. The loss of that noble English ship, as the London Standard called the Alabama, produced quite a sensation. The sinking of it came near to many an English heart. Great many exulted in it, as we did at home. The celebrated Geneva Arbitration in 1871 assessed England fifteen million five hundred thousand dollars damages for the depredations and destruction of the american marine caused by the alabama and a few sister ships which were fitted out either in england or in english colonies and established as international that such conduct is forbidden forever there was undoubtedly great sympathy with a majority of the english people for our rebels and hope for the destruction of the american union this is strange to those well posted in English philanthropy, and those not well posted on the general character of the country. The whole was quite unlike, yet just like, John Bull. It was quite natural, as natural as it was for the demagogues of this country, to sympathize with the East India Rebellion, and to prophesy foolishly the end of the great Eastern British Empire, as they foolishly prophesied the end of the Republican Empire of the West. It is better, generally, for Englishmen and Yankees to know something before they prophesy. John Bright said it was the English habit to sympathize with everybody's rebels but their own. We had many strong friends in England, led by John Bright, the noble John Bright. This man, a patriot of the highest order, who, because he loved his country, desired her always to be right, if not going right, would sound the warning and who loved other countries as a part of humanity, whose aspirations are for justice and right and liberty to their subjects. This man, it was natural, should be with us, though with, at first, a majority of his countrymen. They were early set adrift by our own bungling, bungling of the politicians on the slavery question, their trying to save slavery and save the Union also, and also by the conduct and teachings of men in office abroad, 
a traitor in almost every consulate, and a traitor representative in almost every court. I always told the English people the cause of the war was slavery, so I told them in a public address as early as the spring of 1862 that the war would end slavery. The worst state of the feeling after the Trent was about the time of the destruction of the Alabama, not because of its destruction, for on the whole that went in our favor. That occurred on Sunday, and good Sabbath day's work it was. My pastor, Rev. Hebditch, who from indifference became a fast friend of our country, always prayed for us in our calamity. That day he prayed most earnestly that the right might triumph. Just as he had said the words, as one of his parishioners the next day computed the time, the ball of the Kearsage struck the Alabama in the hull. Our minister was noted for his efficacy in prayer, and this cause of right made a good hit. And it also hit many a man near the heart, for great respect was had for the Alabama as the avenger of the Trent. While some of our cousins were sad, some were glad, and Americans abroad were jubilant, one of our captains in port put out his pennant, a long streamer with stars and stripes cramped at the butt-end, and from the masthead let it fly. The collector, or other officer of Her Majesty, ordered our captain to take it down. He referred to the consul. I said to him to keep the peace, obey the law. If any law, let them show it to you. I gave no orders for any captain to strike his flag. If not satisfied, let them come and take it down. It did not come down. The English people are very wise in their own conceit about money. There is nothing like English gold and investments in their consoles called the funds. Now all this is a sign of patriotism, and we ought to respect every people for their patriotism. But they will take gold from any nation gladly, American gold, even in eagles, they do not by any means despise. They like investments that pay income. All values of investments are measured in this sensible way. What will it pay? They would not invest in our bonds. They have not much faith in paper money. They are great sticklers for the specie basis. Their own pound and five-pound notes are the only kind of paper that compasses their faith. The greenback, the name by which our money is known the world over, was a term synonymous with humbug or swindling. General Greenback was the name of a big Yankee villain with many mean villainous traits, who was the prominent character in a play on the London stage, which had a popular run. Slur upon us in the day of our heaviest misfortune in this General Greenback took prodigiously. For a long time they were very chary of investing in our bonds, not until they approximated to par, and therefore not very speculative, that they were placed on the stock market. The English took pretty largely of Confederate bonds, the artful fellows who brought them out having based their redemption on cotton, and cotton at that time was a better basis than gold, if they would get it. Thus was John Bull taken in. He always had great faith in cotton and well he might have, for it was the manufacture of it that made his country rich. I had, however, the opportunity of giving my opinion on investments in American securities, and perhaps one hundred thousand dollars of bonds were taken on my advice, and I guess none of the investors were ever heard to complain. We formed a valuable acquaintance with a gentleman and his family, Charles, son of Governor Fairbanks of Vermont, of the great firm of manufacturers who, like the Leviathan, their scales are their pride. He was an invalid, as the English say, seeking his health abroad. He stayed near us for two winters at Clifton, a suburb of Bristol. He employed to cure him of his many ills a distinguished physician of that aristocratic suburb. At the time our bonds were at the lowest, this friend of mine said to his physician, you had better invest in American bonds. They are sure to double soon in value. The man of pills replied, We don't like that kind of investment. We have quite enough of your repudiated securities, the Pennsylvania bond, you know. This conversation was told me. I said, You give my compliments to your physician, and say to him, The U.S. consul is authorized to redeem all Pennsylvania repudiated bonds. 
and will pay back interest at a higher rate than is paid for your consoles, making them better than English funds. This was told him literally, but the bonds were not forthcoming. In place he sent me the last volume of the writings of Sidney Smith, containing his letters to the Morning Chronicle on Pennsylvania repudiation. I acknowledged the favor with thanks, sent back the book, and word that the letters were very interesting, but Sidney Smith was foolish, because by his satire he had helped depreciate his own property, and had sold out at forty-five cents on the dollar, whereas he might have had par if he had kept them and not sold them in a passion. But while the noise and fury were all one way, and the way the aristocracy led, against us, for aristocrats abroad as well as at home generally lead the low impulse of any people when they attempt it, we had a strong minority of strong friends. The middle and intelligent classes were with us. The press there, as in this country, too often the organ of mischief, and too often blinds more than it enlightens, was against us and it was hard to get the truth before the people. Facts were perverted, prejudice enlisted, and it was only great and startling facts which were positively against representations of the press that began to convince the people that they had been led astray. Such was Lincoln's re-election, for it had been represented that his war policy was against the will of the people, and it with himself would be overwhelmingly repudiated and another was Sherman's march through Georgia. First he had gone, never more to reappear on the surface. The heroism of the South was to swallow him as the whale swallowed Jonah. But when he did come out, then the next phase was that he had passed through the country as an arrow does through the air, without leaving a trace behind. But when at last it was known that his course was a devastated path of sixty miles in breadth, in which the people had been made to feel in awful manner the ravages of war, then next it was simply barbarism. But the truth began to appear against all this perversion, that the South were in actual rebellion against a government of their own choice, and were meeting the just condemnation of traitors. The South, they said, can never be conquered. The attempt is hopeless, therefore senseless, and unjust and cruel. They had all the heroism, all nobleness, all justice. They were chivalrous and gentlemanly, and had all the generalship, etc. If it were not so, then thinking men began to inquire, why does not the South prevail if the North does not? At last spoke the great newspaper, The Times, called The Thunderer, whose boast is it reflects the Times. The South is slowly bleeding to death, and it is giving the last throes and convulsions that forecast death. Now it is not the part of sensible people, and especially of practical John Bull, to reverence and stand by a sinking cause. Human nature rather worships success. It is not the higher order of idolatry to worship the setting sun. And then it was we began to have justice done us in the sentiments of the people. The people were ahead of the press. Sherman kept on his march through the Carolinas no longer as an arrow. The armies enclosed Richmond. There is generalship on the part of the North. This illustrates it. There is a group of canary birds exhibited in the cities for the amusement of the children, in which the greater canary drives the others, who draw him in a coach. The driving canary before this has been called General Lee, and the boys cheer him. Now the canary that rides as well as drives is General Grant, and he is made to order about General Lee, and condemns him to be shot, and shoots him, and the rabble cheer the successful canary, General Grant. Straws show the wind. The newspapers can hardly yet show it. On Good Friday morning, the day on which President Lincoln had ordered the repossession of Fort Sumter, with appropriate congratulatory exercises, a most abusive article appeared in a prominent daily paper on President Lincoln, his bloodthirsty, heartless persecution and prosecution of a hopeless war to subjugate a noble-minded people struggling for liberty, alluding to the proposed celebration that was to take place that day, 
and it compared the president to a nero and all the other cruel monsters of the past and there was no protest against the article or expression of disapprobation conservatives in politics those externally courteous had taken no pains to express sympathy congratulation or condolence at any phase of our national condition we were gay in our ain gate to ruin so we might go not a straw would be laid across our path to arrest our downward course but a few radicals of the liberal party for that party was not all for us got up a congratulatory meeting on the re-election of mr lincoln it was mobbed down in one of the large halls of the city in place of that they got up an address which they had beautifully engrossed and illuminated on a large sheet of parchment and transmitted it to lincoln henry ward beecher did a wonderful amount of good in enlightening the english mind by eloquent addresses no telegraph cable had been dropped as a cord of sympathy and intelligence across the great ocean we had these telegrams to cape race and steamships taking the messages to the western coast of ireland and transmitted to europe giving news from new york with only about a gap of a week in the chasm of time nothing had been heard of the folly of the celebration of the restoration of peace over the ruined embattlements of fort sumter or the capture of jeff davis a week from that bad good friday had passed about midday in rushed to my office a gentleman named to me then unknown whom i had often in the past four years passed in the street without salutation said he is it so news has come that your president has been assassinated is it so have you heard perhaps you don't know me we have never spoken my name is canning i am a conservative i have had but little sympathy with your country i wanted you broken up but if it has come to this i have had enough i have come to express condolence over such a calamity and my abhorrence of the act he had been mayor of the city this was to me most astonishing and alarming intelligence i telegraphed to london to the minister it was too true the answer was posted up at the commercial rooms then came the spontaneous expression of a whole people who had been brought suddenly to comprehend a new order of things a truth that had lain dormant between two of the greatest and really the most friendly of nations brethren in fact by a great calamity that had fallen on one and which reached the heart of the other it was the end of all bickering it was the end of all misdirected ill-feeling the newspapers forgetting all the past uttered another voice the one that had the week before denounced lincoln as a monster now honored him as a martyr a great meeting was held in the same hall where a few weeks before a mob had broken up a meeting held to congratulate the martyr on his re-election and presided over by the mayor wearing the gilded chain the symbol of his office and great and noble speeches were made by orators from all sides they had all discovered the great and good qualities of the man who had struck the fetters from the slave and saved his nation and sealed the work with his martyrdom on that mournful event parliament held a special convocation to express the sense of the nation and did express the sentiment of the world the great leaders of both parties in both houses of parliament followed one after the other as representing the grand divisions of public opinion and uttered most eloquent words wonderfully expressive and appreciative of the character of the great president in language that has become the standard literature our children will in some day read in their school books the eloquent eulogies pronounced upon his memory by the greatest orators and men of the british parliament this they did while the body of lincoln was being carried in solemn procession across the half of the continent and all the people followed as mourners as if not only the father but the savior of the nation had departed then it was proved at last that while ill feeling was being engendered while harsh criticisms were being made and while lincoln with a sad heart was bearing the burden of the country in his soul 
he did it with a cheerfulness in his countenance which would have imparted hope and cheerfulness to the nation it was with a tone of sad pleasantry or with rich humor or characteristic story and appropriate joke and terse epigrammatic utterances of great truths all which were armed with wondrous power to lead the people right then it was that it was proved that the world had been studying the character of this marvellous man and when that life was ended by the blow of the assassin then it was shown that the world had learned him understood him in the chapel where i attended the next sunday our minister of whom i have spoken before preached upon the life and character and great work of the marvellous man of this age and eulogized that character and portrayed the great work he had done in a masterly manner hardly to be equalled by any american and he gave him the everlasting and honorable title of lincoln the good end of eight years in a british consulate by zebina eastman read by maria casper A Note of the Problem of the Eight Queens by W. H. Bousset, University of Minnesota. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Finite geometries were defined by Velben and Bousset in the Transactions of the American Mathematical Society, Volume 7, 1906, pages 241 to 259. References to existing literature of the subject were given in this monthly, 1921, pages 85 to 86. The simplest case of a finite plane geometry based upon an odd prime, the Euclidean plane geometry, modulo 3, was presented in detail by Bennett in this monthly, 1920, pages 357 to 361. The problem of the eight queens is the determination of the number of ways in which eight queens can be placed on a chessboard, or more generally, in which n queens can be placed on a square board of n squared cells, so that no queen can take any other. It was proposed originally by Franz Nork. The object of this note is to show that in the special case in which n is a prime number p, there is a connection between the problem of the queens and the lines of the finite plane geometry of p points to the line. The cells of the chessboard are represented by their middle points, which constitute a finite Euclidean plane geometry of p points to the line. In order that one queen may take another, the two queens must occupy cells whose representative points are on a vertical line, on a horizontal line, on a line of slope 1, or on a line of slope p-1. The slope p-1 is the same as the slope minus 1, since p-1 is congruent to minus 1 modulo p. Therefore, if p queens be placed on the cells whose representatives are the points of a line whose slope is any one of the integers 2, 3, 4, and so forth up to p minus 2, no queen can take any other queen. The total number of such lines, each of which furnishes a solution of the problem of the p queens, is p squared plus p minus 4p, or p squared minus 3p. When p equals 5, the number of solutions obtained by this method is 10, which happens to be all the solutions that exist. When p equals 7, the number of solutions furnished by this finite geometry method is 28, but, as a matter of fact, there are 40 solutions when p equals 7. For higher values of p, the lines of the finite geometry furnish some, but not all, of the solutions of the problem. End of a note on the problem of the eight queens by W. H. Bussey. O oh Mensch, gib acht! By Friedrich Nietzsche. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eins. O oh Mensch, gib acht. Zwei. Was spricht die tiefe Mitternacht? Drei. Ich schlief, ich schlief. Vier. Aus tiefem Traum bin ich erwacht. Fünf. Die Welt ist tief. Sechs. Und tiefer als der Tag gedacht. Sieben. Tief ist ihr Weh. Acht. Lust, tiefer noch als Herzeleid. Neun. Weh spricht, vergeh. Zehn. Doch alle Lust will Ewigkeit. Elf will tiefe, tiefe Ewigkeit. Zwölf. End of O oh Mensch, gib acht bei Friedrich Nietzsche. Read by Monica M. C. In the Year 2889 by Jules Verne and Michel Verne. This is recorded to celebrate the 8th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Year 2889 Little though they seem to think of it, the people of this 29th century live continually in fairyland. Surfeited as they are with marvels, they are indifferent in presence of each new marvel. To them all seems natural. Could they but duly appreciate the refinements of civilization in our day, could they but compare the present with the past and so better comprehend the advance we have made, how much fairer they would find our modern towns, with populations amounting sometimes to ten million souls, their streets three hundred feet wide, their houses one thousand feet in height, with the temperature the same in all seasons, with their lines of aerial locomotion crossing the sky in every direction. If they would but picture to themselves the state of things that once existed, when through muddy streets rumbling boxes on wheels, drawn by horses, yes, by horses, were the only means of conveyance. Think of the railroads of the olden time, and you will be able to appreciate the pneumatic tubes through which today one travels at the rate of one thousand miles an hour. Would not our contemporaries prize the telephone and the telephone more highly, if they had not forgotten the telegraph. Singularly enough, all these transformations rest upon principles which were perfectly familiar to our remote ancestors, but which they disregarded. Heat, for instance, is as ancient as man himself. Electricity was known three thousand years ago, and steam eleven hundred years ago. Nay, so early as ten centuries ago it was known that the differences between the several chemical and physical forces depend on the mode of vibration of the etheric particles which is for each specifically different. When at last the kinship of all these forces was discovered, it is simply astounding that five hundred years should still have to elapse before men could analyze and describe the several modes of vibration that constitute these differences. Above all, it is singular that the mode of reproducing these forces directly from one another, and of reproducing one without the others, should have remained undiscovered till less than a hundred years ago. Nevertheless, such was the course of events for it was not till the year 2792 that the famous Oswald Neer made this great discovery. Truly was he a great benefactor of the human race. His admirable discovery led to many another. Hence is sprung a pleiad of inventors, its brightest star being our great Joseph Jackson. To Jackson we are indebted for those wonderful instruments the new accumulators. Some of these absorb and condense the living force contained in the sun's rays, others the electricity stored in our globe, Others, again, the energy coming from whatever source, as a waterfall, a stream, the winds, etc. 
He, too, it was that invented the transformer, a more wonderful contrivance still, which takes the living force from the accumulator and, on the simple pressure of a button, gives it back to space in whatever form may be desired, whether as heat, light, electricity, or mechanical force, after having first obtained from it the work required. From the day when these two instruments were contrived is to be dated the era of true progress. They have put into the hands of man a power that is almost infinite. As for their applications, they are numberless. Mitigating the rigors of winter, by giving back to the atmosphere the surplus heat stored up during the summer, they have revolutionized agriculture. By supplying motive power for aerial navigation, they have given to commerce a mighty impetus. To them we are indebted for the continuous production of electricity without batteries or dynamos, of light without combustion or incandescence, and for an unfailing supply of mechanical energy for all the needs of industry. Yes, all these wonders have been wrought by the accumulator and the transformer. And can we not to them also trace, indirectly, this latest wonder of all, the great Earth Chronicle building in 253rd Avenue, which was dedicated the other day? If George Washington Smith, the founder of the Manhattan Chronicle, should come back to life today, what would he think were he to be told that this palace of marble and gold belongs to his remote descendant, Fritz Napoleon Smith, who, after thirty generations have come and gone, is the owner of the same newspaper which his ancestor established? For George Washington Smith's newspaper has lived generation after generation, now passing out of the family and on coming back to it. When, two hundred years ago, the political center of the United States was transferred from Washington to Centropolis, the newspaper followed the government and assumed the name of Earth Chronicle. Unfortunately, it was unable to maintain itself at the high level of its name. Pressed on all sides by rival journals of a more modern type, it was continually in danger of collapse. Twenty years ago its subscription list contained but a few hundred thousand names, and then Mr. Fritz Napoleon Smith bought it for a mere trifle, and originated telephonic journalism. Everyone is familiar with Fritz Napoleon Smith's system, a system made possible by the enormous development of telephony during the last hundred years. Instead of being printed, the Earth Chronicle is every morning spoken to subscribers who, in interesting conversations with reporters, statesmen, and scientists, learn the news of the day. Furthermore, each subscriber owns a phonograph, and to this instrument he leaves the task of gathering the news whenever he happens not to be in a mood to listen directly himself. As for purchasers of single copies, they can, at a very trifling cost, learn all that is in the paper of the day at any of the innumerable phonographs set up nearly everywhere. Fritz Napoleon Smith's innovation galvanized the old newspaper. In the course of a few years, the number of subscribers grew to be 80 million, and Smith's wealth went on growing, till now it reaches the almost unimaginable figure of $10 billion. This lucky hit has enabled him to erect his new building, a vast edifice with four facades each 3,250 feet in length, over which proudly floats the hundred-starred flag of the Union. Thanks to the same lucky hit, he is today king of newspaperdom. Indeed, he would be king of all the Americans, too, if Americans could ever accept a king. You do not believe it? Well, then, look at the plenipotentiaries of all nations, and our own ministers themselves, crowding about his door, entreating his counsels, begging for his approbation, imploring the aid of his all-powerful organ. Reckon up the number of scientists and artists he supports, of inventors that he has under his pay. Yes, a king is he, and in truth his is a royalty full of burdens. His labors are incessant, and there is no doubt at all that in earlier times any man would have succumbed under the overpowering stress of the toil which Mr. Smith has to perform. Very fortunately for him, thanks to the progress of hygiene which, abating all the old sources of unhealthfulness, has lifted the mean of human life from thirty-seven up to fifty-two years, men have stronger constitutions now than heretofore. The discovery of nutritive air is still in the future, but in the meantime men today consume food that is compounded and prepared according to scientific principles, and they breathe an atmosphere freed from the microorganisms that formerly used to swarm in it. Hence they live longer than their forefathers, and know nothing of the innumerable diseases of olden times. Nevertheless, and notwithstanding these considerations, Fritz Napoleon Smith's mode of life may well astonish one. His iron constitution is taxed to the utmost by the heavy strain that is put upon it. 
vain the attempt to estimate the amount of labor he undergoes. An example alone can give an idea of it. Let us then go about with him for one day, as he attends to his multifarious concernments. What day? That matters little. It is the same every day. Let us then take at random September 25th of this present year, 2889. This morning, Mr. Fritz Napoleon Smith awoke in a very bad humor. His wife having left for France eight days ago, he was feeling disconsolate. Incredible though it seems, in all the ten years since their marriage, this is the first time that Mrs. Edith Smith, the professional beauty, has been so long absent from home. Two or three days usually suffice for her frequent trips to Europe. The first thing that Mr. Smith does is to connect his phonotelephote, the wires of which communicate with his Paris mansion. The telephote. Here is another of the great triumphs of science in our time. The transmission of speech is an old story. The transmission of images by means of sensitive mirrors connected by wires is a thing but of yesterday. A valuable invention indeed, and Mr. Smith this morning was not niggard of blessings for the inventor, when by its aid he was able distinctly to see his wife, notwithstanding the distance that separated him from her. Mrs. Smith, weary after the ball or the visit to the theatre the preceding night, is still abed, though it is near noontide at Paris. She is asleep, her head sunk in the lace-covered pillows. What? She stirs? Her lips move. She is dreaming, perhaps? Yes, dreaming. She is talking, pronouncing a name, his name, Fritz. The delightful vision gave a happier turn to Mr. Smith's thoughts. And now, at the call of imperative duty, light-hearted he springs from his bed and enters his mechanical dresser. Two minutes later, the machine deposited him all dressed at the threshold of his office. The round of journalistic work was now begun. First he enters the hall of the novel writers, a vast apartment crowned with an enormous transparent cupola. In one corner is a telephone, through which a hundred Earth Chronicle literateurs in turn recount to the public in daily installments a hundred novels. Addressing one of these authors who was waiting his turn, Capital, capital, my dear fellow, said he, your last story. The scene where the village maid discusses interesting philosophical problems with her lover shows your very acute power of observation. Never have the ways of country folk been better portrayed. Keep on, my dear Archibald, keep on. Since yesterday, thanks to you, there is a gain of five thousand subscribers. Mr. John Last, he began again, turning to a new arrival. I am not so well pleased with your work. Your story is not a picture of life. It lacks the element of truth. And why? Simply because you run straight on to the end. Because you do not analyze. Your heroes do this thing or that from this or that motive, which you assign without ever a thought of dissecting their mental and moral natures. Our feelings, you must remember, are far more complex than all that. In real life, every act is the resultant of a hundred thoughts that come and go and these you must study, each by itself, if you would create a living character. But, you will say, in order to note these fleeting thoughts, one must know them, must be able to follow them in their capricious meanderings. Why, any child can do that, as you know. You have simply to make use of hypnotism, electrical or human, which gives one a twofold being, setting free the witness personality so that it may see, understand, and remember the reasons which determine the personality that acts. Just study yourself as you live from day to day, my dear last. Imitate your associate whom I was complimenting a moment ago. Let yourself be hypnotized. What's that? You have tried it already? Not sufficiently, then. Not sufficiently. Mr. Smith continues his round and enters the reporter's hall. Here, fifteen hundred reporters, in their respective places, facing an equal number of telephones, are communicating to the subscribers the news of the world as gathered during the night. The organization of this matchless service has often been described. Besides his telephone, each reporter, as the reader is aware, has in front of him a set of commutators, which enable him to communicate with any desired telephotic line. Thus the subscribers not only hear the news, but see the occurrences. When an incident is described that has already passed, photographs of its main features are transmitted with the narrative, and there is no confusion with all. The reporter's items, just like the different stories and all the other component parts of the journal, are classified automatically according to an ingenious system and reach the hearer in due succession. Furthermore, 
the hearers are free to listen only to what specially concerns them. They may at pleasure give attention to one editor and refuse it to another. Mr. Smith next addresses one of the ten reporters in the astronomical department, a department still in the embryonic stage, but which will yet play an important part in journalism. Well, Cash, what's the news? We have phototelegrams from Mercury, Venus, and Mars. Are those from Mars of any interest? Yes, indeed. There is a revolution in the Central Empire. And what of Jupiter? asked Mr. Smith. Nothing as yet. We cannot quite understand their signals. Perhaps ours do not reach them. That's bad, exclaimed Mr. Smith as he hurried away, not in the best of humor, toward the hall of the scientific editors. With their heads bent down over their electric computers, thirty scientific men were absorbed in transcendental calculations. The coming of Mr. Smith was like the falling of a bomb among them. Well, gentlemen, what is this I hear? No answer from Jupiter? Is it always to be thus? Come, Cooley, you have been at work now twenty years on this problem, and yet... True enough, replied the man addressed. Our science of optics is still very defective, and through our mile and three-quarter telescopes... Listen to that, Peer, broke in Mr. Smith, turning to a second scientist. Optical science defective. Optical science is your specialty. But, he continued, again addressing William Cooley, failing with Jupiter, are we getting any results from the moon? The case is no better there. This time you do not lay the blame on the science of optics. The moon is immeasurably less distant than Mars, yet with Mars our communication is fully established. I presume you will not say that you lack telescopes? Telescopes? Oh, no. The trouble here is about inhabitants. That's it, added Peer. So, then, the moon is positively uninhabited? asked Mr. Smith. At least, answered Cooley, on the face which she presents to us. As for the opposite side, who knows? Ah, the opposite side. You think, then, remarked Mr. Smith, musingly, that if one could but... Could what? Why, turn the moon about face. Ah, there's something in that, cried the two men at once. And indeed, so confident was their air, they seemed to have no doubt as to the possibility of success in such an undertaking. Meanwhile, asked Mr. Smith after a moment's silence, have you no news of interest today? Indeed we have, answered Cooley. The elements of Olympus are definitively settled. That great planet gravitates beyond Neptune at the mean distance of 11,400,799,642 miles from the Sun, and to traverse its vast orbit takes 1,311 years, 294 days, 12 hours, 43 minutes, 9 seconds. Why didn't you tell me that sooner? cried Mr. Smith. Now inform the reporters of this straight away. You know how eager is the curiosity of the public with regard to these astronomical questions. That news must go into today's issue. Then, the two men bowing to him, Mr. Smith passed into the next hall, an enormous gallery upward of 3,200 feet in length, devoted to atmospheric advertising. Everyone has noticed those enormous advertisements reflected from the clouds, so large that they may be seen by the population of whole cities, or even of entire countries. This, too, is one of Mr. Fritz Napoleon Smith's ideas, and in the Earth Chronicle building, a thousand projectors are constantly engaged in displaying upon the clouds these mammoth advertisements. When Mr. Smith today entered the Sky Advertising Department, he found the operators sitting with folded arms at their motionless projectors, and inquired as to the cause of their inaction. In response, the man addressed simply pointed to the sky, which was of a pure blue. Yes, muttered Mr. Smith, a cloudless sky. That's too bad, but what's to be done? Shall we produce rain? That we might do, but is it of any use? What we need is clouds, not rain. Go, said he, addressing the head engineer. Go see Mr. Samuel Mark of the Meteorological Division of the Scientific Department, and tell him for me to go to work in earnest on the question of artificial clouds. It will never do for us to be always thus at the mercy of cloudless skies. Mr. Smith's daily tour through the several departments of his newspaper is now finished. Next, from the advertisement hall he passes to the reception chamber, where the ambassadors accredited to the American government are awaiting him, desirous of having a word of counsel or advice from the all-powerful editor. A discussion was going on when he entered. Your Excellency will pardon me, 
the French ambassador was saying to the Russian. But I see nothing in the map of Europe that requires change. The north for the Slavs? Why, yes, of course. But the south for the Matines. Our common frontier, the Rhine, it seems to me, serves very well. Besides, my government, as you must know, will firmly oppose every movement, not only against Paris, our capital, or our two great prefectures, Rome and Madrid, but also against the kingdom of Jerusalem, the dominion of St. Peter, of which France means to be the trusty defender. Well said, exclaimed Mr. Smith. How is it, he asked, turning to the Russian ambassador, that you Russians are not content with your vast empire, the most extensive in the world, stretching from the banks of the Rhine to the celestial mountains and the Karakurum, whose shores are washed by the frozen ocean, the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, and the Indian Ocean. Then what is the use of threats? Is war possible in view of modern inventions, asphyxiating shells capable of being projected at a distance of sixty miles, an electric spark of ninety miles, that can at one stroke annihilate a battalion, to say nothing of the plague, the cholera, the yellow fever, that the belligerents might spread among their antagonists mutually, and which would, in a few days, destroy the greatest armies? True, answered the Russian. But can we do all that we wish? As for us Russians, pressed on our eastern frontier by the Chinese, we must at any cost put forth our strength for an effort toward the west. Oh, is that all? In that case, said Mr. Smith, the thing can be arranged. I will speak to the Secretary of State about it. The attention of the Chinese government shall be called to the matter. This is not the first time that the Chinese have bothered us. Under these conditions, of course and the Russian ambassador declared himself satisfied. "'Ah, Sir John, what can I do for you?' asked Mr. Smith as he turned to the representative of the people of Great Britain, who till now had remained silent. "'A great deal,' was the reply. "'If the Earth Chronicle would but open a campaign on our behalf, and for what object?' "'Simply for the annulment of the Act of Congress annexing to the United States the British Islands. "'Though—' by a just turnabout of things here below, Great Britain has become a colony of the United States, the English are not yet reconciled to the situation. At regular intervals they are ever addressing to the American government vain complaints. A campaign against the annexation that has been an accomplished fact for 150 years, exclaimed Mr. Smith. How can your people suppose that I would do anything so unpatriotic? We at home think that your people must now be sated. The Monroe Doctrine is fully applied. The whole of America belongs to the Americans. What more do you want? Besides, we will pay for what we ask. Indeed, answered Mr. Smith, without manifesting the slightest irritation. Well, you English will ever be the same. No, no, Sir John, do not count on me for help. Give up our fairest province, Britain? Why not ask France generously to renounce the possession of Africa, that magnificent colony the complete conquest of which cost her the labor of eight hundred years? You will be well received. You decline. All is over, then, murmured the British agent sadly. The United Kingdom falls to the share of the Americans, the Indies to that of the Russians, said Mr. Smith, completing the sentence. Australia has an independent government. Then nothing at all remains for us sighed Sir John, downcast. Nothing, asked Mr. Smith, laughing. Well now, there's Gibraltar. With this sally, the audience ended. The clock was striking twelve, the hour of breakfast. Mr. Smith returns to his chamber. Where the bed stood in the morning, a table all spread comes up through the floor. For Mr. Smith, being above all a practical man, has reduced the problem of existence to its simplest terms. For him, Instead of the endless suites of apartments of the olden time, one room fitted with ingenious mechanical contrivances is enough. Here he sleeps, takes his meals, in short, lives. He seats himself. In the mirror of the phonotelephote is seen the same chamber at Paris, which appeared in it this morning. A table furnished forth is likewise in readiness here, for notwithstanding the difference of hours, Mr. Smith and his wife have arranged to take their meals simultaneously. It is delightful thus to take breakfast tete a -tete with one who is three thousand miles or so away. Just now, Mrs. Smith's chamber has no occupant. She is late. Woman's punctuality. Progress everywhere except there, muttered Mr. Smith as he turned the tap for the first dish. For like all wealthy folk in our day, Mr. Smith has done away with the domestic kitchen 
and is a subscriber to the Grand Alimentation Company, which sends through a great network of tubes to subscribers' residences all sorts of dishes, as a varied assortment is always in readiness. A subscription costs money, to be sure, but the cuisine is of the best, and the system has this advantage that it does away with the pestering race of the Cordon Blues. Mr. Smith received and ate, all alone, the hors d'oeuvre, entrees, roti, and legumes that constituted the repast. He was just finishing the dessert when Mrs. Smith appeared in the mirror of the telephote. "'Why, where have you been?' asked Mr. Smith through the telephone. "'What? You are already at the dessert? Then I am late!' she exclaimed with a winsome naivete. "'Where have I been, you ask? Why, at my dressmaker's. The hats are just lovely this season. I suppose I forgot to note the time, and so I'm a little late.' "'Yes, a little,' growled Mr. Smith. "'So little that I have already quite finished breakfast. Excuse me if I leave you now, but I must be going.' Oh, certainly, my dear. Good-bye till evening. Smith stepped into his air-coach, which was in waiting for him at a window. Where do you wish to go, sir? inquired the coachman. Let me see. I have three hours, Mr. Smith mused. Jack, take me to my accumulator works at Niagara. For Mr. Smith has obtained a lease of the Great Falls of Niagara. For ages, the energy developed by the falls went unutilized. Smith applying Jackson's invention, now collects this energy and lets or sells it. His visit to the works took more time than he had anticipated. It was four o'clock when he returned home, just in time for the daily audience which he grants to callers. One readily understands how a man situated as Smith is must be beset with requests of all kinds. Now it is an inventor needing capital. Again it is some visionary who comes to advocate a brilliant scheme which must surely yield millions of profit. A choice has to be made between these projects, rejecting the worthless, examining the questionable ones, accepting the meritorious. To this work, Mr. Smith devotes every day two full hours. The callers were fewer today than usual, only twelve of them. Of these, eight had only impracticable schemes to propose. In fact, one of them wanted to revive painting, an art fallen into desuetude owing to the progress made in color photography. Another, a physician, boasted that he had discovered a cure for nasal catarrh. These impracticables were dismissed in short order. Of the four projects favorably received, the first was that of a young man whose broad forehead betokened his intellectual power. "'Sir, I am a chemist,' he began, "'and as such I come to you.' "'Well.' "'Once the elementary bodies,' said the young chemist, "'were held to be sixty-two in number. A hundred years ago they were reduced to ten. Now only three remain irresolvable, as you are aware. Yes, yes. Well, sir, these also I will show to be composite. In a few months, a few weeks, I shall have succeeded in solving the problem. Indeed, it may take only a few days. And then? Then, sir, I shall simply have determined the absolute. All I want is money enough to carry my research to a successful issue. Very well, said Mr. Smith. And what will be the practical outcome of your discovery? The practical outcome? Why, that we shall be able to produce easily all bodies whatever, stone, wood, metal, fibers, and flesh and blood? queried Mr. Smith, interrupting him. Do you pretend that you expect to manufacture a human being out and out? Why not? Mr. Smith advanced one hundred thousand dollars to the young chemist, and engaged his services for the Earth Chronicle Laboratory. The second of the four successful applicants, starting from experiments made so long ago as the nineteenth century, and again and again repeated, had conceived the idea of removing an entire city all at once from one place to another. His special project had to do with the city of Granton, situated, as everybody knows, some fifteen miles inland. He proposes to transport the city on rails and to change it into a watering place. The profit, of course, would be enormous. Mr. Smith, captivated by the scheme, bought a half interest in it. As you are aware, sir, began applicant number three, by the aid of our solar and terrestrial accumulators and transformers, we are able to make all the seasons the same. I propose to do something better still, transform into heat a portion of the surplus energy at our disposal, send this heat to the poles, then the polar regions, relieved of their snow cap, will become a vast territory available for man's use. 
What think you of the scheme? Leave your plans with me and come back in a week. I will have them examined in the meantime. Finally, the fourth announced the early solution of a weighty scientific problem. Everyone will remember the bold experiment made a hundred years ago by Dr. Nathaniel Faithburn. The doctor, being a firm believer in human hibernation, in other words, in the possibility of our suspending our vital functions and of calling them into action again after a time, resolved to subject the theory to a practical test. To this end, having first made his last will and pointed out the proper method of awakening him, having also directed that his sleep was to continue a hundred years to the day from the date of his apparent death, he unhesitatingly put the theory to the proof in his own person. Reduced to the condition of a mummy, Dr. Faithburn was coffined and laid in a tomb. Time went on, September 25, 2889, being the day set for his resurrection, it was proposed to Mr. Smith that he should permit the second part of the experiment to be performed at his residence this evening. Agreed. Be here at ten o'clock, answered Mr. Smith, and with that the day's audience was closed. Left to himself, feeling tired, he lay down on an extension chair. Then, touching a knob, he established communication with the central concert hall, whence our greatest maestros send out to subscribers their delightful successions of accords determined by recondite algebraic formulas. Night was approaching. Entranced by the harmony, forgetful of the hour, Smith did not notice that it was growing dark. It was quite dark when he was aroused by the sound of a door opening. Who is there? he asked, touching a commutator. Suddenly, in consequence of the vibrations produced, the air became luminous. Ah! You, doctor? Yes, was the reply. How are you? I am feeling well. Good. Let me see your tongue. All right. Your pulse? Regular. And your appetite? Only passably good. Yes, the stomach. There's the rub. You are overworked. If your stomach is out of repair, it must be mended. That requires study. We must think about it. In the meantime, said Mr. Smith, you will dine with me. As in the morning, the table rose out of the floor. Again, as in the morning, the potage, roti, ragouts, and legumes were supplied through the food pipes. Toward the close of the meal, phonotelephotic communication was made with Paris. Smith saw his wife, seated alone at the dinner table, looking anything but pleased at her loneliness. Pardon me, my dear, for having left you alone, he said through the telephone. I was with Dr. Wilkins. Ah, the good doctor, remarked Mrs. Smith, her countenance lighting up. Yes, but pray, when are you coming home? This evening. Very well. Do you come by tube or by air train? Oh, by tube. Yes, and at what hour will you arrive? About eleven, I suppose. Eleven by Centropolis time, you mean? Yes. Goodbye, then, for a little while said Mr. Smith as he severed communication with Paris. Dinner over, Dr. Wilkins wished to depart. I shall expect you at ten, said Mr. Smith. Today, it seems, is the day for the return to life of the famous Dr. Faithburn. You did not think of it, I suppose. The awakening is to take place here in my house. You must come and see. I shall depend on your being here. I will come back, answered Dr. Wilkins. Left alone, Mr. Smith busied himself with examining his accounts, a task of vast magnitude, having to do with transactions which involve a daily expenditure upward of $800,000. Fortunately, indeed, the stupendous progress of mechanic art in modern times makes it comparatively easy. Thanks to the piano electro reckoner, the most complex calculations can be made in a few seconds. In two hours, Mr. Smith completed his task, just in time. Scarcely had he turned over the last page when Dr. Wilkins arrived. After him came the body of Dr. Faithburn, escorted by a numerous company of men of science. They commenced work at once. The casket being laid down in the middle of the room, the telephote was got in readiness. The outer world, already notified, was anxiously expectant, for the whole world could be eyewitnesses of the performance, a reporter meanwhile, like the chorus in the ancient drama, explaining it all viva voce through the telephone. They are opening the casket, he explained. Now they are taking Faithburn out of it. A veritable mummy, yellow, hard, and dry. 
strike the body and it resounds like a block of wood. They are now applying heat, now electricity. No result. These experiments are suspended for a moment while Dr. Wilkins makes an examination of the body. Dr. Wilkins, rising, declares the man to be dead. Dead! exclaims everyone present. Yes, answers Dr. Wilkins, dead. And how long has he been dead? Dr. Wilkins makes another examination. A hundred years, he replies. The case stood just as the reporter said. Faithburn was dead, quite certainly dead. Here is a method that needs improvement, remarked Mr. Smith to Dr. Wilkins, as the scientific committee on hibernation bore the casket out. So much for that experiment. But if poor Faithburn is dead, at least he is sleeping, he continued. I wish I could get some sleep. I am tired out, doctor, quite tired out. Do you not think that a bath would refresh me? Certainly. But you must wrap yourself up well before you go out into the hallway. You must not expose yourself to cold. Hallway? Why, doctor, as you well know, everything is done by machinery here. It is not for me to go to the bath. The bath will come to me. Just look. And he pressed a button. After a few seconds a faint rumbling was heard, which grew louder and louder. Suddenly the door opened, and the tub appeared. Such, for this year of grace 2889, is the history of one day in the life of the editor of the Earth Chronicle. And the history of that one day is the history of 365 days every year, except leap years, and then of 366 days. For as yet, no means has been found of increasing the length of the terrestrial year. Jules Fern End of In the Year 2889 By Jules Verne and Michel Verne this recording is in the public domain. Read by John Kissick. Proverbs, Chapter 8, from Dawei Reem's Version of the Bible. This is recorded to celebrate the 8th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Proverbs, Chapter 8 The Preaching of Wisdom Her Excellence Doth not wisdom cry aloud, and prudence put forth her voice? Standing in the top of the highest places by the way, in the midst of the paths, beside the gates of the city, in the very doors she speaketh, saying, O ye men, to you I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. O little ones, understand subtlety, and ye unwise, take notice. Hear, for I will speak of great things, and my lips shall be opened to preach right things. My mouth shall meditate truth, and my lips shall hate wickedness. All my words are just, there is nothing wicked nor perverse in them. They are right to them that understand, and just to them that find knowledge. Receive my instruction, and not money. Choose knowledge rather than gold. For wisdom is better than all the most precious things, and whatsoever may be desired cannot be compared to it. I, wisdom, dwell in counsel, and am present in learned thoughts. The fear of the Lord hateth evil, I hate arrogance, and pride, and every wicked way, and a mouth with a double tongue. Counsel and equity is mine, prudence is mine, strength is mine. By me kings reign, and lawgivers decree just things. By me princes rule, and the mighty decree justice. I love them that love me, and they that in the morning early watch for me, shall find me. With me are riches and glory, glorious riches and justice. For my fruit is better than gold and the precious stone, and my blossoms than choice silver. I walk in the way of justice, in the midst of the paths of judgment, that I may enrich them that love me, and may fill their treasures. 
the lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways before he made any thing from the beginning i was set up from eternity and of old before the earth was made the depths were not as yet and i was already conceived neither had the fountains of water as yet sprung out the mountains with a huge bulk had not as yet been established before the hills i was brought forth he had not yet made the earth nor the rivers nor the poles of the world when he prepared the heavens i was present when with a certain law and compass he enclosed the depths when he established the sky above and poised the fountains of waters when he compassed the sea with its bounds and set a law to the waters that they should not pass their limits when he balanced the foundations of the earth i was with him forming all things and was delighted every day playing before him at all times playing in the world and my delights were to be with the children of men now therefore ye children hear me blessed are they that keep my ways hear instruction and be wise and refuse it not blessed is the man that heareth me and that watcheth daily at my gates and waiteth at the posts of my doors he that shall find me shall find life and shall have salvation from the lord but he that shall sin against me shall hurt his own soul all that hate me love death end of proverbs chapter 8 from the dowie reams version of the bible read by carol box eight day clocks by joel stacy this is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of librivox all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org how often i've sustained a shock since i have owned my eight-day clock at first i wound it once a week bless me how the key did creak and then i pondered where's the need the thing would go at even speed a whole day longer if neglected and i for one can't be expected to wind and wind on every sunday a clock that's bound to run till monday and yet each week to add a day and recollect is not my way and this it is that bothers me my clock and i do not agree suppose you buy an eight-day clock and add it to your household stock and wind it every week we'll say letting go that extra day how many times to be quite clear must it be wound within the year and on the other hand suppose you let it run till toward its close and so on each eighth day delight in winding it with a gentle might and never miss the task tis clear you'll wind it fewer times a year but just how many times you see may best be told by you not me end of eight day clocks by joel stacy read by laurie ann walden Eight by Dixie Wilson. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I've heard folks call the age of eight a tender age. Well, gee, I ain't no sage, but that's an age that seems darn tough to me. A guy can't go out any place but what he's got to wash his face. He can't stay up for fun at nights. He gets his pants tore if he fights. And if they think that ain't enough, his mother's slipper makes him tough. Eight may be tender for a saint, but for human guys like me, it ain't. End of Eight by Dixie Wilson. Read by Laurie Ann Walden. Poem Eight from A Shropshire Lad by A. E. Houseman. This is recorded to celebrate the 8th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Farewell to barn and stack and tree, farewell to Severn shore. Terence, look your last at me, for I come home no more. The sun burns on the half-mown hill, by now the blood is dried. And Morris amongst the hay lies still, and my knife is in his side. My mother thinks us long away, tis time the field were mown. 
She had two sons at rising day. Tonight she'll be alone. And here's a bloody hand to shake, And, oh, man, here's good-bye. We'll sweat no more on scythe and rake, My bloody hands and I. I wish you strength to bring you pride, And a love to keep you clean. And I wish you luck come Lammastide At racing on the green. Long for me the rick will wait, And long will wait the fold, And long will stand the empty plate, And dinner will be cold. End of Poem 8 from A Shropshire Lad by A. E. Houseman Read by Laurie Ann Walden Que ne suis-je la fougère, bergerette du XVIIIe siècle, by Ribouté, music by Pergolesi. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Que ne suis-je la fougère Ou sur la fin d'un bon jour Se repose ma bergère Sous la garde de l'amour Que ne suis-je le zéphyr Qui rafraîchit ses appâts Faire que sa bouche respire La fleur qui naît sous ses pas Que ne suis-je l'onde pure Qui la reçoit dans son sein que ne suis-je la parure qui la couvre après le bain Que ne suis-je cette place où son minoir est été Offre à nos yeux une grâce qui sourit à la beauté. Que ne puis-je par un songe tenir son cœur enchanté Que ne puis-je du mensonge passer à la vérité les dieux qui m'ont donné l'être m'ont fait trop ambitieux, car enfin je voudrais être tout ce qui plaît à ses yeux. End of Que ne suis-je la fougère Bergerette du XVIIIe siècle by Ribouté and music by Pergolesi. Song by Hermann Roskams. Das achte Oktavheft from Die acht Oktavhefte by Franz Kafka. This is recorded to celebrate the 8th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ich bin gewohnt, in alle meinen Kutscher zu vertrauen. Als wir an eine hohe Weiße seitwärts und oben sich langsam wölbende Mauer kamen, die Vorwärtsfahrt einstellten, die Mauer entlang fahrend, sie betasteten, sagte schließlich der Kutscher, es ist eine Stirn. Wir hatten einen kleinen Fischfang eingerichtet, eine Hütte am Meer gezimmert. Fremde Leute erkennen mich. Letzthin konnte ich mich auf einer kleinen Reise mit meiner Handtasche kaum durch den Gang eines überfüllten Waggons rein. Da rief mich aus dem Halbdunkel eines Abteils 
ein mir offenbar ganz Fremder an und bot mir seinen Platz an. Arbeit aus Freude und zugänglich dem Psychologen Übelkeit nach zu viel Psychologie, wenn einer gute Beine hat und an die Psychologie herangelassen wird, kann er in kurzer Zeit und in beliebigen Zickzack Strecken zurücklegen, wie auf keinen anderen Feld. Da gehen einem die Augen über. Ich stehe auf einem wüsten Stück Boden. Warum ich nicht in ein besseres Land gestellt worden bin, weiß ich nicht. Bin ich's nicht wert? Das darf man nicht sagen. Reicher als ich kann nirgends ein Strauch aufgehen. Vom jüdischen Theater Mit Ziffern und mit Statistiken werde ich mich im Folgenden nicht abgeben. Die überlasse ich den Geschichtsschreibern des jüdischen Theaters. Meine Absicht ist ganz einfach. Einige Blätter Erinnerungen an das jüdische Theater mit seinen Dramen, seinen Schauspielern, seinem Publikum, so wie ich das alles in mehr als zehn Jahren gesehen, gelernt und mitgemacht habe, hier vorzulegen oder, anders gesagt, den Vorhang zu heben und die Wunde zu zeigen. Nur nach Erkenntnis der Krankheit lässt sich ein Heilmittel finden und möglicherweise das wahre jüdische Theater schaffen. Für meine frommen, schafidischen Eltern in Warschau war natürlich das Theater Trefe, nicht anders als Chaser, nur zu Purim gab es Theater, denn dann klebte Vetter Tschaskel einen großen schwarzen Bart auf sein kleines blonden Bärtchen, zog den Kaftan verkehrt an und spielte einen lustigen Handelsjuden. Meinen kleinen Kinderaugen habe sich von ihm nicht wenden können. Von allen Vettern war er mir der Liebste. Sein Beispiel ließ mir keine Ruhe und kaum acht Jahre alt habe ich schon im Tschede, wie Vetter Tschaskel gespielt, war der Rebbe fort, dann war im Tschede regelmäßig Theater. Ich war Direktor, Regisseur, kurz alles, auch die Prügel, die ich dann vom Rebbe bekam, waren die größten. Aber das störte uns nicht, der Rebbe hat geprügelt, wir aber haben doch jeden Tag andere Theaterspiele ausgedacht, und das ganze Jahr war nur ein Hoffen und Beten. Purim möge kommen, und ich soll wieder zusehen dürfen, wie Vetter Schaskel sich maskiert, dass ich dann, sobald ich erwachsen bin, auch jeden Purim mich maskieren und singen und tanzen werde, wie Vetter Schaskel, das stand bei mir fest. Dass man sich aber auch außer Purim maskiert und dass es noch viele Künstler wie Vetter Tschaskel gibt, davon allerdings ahnte ich nichts, bis ich einmal von Israel Felchers Buben hörte, dass es wirklich Theater gibt, wo man spielt und singt und sich maskiert und jeden Abend nicht nur Purim und dass es auch in Warschau solche Theater gibt, und dass sein Vater ihn schon einige Mal ins Theater mitgenommen hat. Diese Neuigkeit hat mich, ich war damals ungefähr zehn Jahre alt, geradezu elektrisiert. Ein heimliches, nie geahntes Verlangen ergriff mich. Ich zählte die Tage, die noch vergehen mussten, bis ich erwachsen war und endlich selbst das Theater sehen durfte. Damals wusste ich noch nicht einmal, dass das Theater eine verbotene und sündhafte Sache ist. Bald erfuhr ich, dass sich gegenüber dem Rathaus das große Theater befindet, das Beste, das Schönste von ganz Warschau, ja, von der ganzen Welt. Von da an hat mich schon den äußerlichen Anblick des Gebäudes 
wenn ich dort vorüberging, förmlich geblendet. Als ich mich aber einmal zu Hause erkundigte, wann wir endlich ins große Theater gehen werden, hat man mich angeschrien, ein jüdisches Kind darf vom Theater nichts wissen. Das ist nicht erlaubt. Das Theater ist nur für die Gojim und für die Sünder da. Diese Antwort genügte mich. Ich fragte nicht weiter. Aber Ruhe gab es mir nicht mehr, und ich fürchtete sehr, dass ich diese Sünde gewiss einmal begehen und, wenn ich älter sein werde, doch ins Theater werde gehen müssen. Als ich einmal am Abend nach Yom Kippur mit zwei Wetten am großen Theater vorbeifuhr, auf der Theaterstraße viele Leute waren und ich von dem unreinen Theater gar nicht wegsehen konnte, fragte mich Wetter Meier, »Wolltest du auch dort oben sein?« Ich schwieg. Mein Schweigen gefiel ihm wahrscheinlich nicht, und er fügte deshalb hinzu, »Jetzt, Kind, ist kein einziger Jud dort. Bewahre der Himmel. Abend gleich nach Yom Kippur geht selbst der schlimmste Jud nicht ins Theater.« Dem entnahm ich aber nichts anderes, als dass zwar nach dem Ausgang des heiligen Yom Kippur kein Jude ins Theater geht, dass aber an den gewöhnlichen Abenden das ganze Jahr hindurch wohl viele Juden hingehen. In mein vierzehnten Lebensjahr war ich zum ersten Mal im großen Theater. So wenig ich auch von der Landessprache gelernt hatte, so konnte ich doch schon die Plakate lesen und da las ich eines Tages, dass die Hugenotten gespielt werden. Von Hugenotten hatte man schon in der Klaus gesprochen. Auch war das Stück von einem Juden, Meyerbeer, und so gab ich mir selbst die Erlaubnis, kaufte eine Karte, und am Abend war ich zum ersten Mal im Leben im Theater. Was ich damals sah und fühlte, gehört nicht hierher, nur das eine, dass ich zur Überzeugung kam, man singe dort besser als Vetter Chaskel und maskiere sich auch viel schöner als er. Und noch eine Überraschung brachte ich mit. Die Ballettmusik der Hugenotten hatte ich schon längst gekannt. Die Melodien sang man ja in der Klaus freitags abends zum Lekkododi. Und ich konnte mir damals nicht erklären, wie es möglich sei, dass man im großen Theater das spiele, was man in der Klaus schon so lange singt. Von damals an wurde ich in der Oper ein häufiger Gast. Nur durfte ich nicht vergessen, zu jeder Vorstellung einen Kragen und ein paar Manschetten zu kaufen und sie auf dem Nachhauseweg in die Weichsel zu werfen. Meine Eltern durften solche Dinge nicht sehen, Während ich mich an Wilhelm Tell und Aida sattigte, waren meine Eltern in sicheren Glauben. Ich säße in der Klaus über die Talmudfolianten und studiere die Heilige Schrift. Einige Zeit nachher erfuhr ich, dass es auch ein jüdisches Theater gibt. Wie gern ich aber auch hingegangen wäre, ich getraute mich nicht denn es hätte meine Eltern allzu leicht verraten werden können. Ins große Theater zum Oper dagegen ging ich häufig und später auch in das polnische dramatische Theater. In letzterem habe ich zum ersten Mal die Räuber gesehen. Sehr überrascht hat es mich, dass man auch so schön Theater spielen kann, ohne Gesang und Musik. Das hätte ich nie gedacht und merkwürdigerweise war ihn dem Franz nicht böse, vielmehr hat er den größten Eindruck auf mich gemacht. Ihn hätte ich gern gespielt, nicht den Karl. Von den Kameraden in der Klaus war ich der Einzige, der es gewagt hat, ins Theater zu gehen. Im Übrigen aber haben wir Burschen in der Klaus uns schon mit allen aufgeklärten Büchern gefüttert. Damals lach ich zum ersten Mal Shakespeare, Schiller, Lord Byron, von der jüdischen Literatur 
kamen mir allerdings nur die großen Kriminalromane in die Hand, die uns Amerika in einer halb deutschen, halb jüdischen Sprache lieferte. Eine kurze Zeit verstrich, mir gab's keine Ruhe. Ein jüdisches Theater in Warschau. Und ich soll es nicht sehen. Und ich habe es riskiert, alles auf die Karte gesetzt und bin ins jüdische Theater gegangen. Das hat mich ganz umgewandelt. Schon vor Beginn des Spiels habe ich mich ganz anders gefühlt als bei jenen. Vor allem keine Herren in Frack, keine Dame in Dekolleté, kein Polnisch, kein Russisch, nur Juden aller Art. Langgekleidete, kurzgekleidete Frauen und Mädchen, bürgerlich angezogen, und man sprach laut und ungeniert in der Muttersprache. Ich bin niemandem aufgefallen mit meinem langen Kaftänchen und musste mich gar nicht schämen. Gespielt hat man ein komisches Drama mit Gesang und Tanz in sechs Achsen und zehn Bildern, bald Schuhe von Schumor. Angefangen hat man nicht so pünktlich um acht Uhr, wie im polnischen Theater, sondern erst gegen zehn Uhr und geendet erst spät nach Mitternacht. Der Liebhaber und der Intrigant haben Hochdeutsch gesprochen, und ich habe gestaunt, dass ich auf einmal, ohne von der deutschen Sprache eine Ahnung zu haben, so vortreffliches Deutsch so gut verstehen konnte. Nur der Komiker und die Subretten haben Jiddisch gesprochen. Im Allgemeinen hat es mir besser gefallen als die Oper, das dramatische Theater und die Operette zusammengenommen. Denn erstens war es doch jiddisch, deutsch jiddisch zwar, aber doch jiddisch, ein besseres, schöneres jiddisch, und zweitens war doch hier alles beisammen, Drama, Tragödie, Gesang, Komödie, Tanz, alles beisammen, das Leben. Die ganze Nacht habe ich vor Aufregung nicht geschlafen, das Herz sagte mir, dass auch ich einst im Tempel der jüdischen Kunst dienen, dass ich ein jüdischer Schauspieler werden soll. Nächsten Tag aber, nachmittags, schickte der Vater die Kinder ins Nebenzimmer. Nur die Mutter und mich hieß er bleiben. Instinktiv fühlte ich, dass hier eine Kasche für mich gekocht wird. Der Vater sitzt nicht mehr. Immer nur geht er im Zimmer auf und ab. Die Hand am kleinen, schwarzen Bart spricht er, nicht zu mir, sondern nur zur Mutter. Du sollst wissen, er wird von Tag zu Tag schlimmer. Gestern hat man ihn im jüdischen Theater gesehen. Die Mutter faltet erschrocken die Hände. Der Vater, ganz bleich, geht fortwährend im Zimmer auf und ab. Mir krampft sich das Herz. Wie ein Verurteilter sitze ich. Ich kann den Schmerz meiner treuen, frommen Eltern nicht ansehen. Ich kann mich heute nicht mehr erinnern, was ich damals sagte. Nur das weiß ich, dass nach einigen Minuten gedrückten Schweigen der Vater seine großen schwarzen Augen auf mich gerichtet und gesagt hat. »Mein Kind, gedenk, das wird dich weit, sehr weit führen.« und er hat recht gehabt. Schließlich war nur noch eine außer mir im Wirtshaus geblieben. Der Wirt wollte schließen und bat mich zu zahlen. »Dort sitzt noch eine«, sagte ich mürrisch, weil ich einsah, dass es Zeit wäre zu gehen, aber keine Lust hatte, weg oder überhaupt irgendwo hinzugehen. »Das ist die Schwierigkeit«, sagte der Wirt. Ich kann mich mit dem Mann nicht verständigen. Wollt ihr mir helfen? Hallo, rief ich zwischen den hohlen Händen durch, aber der Mann rührte sich nicht, sondern sah still wie bisher von der Seite in sein Bierglas. Es war schon spät nachts, als ich am Tor läutete. Lange dauerte es, ehe offenbar aus der Tiefe des Hofs der Kastellan hervorkam und öffnete. »Der Herr lässt bitten«, sagte der Diener, 
sich verbeugend und öffnete mit geräuschlosem Ruck die hohe Glastür. Der Graf in halbfliegendem Schritt eilte mir von seinem Schreibtisch, der beim offenen Fenster stand, entgegen. Wir sahen einander in die Augen, der starre Blick des Grafen befremdete mich. Vor einer Mauer lag ich am Boden, wand mich vor Schmerz, wollte mich einwühlen in die feuchte Erde. Der Jäger stand neben mir und drückte mir einen Fuß leicht ins Kreuz. »Ein kapitales Stück«, sagte er zum Treiber, der mir den Kragen und Rock durchschnitt, um mich zu befühlen. Meiner schon müde und nach neuen Taten begierig, rannten die Hunde sinnlos gegen die Mauer an. Der Kutschwagen kam, an Händen und Beinen gefesselt würde ich neben den Herren über den Rücksitz geworfen, so daß ich mit Kopf und Armen außerhalb des Wagens niederhing. Die Fahrt ging flott. Verdurstend mit offenem Mund zog ich den hochgewirbelten Staub in mich. Hie und da spürte ich den freudigen Griff des Herrn an meinen Waden. Was trag ich auf meinen Schultern? Was für Gespenster umhängen mich? Es war ein stürmischer Abend. Ich sah den kleinen Geist aus dem Gebüsche kriechen. Das Tor fiel zu. Ich stand ihm Aug im Auge. Es zersprang die Lampe. Ein fremder Mann mit neuem Licht trat ein. Ich erhob mich. Meine Familie mit mir. Wir grüßten. Es würde nicht beachtet. Die Räuber hatten mich gefesselt, und da lag ich nahe beim Feuer des Hauptmanns. Öde Felder, öde Fläche, hinter Nebeln, das bleiche Grün des Mondes. Er verlässt das Haus. Er findet sich auf der Straße. Ein Pferd wartet. Ein Diener hält den Bügel. Der Ritt geht durch hallende Öde. End of Das achte Oktavheft von Franz Kafka Read by Hermann Roskans Von acht Rossen von Ferdinand Freiligrad This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fährt im Land eine Staatskarosse, ziehen sie acht famose Rosse, feurig ein beherzt Gespann. Eines ward am Rhein geboren, hebt das Haupt und spitzt die Ohren, zieht vor allen mutig an. Beißt ein andres in die Stange, wo der Fischer mit Gesange froh den goldenen Bernstein fischt. Kräftig schnaubt es mit den Nüstern, die es lechzend in den düstern Ostseewellen sich erfrischt. Ist das dritte aufgewachsen in dem guten Lande Sachsen, tritt den Boden fest und stark. Dies hier stammt aus Schlesiens Talen, jene zwei sind aus Westfalen und der Brandenburger Mark. Seht alsdann mit breitem Nacken noch den Pommern und Polacken, auch ein derb und stattlich Paar. Also ziehen die Acht trotz einem frisch und mutig, doch an keinem ist auch nur ein falsches Haar. Wollt es glauben nur der Lenker, doch der denkt, hol euch der Henker, immer mehr schwillt euch der Kamm. Wahr ist's, ihr seid brav und wacker, doch ein paar von euch sind racker, hält somit die Zügel stramm. Tönt herauf zu ihm ein Schnauben, spricht er, was die sich erlauben, ruckt mit Zürnen am Gebiss, schallt ein Huf recht dreist mit Hallen, gleich erregt es sein Missfallen, ja doch, es gefällt ihm Miss. 
wollen Sie sich eines neuen Peitschenreglements nicht freuen? Ei, wie straft sie da sein Pfiff! Ei, wie fällt ihm da vom Munde ander Wort, als zu der Stunde drin die Zügel er ergriff! Wollen mit Ehrerbiet gemwieren, flehen sie oder Klage führen, solches gilt als Schabernack! vollends wird der stab gebrochen über gar ein zweites pochen um denselben habersack ziehn darum die gerne flögen stolz und brausend gern ihn zögen langsam jetzo so sein gefähr stets des rechten vorwärts harrend stampfend nicht doch dafür scharrend in der stille desto mehr Immer ruhig, immer sachte, ihr Getreuen lieben achte, eines glaubt und bleibt dabei, steckt der Karren einmal im Drecke, hui, dann geht es rasch vom Flecke und die Zäume fliegen frei. End of von Acht Rossen bei Ferdinand Freiligrad Read bei Claudia Salto A Selection from Eighty Years and More by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My First Speech Before a Legislature Women had been willing so long to hold a subordinate position both in private and public affairs, that a gradually growing feeling of rebellion among them quite exasperated the men, and their manifestations of hostility in public meetings were often as ridiculous as humiliating. True, those gentlemen were all quite willing that women should join their societies and churches to do the drudgery, to work up the enthusiasm in fairs and revivals, conventions and flag presentations, to pay a dollar apiece into their treasury for the honor of being members of their various organizations, to beg money for the church, to circulate petitions from door to door, to visit saloons to pray with or defy rumsellers, to teach school at half price, and sit round the outskirts of a hall in teachers' state conventions like so many wallflowers. But they would not allow them to sit on the platform, address the assembly, or vote for men or measures. Those who had learned the first lessons of human rights from the lips of Henry B. Stanton, Samuel J. May, and Jarrett Smith would not accept any such position. When women abandoned the temperance reform, all interest in the question gradually died out in the state, and practically nothing was done in New York for nearly twenty years. Jarrett Smith made one or two attempts toward an anti-dram shop party, but as women could not vote, they felt no interest in the measure, and failure was the result. I soon convinced Miss Anthony that the ballot was the key to the situation, that when we had a voice in the laws, we should be welcome on any platform. In turning the intense earnestness and religious enthusiasm of this great-souled woman into this channel, I soon felt the power of my convert in goading me forever forward to more untiring work. Soon fastened, heart to heart, with hooks of steel, in a friendship that years of confidence and affection have steadily strengthened, we have labored faithfully together. From the year 1850, conventions were held in various states, and their respective legislatures were continually besieged. New York was thoroughly canvassed by Miss Anthony and others. Appeals, calls for meetings, and petitions were circulated without number. In 1854, I prepared my first speech for the New York legislature. This was a great event in my life. I felt so nervous over it, lest it should not be worthy of the occasion, that Miss Anthony suggested that I should slip up to Rochester and submit it to the Reverend William Henry Channing, who was preaching there at that time. 
I did so, and his opinion was so favorable as to the merits of my speech that I felt quite reassured. My father felt equally nervous when he saw by the Albany Evening Journal that I was to speak at the Capitol, and asked me to read my speech to him also. Accordingly, I stopped at Johnstown on my way to Albany, and late one evening, when he was alone in his office, I entered and took my seat on the opposite side of his table. On no occasion, before or since, was I ever more embarrassed. An audience of one, and that the one of all others whose approbation I most desired, whose disapproval I most feared. I knew he condemned the whole movement, and was deeply grieved at the active part I had taken. Hence I was fully aware that I was about to address a wholly unsympathetic audience. However, I began, with a dogged determination to give all the power I could to my manuscript, and not to be discouraged or turned from my purpose by any tender appeals or adverse criticisms. I described a widow in the first hours of her grief, subject to the intrusions of the coarse minions of the law, taking inventory of the household goods, of the old armchair in which her loved one had breathed his last of the old clock in the corner that told the hour he passed away. I threw all the pathos I could into my voice and language at this point, and to my intense satisfaction I saw tears filling my father's eyes. I cannot express the exultation I felt, thinking that now he would see with my eyes the injustice women suffered under the laws he understood so well. Feeling that I had touched his heart, I went on with renewed confidence, and when I had finished I saw he was thoroughly magnetized. With beating heart I waited for him to break the silence. He was evidently deeply pondering over all he had heard, and did not speak for a long time. I believed I had opened to him a new world of thought. He had listened long to the complaints of women but from the lips of his own daughter they had come with a deeper pathos and power. At last, turning abruptly, he said, "'Surely you have had a happy, comfortable life, with all your wants and needs supplied. And yet that speech fills me with self-reproach. For one might naturally ask, how can a young woman tenderly brought up, who has had no bitter personal experience, feel so keenly the wrongs of her sex?' Where did you learn this lesson? I learned it here, I replied, in your office, when a child, listening to the complaints women made to you, they who have sympathy and imagination to make the sorrows of others their own, can readily learn all the hard lessons of life from the experience of others. Well, well, he said, you have made your points, clear and strong but I think I can find you even more cruel laws than those you have quoted. He suggested some improvements in my speech, looked up other laws, and it was one o'clock in the morning before we kissed each other good night. How he felt on the question after that I do not know, as he never said anything in favor of or against it. He gladly gave me any help I needed from time to time in looking up the laws, and was very desirous that whatever I gave to the public should be carefully prepared. Miss Anthony printed twenty thousand copies of this address, laid it on the desk of every member of the legislature, both in the Assembly and Senate, and in her travels that winter she circulated it throughout the state. I am happy to say I never felt so anxious about the fate of a speech since. The first woman's convention in Albany was held at this time, and we had a kind of protracted meeting for two weeks after. There were several hearings before both branches of the legislature, and a succession of meetings in Association Hall, in which Phillips, Channing, Ernestine L. Rose, Antoinette L. Brown, and Susan B. Anthony took part. Being at the capital of the state, discussion was aroused at every fireside, while the comments of the press were numerous and varied. Every little country paper had something witty or silly to say about the uprising of the strong-minded. Those editors whose heads were about the size of an apple were the most opposed to the uprising of women, illustrating what Sidney Smith said long ago. There always was and there always will be a class of men so small 
that if women were educated there would be nobody left below them poor human nature loves to have something to look down upon here is a specimen of the way such editors talked at that time the albany register in an article on woman's rights in the legislature dated march seventh eighteen fifty four says while the feminine propagandists of women's rights confined themselves to the exhibition of short petticoats and long-legged boots and to the holding of conventions and speech-making in concert rooms the people were disposed to be amused by them as they are by the wit of the clown in the circus, or the performances of Punch and Judy on fair days, or the minstrelsy of gentlemen with blackened faces on banjos, the tambourine, and bones. But the joke is becoming stale. People are getting cloyed with these performances, and are looking for some healthier and more intellectual amusement. The ludicrous is wearing away, and disgust is taking the place of pleasurable sensations, arising from the novelty of this new phase of hypocrisy and infidel fanaticism people are beginning to inquire how far public sentiment should sanction or tolerate these unsexed women who would step out from the true sphere of the mother the wife and the daughter and taking upon themselves the duties and business of men stalk into the public gaze and by engaging in the politics the rough controversies and trafficking of the world upheave existing institutions and overrun all the social relations of life it is a melancholy reflection that among our american women who have been educated to better things there should be found any who are willing to follow the lead of such foreign propagandists as the ringleted gloved exotic ernestine l rose we can understand how such a man as the rev mr may or the sleek-headed dr channing may be deluded by her into becoming one of her disciples they are not the first instances of infatuation that may overtake weak-minded men if they are honest in their devotion to her and her doctrines nor would they be the first examples of a low ambition that seeks notoriety as a substitute for true fame if they are dishonest such men there are always and honest or dishonest their true position is that of being tied to the apron strings of some strong-minded woman and to be exhibited as rare specimens of human wickedness or human weakness and folly but that one educated american should become her disciple and follow her insane teachings is a marvel when we see the abuse and ridicule to which the best of men were subjected for standing on our platform in these early days we need not wonder that so few have been brave enough to advocate our cause in later years either in conventions or in the halls of legislation after twelve added years of agitation following the passage of the property bill new york conceded other civil rights to married women pending the discussion of these various bills susan b anthony circulated petitions both for the civil and political rights of women throughout the state travelling in stage coaches open wagons and sleighs in all seasons and on foot from door to door through towns and cities doing her uttermost to rouse women to some sense of their natural rights as human beings and to their civil and political rights as citizens of a republic and while expending her time strength and money to secure these blessings for the women of the state they would gruffly tell her that they had all the rights they wanted or rudely shut the door in her face leaving her to stand outside petition in hand treating her with as much contempt as if she was asking alms for herself none but those who did that work in the early days for the slaves and the women can ever know the hardships and humiliations that were endured but it was done because it was only through petitions a power seemingly so inefficient that disfranchised classes could be heard in the state and national councils hence their importance the frivolous objections some women made to our appeals were as exasperating as they were ridiculous to reply to them politely at all times required a divine patience on one occasion after addressing the legislature some of the ladies in congratulating me inquired in a deprecating tone what do you do with your children 
ladies i said it takes me no longer to speak than you to listen what have you done with your children the two hours you have been sitting here but to answer your question i never leave my children to go to saratoga washington newport or europe or even to come here they are at this moment with a faithful nurse at the delivan house and having accomplished my mission we shall all return home together when my children reached the magic number of seven my good angel susan b anthony would sometimes take one or two of them to her own quiet home just out of rochester where on a well-cultivated little farm one could enjoy uninterrupted rest and the choicest fruits of the season that was always a safe harbor for my friend as her family sympathized fully in the reforms to which she gave her life i have many pleasant memories of my own flying visits to that hospitable quaker home and the broad catholic spirit of daniel and lucy anthony whatever opposition and ridicule their daughter endured elsewhere she enjoyed the steadfast sympathy and confidence of her own home circle her faithful sister mary a most successful teacher in the public schools of rochester for a quarter of a century and a good financier who with her patrimony and salary had laid by a competence took on her shoulders double duty at home in cheering the declining years of her parents that susan might do the public work in the reforms in which they were equally interested now with life's earnest work nearly accomplished the sisters are living happily together illustrating another of the many charming homes of single women so rapidly multiplying of late miss anthony who was a frequent guest at my home sometimes stood guard when i was absent the children of our household say that among their earliest recollections is the tableau of mother and susan seated by a large table covered with books and papers always writing and talking about the constitution interrupted with occasional visits from others of the faithful hither came elizabeth oak smith paulina wright davis francis dana gage dr harriet hunt rev antoinette brown lucy stone and abby kelly until all these names were as familiar as household words to the children martha c wright of auburn was a frequent visitor at the centre of the rebellion as my sequestered cottage on locust hill was facetiously called she brought to these councils of war not only her own wisdom but that of the wife and sister of william h seward and sometimes encouraging suggestions from the great statesman himself from whose writings we often gleaned grand and radical sentiments lucretia mott too being an occasional guest of her sister martha c wright added the dignity of her presence at many of these important consultations she was uniformly in favor of toning down our fiery pronunciamentos for miss anthony and myself the english language had no words strong enough to express the indignation we felt at the prolonged injustice to women we found however that after expressing ourselves in the most vehement manner and thus in a measure giving our feelings an outlet we were reconciled to issue the documents in milder terms if the men of the state could have known the stern rebukes the denunciations the wit the irony the sarcasm that were garnered there and then judiciously pigeonholed and milder and more persuasive appeals substituted they would have been truly thankful that they fared no worse senator seward frequently left washington to visit in our neighborhood at the house of judge g v sackett a man of wealth and political influence one of the senator's standing anecdotes at dinner to illustrate the purifying influence of women at the polls which he always told with great zest for my especial benefit was in regard to the manner in which his wife's sister exercised the right of suffrage he said mrs warden having the supervision of a farm near auburn was obliged to hire two or three men for its cultivation it was her custom having examined them as to their capacity to perform the required labor their knowledge of tools horses cattle and horticulture to inquire as to their politics she informed them that being a widow and having no one to represent her she must have republicans to do her voting and to represent her political opinions and it always so happened that the men who offered their services belonged to the republican party 
I remarked to her one day, Are you sure your men vote as they promise? Yes, she replied, I trust nothing to their discretion. I take them in my carriage within sight of the polls, and put them in charge of some Republican who can be trusted. I see that they have the right tickets, and then I feel sure that I am faithfully represented, and I know I am right in so doing. I have neither husband, father, nor son. I am responsible for my own taxes, am amenable to all the laws of the state, must pay the penalty of my own crimes, if I commit any. Hence I have the right, according to the principles of our government, to representation. And so long as I am not permitted to vote in person, I have a right to do so by proxy. Hence I hire men to vote my principles. These two sisters, Mrs. Warden and Mrs. Seward, daughters of Judge Miller, an influential man, were women of culture and remarkable natural intelligence, and interested in all progressive ideas, they had rare common sense and independence of character, great simplicity of manner, and were wholly indifferent to the little arts of the toilette. I was often told by fashionable women that they objected to the woman's rights movement because of the publicity of a convention, the immodesty of speaking from a platform, and the trial of seeing one's name in the papers. Several ladies made such remarks to me one day, as a bevy of us were sitting together in one of the fashionable hotels in Newport. We were holding a convention there at that time, and some of them had been present at one of the sessions. Really, said I, ladies, you surprise me. Our conventions are not as public as the ballroom where I saw you all dancing last night. As to modesty, it may be a question in many minds whether it is less modest to speak words of soberness and truth plainly dressed on a platform, then gorgeously arrayed with bare arms and shoulders to waltz in the arms of strange gentlemen. As to the press, I noticed you all reading in this morning's papers, with evident satisfaction, the personal compliments and full descriptions of your dresses at the last ball. I presume that any one of you would have felt slighted if your name had not been mentioned in the general description. When my name is mentioned, it is in connection with some great reform movement. Thus we all suffer or enjoy the same publicity. We are alike ridiculed. Wise men pity and ridicule you, and fools pity and ridicule me. You as the victims of folly and fashion, me as the representative of many of the disagreeable isms of the age, as they choose to style liberal opinions. It is amusing, in analyzing prejudices, to see on what slender foundation they rest. And the ladies around me were so completely cornered that no one attempted an answer. I remember being at a party at Secretary Seward's home at Auburn one evening, when Mr. Burlingame, special ambassador from China to the United States, with a Chinese delegation, were among the guests, as soon as the dancing commenced, and young ladies and gentlemen, locked in each other's arms, began to whirl in the giddy waltz, these Chinese gentlemen were so shocked that they covered their faces with their fans, occasionally peeping out each side and expressing their surprise to each other. They thought us the most immodest women on the face of the earth. Modesty and taste are questions of latitude and education. The more people know, the more their ideas are expanded by travel, experience, and observation, the less easily they are shocked. The narrowness and bigotry of women are the result of their circumscribed sphere of thought and action. A few years after Judge Hurlbert had published his work on human rights, in which he advocated woman's right to the suffrage, and I had addressed the legislature, we met at a dinner party in Albany, Senator and Mrs. Seward were there. The Senator was very merry on that occasion, and made Judge Hurlbert and myself the target for all his ridicule on the woman's rights question, in which the most of the company joined, so that we stood quite alone. Sure that we had the right on our side, and the arguments clearly defined in our minds, and both being cool and self-possessed, and in wit and sarcasm quite equal to any of them, we fought the senator inch by inch, until he had a very narrow platform to stand on. 
Mrs. Seward maintained an unbroken silence, while those ladies who did open their lips were with the opposition, supposing, no doubt, that Senator Seward represented his wife's opinions. When we ladies withdrew from the table, my embarrassment may be easily imagined. Separated from the judge, I would now be an hour with a bevy of ladies who evidently felt repugnance to all my most cherished opinions. It was the first time I had met Mrs. Seward, and I did not then know the broad liberal tendencies of her mind. What a tide of disagreeable thoughts rushed through me in that short passage from the dining-room to the parlour! How gladly I would have glided out the front door! But that was impossible, so I made up my mind to stroll around as if self-absorbed and look at the books and paintings until the judge appeared as I took it for granted that after all I had said at the table on the political, religious, and social equality of women, not a lady would have anything to say to me. Imagine, then, my surprise, when, the moment the parlour door was closed upon us, Mrs. Seward, approaching me most affectionately, said, Let me thank you for the brave words you uttered at the dinner-table, and for your speech before the legislature that thrilled my soul as I read it over and over. I was filled with joy and astonishment. Recovering myself, I said, Is it possible, Mrs. Seward, that you agree with me? Then why, when I was so hard pressed by foes on every side, did you not come to the defense? I supposed that all you ladies were hostile to every one of my ideas on the question. No, no, said she, I am with you thoroughly, but I am a born coward. There is nothing I dread more than Mr. Seward's ridicule. I would rather walk up to the cannon's mouth than encounter it. I, too, am with you. And I, said two or three others, who had been silent at the table. I never had a more serious, heartfelt conversation than with these ladies. Mrs. Seward's spontaneity and earnestness had moved them all deeply, and when the senator appeared, the first words he said were, before we part, I must confess that I was fairly vanquished by you and the judge on my own principles, for we had quoted some of his most radical utterances. You have the argument, but custom and prejudice are against you, and they are stronger than truth and logic. End of My First Speech Before a Legislature From Eighty Years and More by Elizabeth Cady Stanton Read by Maria Casper. Die Acht Brunus by Jakob und Wilhelm Grimm. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Zu alter Zeit herrschte Graf Gebhard mit seiner Gemahlin auf dem Hause Quernfurt in Sachsen. Diese gebar in Abwesenheit des Grafen neun Kinder auf einmal, worüber sie mit ihren Weibern heftig erschrak und wußte nicht, wie sie den Sachen immer mehr tun sollten. Denn weil ihr Herr gar wunderlich war, besorgten sie, er würde schwerlich glauben, dass es mit rechten Dingen zugegangen sei, dass eine Frau auf einmal von einem Manne neun Kinder sollte haben können, sonderlich, weil er zum öftern Mal beschwerliche Gedanken und Reden von den Weibern gehabt hatte, die zwei oder drei Kinder auf einmal zur Welt brachten, und niemand ihn überreden mochte, dieselben für ehrlich zu halten. In dieser Furcht wurde die Gräfin mit ihren Weibern eins, dieser jungen Kindlein achte, heimlich beiseite zu schaffen und nur das neunte und stärkste zu behalten. Dieses wurde Burkhard genannt und nachmals Großvater Kaiser Lothars. Eines der Weiber empfing demnach Befehl, die acht Kinder in einem Kessel, darein man sie gelegt, 
fortzutragen, im Teich über der Mühle unter dem Schlosse im Kessel mit Steinen zu beschweren, zu versenken und zu ertränken. Das Weib nahm es auf sich und trug mit dem Frühesten die Kinder aus der Burg. Nun war aber eben damals des Grafen Bruder, der heilige Bruno, mit dem Tage ins Feld gegangen, sein Gebet zu tun. Als er unterm Berge bei dem schönen Quellbrunnen, Hernach Brunsbrunnen genannt, hin und her wandelte, stieß ihm das Weib auf und eilte stracks ihres Weges dahin, als fürchtete sie sich. Im Vorübergehen hörte Bruno die Kindlein im Kessel unter ihrem Mantel winseln. Er wunderte sich und fragte, was sie da trüge. Ob nun gleich das Weib sagte, junge Wölferlin oder Hündlein, so deuchte es Bruno doch nicht aller Dinge, als ob die Stimme wie junger Hündlein lautete, wollte deswegen sehen, was es doch Wunders wäre. Als er ihr nun den Mantel aufdrückte, sah er, dass sie acht junge Kindlein trage. Über die Maßen erschrocken drang er in die vor Furcht erstarrte Frau, ihm alsbald anzuzeigen, woher sie mit den Kindlein komme, wem sie zuständig und was sie damit tun wolle. Zitternd berichtete sie ihm die ganze Wahrheit. Darauf verbot ihr Herr Bruno ernstlich, von dieser Sache keinem Menschen, auch der Mutter selbst, nicht anders, als ob sie deren Befehl vollzogen, zu melden. Er aber nahm die Kinder, taufte sie bei dem Brunnen, nannte sie insgesamt mit Namen Bruno und schaffte, dass die armen Waisen untergebracht wurden, eins oder zwei in der Mühle unterm Schloss, die übrigen an andern Orten in der Nähe. Denen er die Kindlein aufzuziehen befahl, gab er Geld her und hieß es heimlich halten, vertraute auch keinem Menschen davon, bis auf die Zeit, da er zum letzten Mal aus Querenfurt ins Land Preußen ziehen mußte und dachte, er möchte nimmer wiederkehren. Da offenbarte er vernünftiglich in seinem Bruder Gebhard, was sich zugetragen, wie die Kinder geboren und lebendig erhalten worden und wo sie anzutreffen wären. Gebhard mußte sich aber zuvor verpflichten, daß er es seiner Gemahlin nicht unfreundlich entgelten, sondern hierin Gottes Wunder und Gnadenwerk erkennen wolle. Darauf ging der heilige Bruno auch zu der Gemahlin hin, entdeckte ihr alles und strafte sie wegen ihres sündlichen Argwohns. Da war groß Leid und Freud beieinander, die acht Kindlein wurden geholt und alle gleich gekleidet ihren Eltern vorgestellt. Diesen wallte das väterliche und mütterliche Herz und spürte man auch an Gestalt und Gebärden der Kindlein, dass sie des neunten rechte Brüderlein waren. Den Kessel, darinnen das Weib diese acht Wölfe soll von der Burg getragen haben, zeigt man noch heutiges Tages zu Querfurt, da er in der Schlosskirche oben vor dem Chor in dem steinernen Schwibbogen mit einer eisernen Kette angeschmiedet zum Gedächtnis dieser Geschichte hängt. Der Teich aber heißt noch heutiges Tages der Wölferteich, gemeinlich Wellerteich. Endorf, die acht Brunos bei Jakob und Wilhelm Grimm, Red bei Claudia Salto. Chapters 1 and 2 of A Retrospect of Eight Decades by Edward Leon Bertrand. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1 Early Recollections it has been said that if any man who had passed il mezzo del camin di nostra vita were to write his experiences something in the narrative would be found interesting 
as i have outlived that period by quite half a century i yield to the request of numerous friends to record the various and complex incidents of a long life hoping that though i have not the pen of a ready writer a brief account of my adventures will amuse if not instruct the few who may be kind enough to read it my family is descended from the haute noblesse of france my father's great-grandfather saint paul le berton was the only son of the huguenot marquis de chatellerault who survived the massacre that followed the revocation of the edict of nantes in a d sixteen eighty five he escaped to bordeaux and eventually reached lisbon after being carried on board a little vessel concealed in an egg-box it had been maintained by richelieu that nothing could be done with france so long as a le berton remained in it and thus his wishes to be rid of the family were fulfilled the fugitive on arriving at lisbon dropped his titles and engaged in trade as a merchant in the dreadful earthquake of seventeen fifty five which laid lisbon in ruins the residence of the le berton was destroyed i have now in my possession a beautiful pair of tall silver candlesticks part of the family plate which were dug out of the ruins of my great-grandfather's house my grandfather was then about fourteen years old he came later to reside in london and in seventeen seventy married a daughter of john harrison esq a director of the east india company and of the bank of england my father peter berton was born in seventeen seventy two and in seventeen ninety seven he married my dear mother a daughter of the great surgeon henry park of liverpool the business in london and at lisbon prospered and during all the campaigns in the peninsula my father had contracts for supplying the army with provisions the london residence was in finsbury square then a fashionable part and there i the tenth child was born on february the twentieth eighteen thirteen we also had a good house at walthamstow about six miles from london i fancy i can remember that house still though it is eighty-two years since i saw it last for an event occurred before i was three years old calculated to make a great impression on the mind and memory of a young child it was the year of the battle of waterloo and though i do not remember the cries of boney's bet i have a vivid recollection of the sad change that came over the family in that summer my father was ruined a convoy of his ships was hopelessly wrecked off the coast of portugal to add to this all his contracts suddenly ceased through the hastily concluded peace thus from affluence we came down to comparative poverty i distinctly remember dragging my toy cart from the big house to what we children called such a pretty little place and how we wondered to see mamma and our elder sisters all crying to mention some other members of my family i will just say that my eldest brother peter henry was for many years secretary of the trinity house he died at the age of ninety-two having for a long while drawn a pension of twelve hundred pounds per annum my sister mary ann married a brother of baron alderson and is still remembered by lady salisbury as dear aunt polly another of my sisters mrs lofnan is still living at the age of ninety-six charles my younger brother went into the indian navy he died at the age of eighty a pensioned captain of that service in the year eighteen eighteen i was adopted by my grandmother who with her five maiden daughters inhabited a fine old mansion at leighton these good relations to whom i owe so much had not the most remote idea of managing a disagreeable brat of a boy who was always asking questions which they could not answer for instance i would ask why is that spy-glass in the window called a telescope to which the to them very satisfactory reply would be because that's its name why is that thing in your hand called a spoon but they taught me to read and write at a very early age and as they could teach me nothing more 
and I was a troublesome little brute, they determined to send me to school. So before I had reached my sixth year I was dispatched to a large private boarding school. There were eighty boys there, the youngest of whom was three years older than myself. I shall never forget my first impressions of school. I had heard of schoolboys and their pranks, and now I was a schoolboy. As soon as the carriage which brought me to that den of wickedness drove away, I was turned loose into the large empty playground. It had an open shed at one side with a row of basins, the only arrangements for washing, for there were none in the dormitories. The boys were all out at cricket, so alone I waited for two or three hours. I can still fancy I see the gate suddenly flung open and a crowd of eighty boys of all ages from seventeen to nine rush in. Many were the inquiries addressed to me. What's your name? Where do you come from? Have you run away from your nurse or your mammy? I braved it out before them all, but I could not help crying at night. The next day at dinner I had a new experience. The server asked me if I would have some ash. Now, the only ash I had ever heard of was a tree of that name, and not believing that, like the tree of knowledge, it was good for food, I declined it. Then, said the server, you'll get nothing else. So I had some ash, and found it to consist of some little hard bits of meat in lukewarm, greasy water. My introduction to the noble study of classical literature was characteristic of the way little boys were taught before the age of preparatory schools. The first time I went into the schoolroom, the Eton Latin grammar was put into my hands and I was told to learn it. Asking what it was, I was told, Latin, you little fool! And so, week after week went on, till about three months later, when I could say propria quae maribus quite as well as any parrot, it suddenly dawned upon me, why, Latin is another language. But, oh, that winter, 1819 to 20, with its thirteen weeks frost, when an ox was roasted whole on the Thames, how we suffered from the bitter cold. We had some fun, though, for the boys made a sledge big enough to carry a dozen. This was drawn by about fifty of us on the frozen roads and the Eagle Pond at Snaresbrook. Falling ill, I was sent home, and on regaining strength was dispatched to another school kept by a Mr. Roberts. This was supposed to be an improvement on the former one, and there actually were basins and jugs in the bedrooms, but in all other respects it was worse. It was in the churchyard of Walthamstow. Over a long line of almshouses, built before the Reformation, was a wretched, draughty loft with a high-pitched, open-tiled roof. This was our schoolroom. There had once been a large fireplace at one end, but coals were dear, and the old grate had been replaced by a little one, just big enough to keep Mr. Robert's toes fairly warm. Over the fireplace was a curious board, nearly three hundred years old. It was ten feet long, and bore an inscription recording the name of the founder, Georgius Monux, Hank Scolam Fundavit, Anno Domini 1527. Here the Latin grammar was driven into me with a liberal allowance of cane. How I hated it! but if we had no ash for dinner, we had nothing so good. Every Saturday a large lump of salt beef was brought in, and an iron dish of potatoes, preceded by another iron dish containing what was called by the master pudding, but by us stickjaw. Hard as the beef was on Saturday, it was harder still when cold on Sunday. Being very durable, it appeared as the only meat till Saturday came round again, when the beautifully simple course was renewed. 
what wonder if we grew weak and ill i suffered so frightfully with boils all over me that i was glad to be able to sleep by rolling up my socks into what sailors call a grummet and putting the rings round the boils on one side i think we only lived by spending our pocket money on penny rolls cheese treacle red herrings and eggs talking of eggs reminds me of a clever trick of one of the bigger boys about eight of us had bought an egg each and boiled them in an earthen pipkin to make the feast convivial it was agreed that we should all crack and begin to eat our eggs at the same moment but just then one boy ran to the window and exclaimed oh jolly here's punch and judy let's stop him and have some fun we all flew to secure the famous punch which of course was nowhere to be seen meanwhile the boy who gave the first alarm ran back and dropped a marble into each of the eggs on returning to our feast the first boy who dipped in his bone spoon brought out a solid substance coated with yolk and cried in dismay oh there's a chicken in it so there is in mine said another and another the eggs were all pushed away and soon the school bell rang and the boys left the dining room except the clever young rascal who quietly demolished all the eggs and replaced the marbles in his pocket if our dinners were bad our other meals were no better hunches of stale bread with an almost invisible scrape of butter on one of their six sides were our only food morning and evening washed down with milk and water the order should have been reversed for it was three parts of water to one of milk we never were so wild or unreasonable as to expect tea or coffee the former being then about eight shillings a pound and the latter a luxury for the rich as for cocoa or chocolate i don't think they were known in those days one day the mistress overheard the wicked cries of sky blue so to put an end to such monstrous audacity she sailed majestically into the room when we were at our so-called tea unfolding a bill half a yard long and striking an attitude which was a bad copy of the then famous actress mrs siddons she explained see here you ungrateful boys nineteen pounds fifteen shillings for milk in one year how dare you talk of sky blue she omitted to say that her large family and her servants had consumed by far the greater part of the fluid but the worm will turn and as there was no turning in the milky way we determined upon revenge so the night before breaking up we all set to work and smashed every bit of crockery there were basins in these bedrooms you remember that we could lay our hands on and a jolly night we had singing dulce domum in the wreckage the next morning the school bell rang and instead of going home we were driven across the churchyard to see once more the hated inscription georgius monux etc old bob came in black as thunder followed by a man carrying a brace of the most exquisitely constructed birch rods that ever graced the hand of a pedagogue no holidays i'll flog the lot of you first-class trip but when he looked upon half a dozen big fellows quite ready for a shindy he began to hesitate he then declared he would flog the ringleaders who were commanded to stand forth of course no one volunteered for the honour at last a happy thought struck him we should all draw lots and the two who got the prizes should take them out in four-and-twenty cuts of those lovely rods now the two smallest boys in the school were my cousin ben and myself both eight years old having been born on the same day how anxiously we watched the faces of the boys as they drew their lots beginning with the eldest and so down smiles of relief abounded as one after another they drew a blank 
but at last the bag came to us with only two lots in it and on opening the folded papers we read to be flogged how we blubbered repeating what we had heard the elder ones say didn't do it with any malicious intent sir old bob commanded us to strip but at the sight of our wretched little skinny backs his fury seemed to leak out and after a few whisks of the rod in his hand and the pretty music it made in the air he threw it down saying there go home i'll pay you off next half so happily ended the only rebellion in which i ever took part but though we escaped the flogging we were each ordered to write out an imposition of many hundreds of lines in the holidays oh those impositions what useless punishments a thousand lines not anything good or useful but the same line written over and over again in unreadable characters i suppose that even at that early age i was a bit of a schemer not liking to do simple things like other people which propensity still sticks to me in my old age anyway that imposition led to my first invention which was the tying of three quills together there were no steel pens in those days and thus writing three lines at once of course it didn't help much but there was fun in it chapter two eighty years ago and now i must break away from school to descant upon the wonderful changes in everyday things that have made life so different from what it was in my early days i hardly know where to begin they meet the eye at every turn from the steel pen in my hand to the box of wax matches and the gas lights to start with these during more than my first decade there was only one way of getting a light poor betty the housemaid might be heard exclaiming as she groped her way downstairs on a dark morning whatever shall i do i've got the steel but there's never a mossel of tinder in the box i well remember my first visit to brighton when i was six years old i can still recall the picture of an old man with a large bundle of brimstone matches and singing in his quavering voice there was an old woman in rosemary lane she cuts em and dips em and i do's the same they are the best matches that you can desire for lighting a candle or kindling a fire it must be clearly understood that this old gentleman's wares were very different to what we now style matches they could not be ignited without the assistance of flint and steel mould candles were just invented but they did not come into general use for another twenty years even the theatres were only illuminated by dips and rushlights about this time i was taken to the pantomime and saw the inimitable grimaldi his skits upon many new inventions convulsed the grown-up part of the audience with laughter new lights burning air talk of setting the thames on fire that's likely haven't they just roasted an ox whole upon the ice then a gouty old gentleman was brought in in a great chair on wheels this was thought an absurd innovation for sedan chairs were still in use so harlequin struck it with his wand and it turned into a water cart and when the old gentleman was drawn through the bunghole by a newly invented patent corkscrew one of the clowns put on the air of a celebrated physician and solemnly diagnosed water on the chest and ordered the stomach pump to be brought when the patient was pumped dry to return to the matches some years later a splendid discovery was made slips of wood were produced with phosphorus at one end which when drawn through sandpaper burst into flame in the early days of lucifer matches by the way they saved the life of a poor sailor who wandering too far from his shipmates on one of the south sea islands was seized by the natives just as they were going to roast him for dinner he remembered he had a few lucifers in his pocket and lighted one 
like the people at Lystra when St. Paul and St. Barnabas healed the lame man, they changed their mind and said that he was a god. And so he lived among them with divine honours till he escaped. But he was very careful of his matches, and when on one occasion they seemed less impressed with his celestial nature, he stood on a high place and just let off a match. I remember when I was twelve years old reading that chlorate of potass, I think it was, when brought into contact with sulphuric acid would produce fire. So I got some of these chemicals, and how proud I was to show my fire bottle to people who were astonished to see a flame come out of it. There were many other things unknown in my early days which seem almost necessary to our comfort if not to our existence now. Going one evening into the dining room at dessert, I heard one of the gentlemen describing a wonderful new public conveyance. It was, he said, a long-bodied thing with seats on both sides and the door at the back. It would accommodate quite a dozen people inside and he believed for that reason it was to be called an omnibus. The name of the inventor was Shillybeer. Then one of the party began to pity the poor man. Why, he said, the thing is sure to be a failure. It will carry twenty people, as if twenty people would ever want to go to town together. And this was at Leighton whence now trains start every few minutes carrying hundreds to the city. At the time I allude to, a pair-horse coach making two or three trips a day quite supplied the needs of the inhabitants. Then businessmen either lived over their offices or drove to the city in their own carriages. Bishopsgate Street was full of livery stables, as the Black Bull, the Green Dragon, the Swan with Two Necks, etc., etc. But if Shillybeer failed at first to convey the living, he had rapid success in carrying the dead, for his hearse was immediately adopted and became very popular. About the year 1820, I think it was, balloons inflated with hydrogen gas were invented to supersede the awfully dangerous fire balloons of Monsieur Montgolfier. But they made little progress, because the gas was so difficult to make in large quantities, and the sulphuric acid and other things so dear. What will surprise some people is the comparatively modern introduction of umbrellas. A dear friend of mine, the Reverend W. Darwin Fox, a grandson of the great Dr. Darwin, some years older than myself, told me that when he was young his father said to him one day, "'William, what an effeminate age this is! "'I hope I shall not be shocked at the sight, "'but probably you will live to see the day "'when even men carry umbrellas.' "'Ladies were beginning to carry parasols with whalebone ribs, "'but for the rest Mrs. Gamps were the only things of that nature. "'They had cane ribs, and when shut up, "'bulged out like a Bologna sausage.' I shall never forget the impression made upon me by the first passenger steamer on the Thames. It must have been about the year 1822. It was a wretched little thing which went about once a week from old London Bridge to Richmond. I only took one trip in it, and on that occasion there were the extraordinary number of thirty passengers. But the thing was so crank that when an old lady tumbled into the water and we all flocked to one side, we were within an ace of getting a similar bath. It is hard to realise that the present excellent police force dates no further back than Sir Robert Peel. Before that time, the wheezy old Charlies with their rattles and watch-boxes were the custodians of our property. Most country houses near London had their own watchmen. But my grandmother did not adopt that safeguard till after a gang of burglars one night paid us a visit. Fortunately, just as they were getting in, they were heard by the men servants, one of whom, though afraid to come down, valiantly fired off a blunderbuss. This had the desired effect, for the rogues made off and were never heard of more. 
then my grandmother engaged a jolly old superannuated man of war's man named burrell to be her watchman he had his own watch-box and rattle and it was my delight when they thought i was asleep in bed to creep down and get the fine old fellow to tell me about trafalgar and other battles in which he had been captain of a thirty-two pounder or held the same rank in the foretop in those days highway robberies were common on the marshes between clapton and leighton one night my father was riding with his cousin sir edward barnes a gallant general who had been made a knight grand cross of the bath for his bravery at waterloo when they were still some miles from home they were stopped by a highwayman who presenting a pistol to the general's head demanded his watch and his purse being unarmed he was forced to give them up and my father in a mortal funk did the same not long after the valiant horseman who relieved them of their property was captured and then it transpired that the formidable weapon into the muzzle of which they had looked in fear of death was only the stem of a brass candlestick i don't think the brave general much cared to talk about the adventure but my father used to tell the story as a good joke End of chapters 1 and 2 of A Retrospect of Eight Decades by Edward Leon Berton Recording by Ruth Golding Oh, LibriVox is eight it is. Music by Fred Murray and R. P. Weston this is recorded by twenty-six intrepid librivox to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to come and join us, please visit LibriVox.org. Mysteries and histories, adventures and romance. Dramatic books and poetry, a name, a song and dance. All you need is a microphone, so let me just explain. The books are out of copyright and all public domain. Outside the people started shouting, hip hooray! Said I, get out your microphones and start to read today. Yay! Oh, the Libre Box is We've been going since 2005 And every year we seem to grow and thrive So come and join us in LibriVox Record books that you've never seen before We've had eight great years of LibriVox Now let's make it eight years more Oh, oh Libri We've been going since 2005 And every year we seem to grow and thrive So come, come and join us at LibriVox LibriVox Record books that you've never seen before We've had eight great years of LibriVox Now let's make it eight years more Dickens, Darwin, Dostoevsky, Shakespeare, Shaw, and Stein. Lots of science fiction, too, if that's more in your line. In English, Spanish, French, and German, Dutch, and Portuguese. Japanese. Whatever, Whatever people, people want to read, we always try, try to please. <laughs> if you find your favorites, then record it, don't be blue. Oh, no. We always like a choice of voice, so you can read it, too. Oh, oh, oh LibriVox is a is We've been going since 2005 And every year we seem to grow and thrive So come and join us and leave the war Come join us Record the books that you've never, never seen before Seen before We've had eight great years of LibriVox It's fun Now let's make it eight years more Eight more LibriVox is eight, it is. LibriVox is eight, it is, it is. We 
Vox's A to Diz. Music by Fred Murray and R.P. Weston.